You've waited long enough. When I started the Danganronpa retrospective back in December of 2021, I didn't even know if the first video was going to perform well enough to justify continuing it. I left all my hopes and despairs in the laps of my viewers, and many of them replied resoundingly, justifying the path that we've taken all the way up until now. But even since the release of that first video, I have been constantly and consistently asked the same question, even when I often had an answer for it and that was whether or not I'd be making a video about Danganronpa V3. Of course I will, I said. If this series of videos does well enough to continue it, then it's a series retrospective after all. I wasn't going to skimp, I was going to cover things like Ultra Despair Girls in the DR3 anime, but when the time came, V3 was going to get the in-depth analysis it deserved, one way or another. And now, through trial, through tribulation, we've finally arrived at the final lap. We've talked about what made the original game so special, we've talked about what made its sequel arguably even better, we've talked about what made its midquel interesting despite its myriad of issues, and we've even talked about the animated conclusion to the original plotline, as difficult as it was at times for me. There probably shouldn't be any more delays then, right? I know a lot of people have asked me if I plan to talk about more entries than just these. A full retrospective of Danganronpa Zero, a look at Ultra Despair Hagakure, Kirigiri So, Danganronpa S, the Killer Killer manga, the Danganronpa and other fan games, and so many others, and look, I won't rule it out for the future. I'm sure if these videos have been anything to go by, I am very opinionated about this franchise, but I've also been talking about it for close to 11 straight months, or 11 gay months if you prefer. Suffice it to say, I need a break from the funny murder bear game franchise. I will conclude my contractual obligation, I will put this beast to rest by taming its final form, but after that we are parting ways, only to see each other again in the future, when I've had enough time away from it not to hate seeing it. You know what they say about the best of relationships, sometimes you just need a little bit of space. An absence makes the heart grow fonder, or something like that. But for now, we need to go for it one more time. Let's talk about the biggest and perhaps final entry in the Danganronpa franchise. An explosive, creative, and eternally controversial conclusion to not just a storyline, but a series in general. Let's slap on those chains and finally break them for good. Let's say goodbye to despair and hope alike. Let's talk about New Danganronpa V3. So, Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony, or as it's known in its original release, New Danganronpa V3, Everyone's New Semester of Killing. Like I've said before, even though a lot of people don't know this, it was always intended to be separate from the previous games in terms of continuity. And again, that's not a spoiler. As stated by series creator Kazutaka Kodaka himself around the time V3 was coming out in Japan, 
As you might be aware, last year in Japan, the anime came out. And what the anime Danganronpa 3 is, it's a completion of the story that started and continued through Danganronpa 1 and 2. And then, in contrast to that, you have the entirely new Danganronpa V3. And even from the really tiniest stages, I had intended it to be as such. Yeah, I can't get into the full significance of the original title right now. We've got a few hours before we can get to that point. But let me just say, I'm really over the way NIS localizes these games' titles by just shaving off a few words and thinking it makes no difference. Please, they're there for a reason, and this is one of them. The story of the original games had been brought to a close, for better or worse, with the Danganronpa 3 anime, and new Danganronpa V3 was indeed entirely new, unrelated to those previous installments, though of course carrying an element of mystery entirely on its own because of that disconnect. I feel like this renaming ironically causes a lot of confusion within the English-speaking fandom who may not be totally familiar with Ultra Despair Girls or the DR3 anime who basically just play the first game, then SDR2, and then skip right to this. To many, this would make it seem like V3 is a direct follow-up to the second installment, but just so the record is clear, this is not and was never intended to be the case. I'm just throwing this out there for clarity's sake though, I don't blame anyone for getting confused because uh, NISA sure didn't make it easy for them not to. Once again produced by Yoshinori Terasawa and written by Kazutaka Kodaka, V3 was developed alongside the production of the DR3 anime, which I'm sure you can imagine was a bit difficult. While keeping up with a veritable web of continuity would be a daunting task for those looking to iterate on those games, V3 as something of a soft reboot was not shackled to such chains, retaining many of the same concepts but similarly iterating a upon them and their styles the way SDR2 did for the first game, and even took place in an entirely different school. In fact, the school setting was chosen specifically to mirror the first installment, strengthening its roots as a fresh start for the franchise. With a constrained time limit for production, despite V3 being much larger than previous installments, and Kodaka's own admission that V3's first chapter took the longest to write compared to prior first chapters, he didn't write the game entirely by himself. Kodaka was still the primary creative mind behind the plot and characters, but received help from the author of the Danganronpa Kirigiri light novels, Kitayama Takakuni. Mirroring its rather polarizing reputation among fans, even the game's team was divided about what direction the game should take, a constant back and forth revolving around the idea of whether the game should be a direct sequel or something entirely new. They wanted it to retain the series' identity while also still managing to appear new and engaging. Even the main series' mascot, Monokuma, was apparently planned not to appear in the game at all, but was eventually added to the story alongside the Mono Cubs for fear that without them, the game would cease to feel enough like a Danganronpa game to even retain its title. To shake up the typical tried and true themes of hope and despair, which had been gratuitously squeezed for all it was worth up until that point in the franchise, Kodaka decided a greater thematic emphasis should be placed on the concept of truth and lies for this installment. And we're definitely going to get into that topic as we go along, both in narrative and in gameplay. The game's existence was originally teased in September of 2013 alongside the announcement of Ultra Despair Girls, and was said to be in early development in March of 2015. A playable demo of the game, featuring characters from the original two mainline installments, was released on December 20th of 2016, and the full game finally released on January 12th, 2017. The game was then finally localized for English audiences and released on September 26th, 2017 by NIS America. If you want it, it's playable on PS Vita, PS4, PS5, Steam, iOS, Android, and Nintendo Switch via the Danganronpa Decadence Collection. Given that the other games are recently being ported to Xbox consoles, one can only assume that it's soon to follow. It actually came out before I finished this. It received very favorable reviews amongst the Japanese game media. It was awarded a pre-release rating of 37 out of 40 by Famitsu and voted 7th best game of all time by the magazine's readers. It even won the magazine's excellence prize in their 2017 awards. The reception of the localization, however, was a tad less glowing, retaining a Metacritic score of 81, which is generally favorable, and certainly less mixed than that of Ultra Despair Girls, but let's be real, more people probably played V3 than Ultra Despair Girls. At the very least, praise tended to universally land on Masafumi Takada's soundtrack for the game, which I would dare to personally call the best soundtrack in the entire series in my opinion. Many reviewers highlighted character design, plot twists, and particularly the game's climax as points of praise. Some reviewers even revered V3 as their personal highlight of the entire series. Many others still criticized the game's formulaic nature though, highlighting gameplay padding, unsatisfactory middle chapters, or comic relief that came at the expense of the plot itself. Many critics were also split on the longer runtime of the story, and in particular the class trials, which were critiqued by several as seeming redundant at times and overstating plot points or dialogue too often. 
Interestingly enough, it seems the reception of the game's final twist was much more often positively received by Japanese fans, while it was received much more negatively by fans in the West. We'll definitely be getting to that too, just much later in the video. The game sold a combined total of 116,172 units across both PS4 and Vita in its first week of release, making it the second most popular game in the country that week. As of July 29, 2017, it had sold a total of 209,734 units, making it the most successful launch year of a new Danganronpa title in its country of origin. The game also reached over 50,000 units on Steam within its first six months of release in the US. It definitely seemed pretty darn successful despite the hiccups, but there are many, many reasons why this game gets such a divided response when it comes to series fans. Safe to say, I think this game is a lot more complex a beast than any previous title in the series when it comes to tackling its controversies, and though I may not be in love with the game, I certainly don't despise it either. But what makes the game the way it is? What causes that division? What was it trying to say? And did it do so successfully? Well, you know what I'm about to say. There's only one way to find out. We gotta start talking about the game itself now. And this all begins with the prologue. Our prologue begins with best girl Kaede Akamatsu, voiced by the late but extremely talented Sayaka Kanda of Trust Trick fame, stumbling fresh-faced out of a locker with no idea where she is, what's going on, and why the classroom she's standing in looks vaguely like that one Tron world from Kingdom Hearts. Very quickly, she discovers an emo-hatted boy, Shuichi Saihara, in the neighboring locker, and the two discuss how they were kidnapped and brought to this mysterious place by the culprit from Detective Conan. Perhaps that joke comparison was more apt than I thought, by the way, because Saihara is repping both protagonists of DR1 and SDR2 in his voice actor selection, that being the legendary Megumi Hayashibara. You see, while Megumi Ogata, who played Naegi in Komaira, is arguably most well known for playing Shinji Ikari in Evangelion, and Minami Takeyama, who played Hinata, is most well known for playing Konan Edogawa from Detective Conan, Hayashibara is well known as both Rei Ayanami in Evangelion and Ai Haibara in Detective Conan. Kind of a clever choice. Before they can make much progress in their tentative plans for escape, however, they are bared down on by the intimidating frame of a giant machine being piloted by some mysteriously cartoony voice. Running to the gym, they come across the full cast of this game, looking oddly normally dressed. Apparently everyone here is just as confused as our protagonist, and we're herded here by the robots. One of them seems to take special note of the number being 16 students, but before we can question that little bit of foreshadowing, everyone is once again beset by the giant robots, which we learn are called Exosols. From within the Exosols emerge five multicolor Monokuma cubs appropriately named the Mono Cubs, with the names of Monotaro, Monosuke, Monofani, Monodam, and Mono Kid. Interestingly enough, while all of the Mono Cubs have different voices in the English dub, they are all voiced in Japanese by Koichi Yamadera, best known for roles like Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop and Ryoji Kaji from Neon Genesis Evangelion, and apparently he was chosen specifically because he's thought of as an expert at playing multiple characters at the same time. Another interesting tidbit about the Cubs is that in the localization, they frequently refer to the students using the term you bastards, which seems to be a nod of the head to the earliest days of Western DR fandom, seeing as in Oren Ronin's Something Awful Let's Play of the first game, Monokuma's usage of omaira to refer to the students was always translated as such, despite the fact that this translation choice has never appeared in any prior officially localized DR content. Gotta respect your elders sometimes. This would probably be a good point to go ahead and mention, by the way, that V3's localization is easily the most rife with issues when it comes to faithfully carrying over intent from its original Japanese counterpart. I've had my misgivings with some individual localization choices in past installments, but it really becomes overwhelming sometimes here, and some of these are going to be pretty unavoidable in discussion. Thus, when you hear this noise, that means we're going to have to talk about that for a little bit, wherever it appears. A lot of these things were usefully compiled and expounded upon by Tumblr user Oma Kokichi, whose original post I'll be linking in the description, so I'd highly recommend giving that a read through, not only because I won't be mentioning everything it covers in this video, but it's just a very well put together post in general. So just put a mental pin in all that for the future. Anywho, the Mono Cubs quickly realize something's afoot when they ask about everyone's super high school level talent, only to realize everyone has forgotten them entirely. Giving everyone an air horn accompanied magical girl transformation into their properly over the top outfits, they are beamed with a big old knowledge beam that seems to jog their memory and everything mysteriously restarts from the top all over again. Akamatsu exits the locker just as she did before, but with no memory of the exact cycle of this she just performed, with Saihara much the same. 
This definitely raises some immediate flags that something about this game is way different than what's come before it. The monocubs briefly appear to exposit that this place is called the Ultimate Academy for Gifted Juveniles. Everyone here is a super high school level student of some kind, and everyone should go around doing a meet and greet before they have a little activity later. And thus, we begin the tried and true Danganronpa tradition of meeting and introducing ourselves to all of the characters, starting with who seems to be our assistant. Shuichi Saihara is the super high school level detective, though his demeanor is a far cry from the icy stoicism of Karigiri. Saihara is more of the earnest type, introverted and shy, but still analytical and attuned to detail. Akamatsu herself, meanwhile, is fully clarified to be the super high school level pianist, our first main character with a talent that isn't just lottery winner or not actually talented. Interestingly enough, she seems to be way geekier about these niche piano facts than her previous depiction pre-memory light seems to have been, and this is yet another thing to consider about just how weird this whole introduction sequence seems. You can't quite tell what it is, of course, but you know something's gotta be off about this, aside from that baby CG, of course. Oh, that's horrifying. After I shake off the brain haze by ruthlessly beating all of the classroom equipment to death with a barrage of psychic slaps, I exit into the hallway to begin gathering all of my other gotcha characters. First up is Sumigi. Shiragane, the super high school level cosplayer. She seems to have her head in the clouds a bit, failing to respond unless provoked, to put it lightly, but when it comes to the subject of cosplay, or even just niche anime references, she becomes a lot more excitable. She kind of has a similar gimmick to Yamada going on, but marginally less lurid. Marginally. Next up is number one Spencer's customer, Rontaro Amami, who is this game's designated triple question mark slot. He seems pretty laid back and carefree, but he also kind of carries that vibe of like, Oh, he's a little f***ed up, so I think it's probably safe to say he's worth keeping an eye or three on. Tenko Chibashira is the super high school level Aikido master, a brash but seemingly somewhat naive martial artist who has a fierce distaste for who she labels degenerate men due to the teachings of her master. Aside from having extremely detailed disgust sprites and a very overt interest in cute girls, Chibashira kind of strikes me at times as the type of quote unquote feminist character you would see a reactionary try to write to convey what they think feminist feminists are like. So while she has her moments, her gimmick grates on me a bit. Her crush of choice, of course, is one Himiko Yumeno, the super high school level magician. In addition to the giant witch hat and perpetual curly lips she has, she also carries a strong belief in her own magic and its legitimacy, despite often describing average parlor tricks when trying to explain it. She's also incredibly lethargic and seems often to want to take the path of least resistance. Executive dysfunction, girl, I get it. Next up is Miyu Irima, the super high school level inventor, a foul-mouthed blonde with what seems initially to be a raging superiority complex but which frequently mingles with that of inferiority anytime someone so much as puffs their chest at her. She seems to be pretty unfamiliar with actual social cues, she's constantly leaning 150% of the way into the most overt innuendo, and she cannot take what she dishes out. Well, at least the pervert character is finally a girl for once, I guess. Gotta balance the scales somehow. Down in the library, we find, well, let me just go ahead and call it now, the best written character in the game, Maki Harukawa, the super high school level child caregiver. She's nearly just as stoic and secretive as Kirigiri, but seems more overtly unsociable and even outwardly abrasive, against the idea of working with others or even really interacting with them. We don't learn too much about her right now because she doesn't want us to, but we will. Next up is Ryo Mahoshi, the super high school level tennis player. Despite his cartoony design and short stature, he has a smooth, deep voice that is genuinely really nice to listen to, and he's pretty level-headed despite his sometimes dramatic statements. Apparently he was in prison for a while after using his tennis talents to literally kill a man, and he thinks pretty poorly of himself because of it, warning people against getting too close to him, less out of a sense of threatening them and more just a distaste for himself in general. I really like this guy, genuinely. He might be one of my favorite cast members in this game. In one of the classrooms, we discover two students horsing around. The first is Kibo, the super high school level robot? Oh boy, we're really going there, huh? For the most part, he seems a pretty well-meaning, if somewhat literal, fellow, who's friendly enough despite his strange origins of apparently being built for the good of mankind by a professor like some kind of Mega Man. I do find his whole gag about calling people robophobes a little grating, however. Speaking of grating, hey, it's Kokichi Oma! It was a joke, leave me alone! The super high school level supreme leader who claims to head a mysteriously evil organization. He's a... Well, 
I think gremlin is the only truly appropriate word to use here. His disposition can flip on a dime depending on what exactly it seems will piss people off the most. And he has a habit of constantly lying for what seems, at the moment at least, to be for the sole purpose of creating the most trouble he can in any given situation. One can only imagine he's going to make it everyone's problem sooner or later. Kurikiyo Shinguji is the super high school level anthropologist, a seemingly sensitive soul with a deep interest in all things related to humankind and their various habits, folklores, and everything else about their life experiences. He's constantly covering his face with his discount Ken Kaneki cosplay mask and generally seems to poison the vibe here and there with his eccentricities. We'll have a lot to talk about with him later, unfortunately. Exiting the school to meet the rest of our quirky cast, we also discover that the entire school grounds are encased in what appears to be a giant birdcage. It's a pretty striking and interesting visual, which also provides a bit of variety in allowing us to technically roam outside the school building itself, but it also provides some immediate intrigue in that it provokes a lot of questions. Namely, uh, why does nobody outside this place seem to care about the giant cage? Things to ponder. Next up, we meet Kaito Momota, the super high school level astronaut. In all matters relating to demeanor, he is your average shonen protagonist. He's brash, hot-headed, stubborn, and a little stupid, but seemingly well-meaning, and talks constantly about never giving up and always succeeding through perseverance. There are some things I'd like to say about him related to his localization efforts, but I feel like just as with a few others, this topic will be better suited for a future moment in the video. Speaking of characters we'll have a bit to say about when regarding their localization, Gonta Gokuhara. He's the super high school level entomologist, someone who appears on the surface to be imposingly strong, but is as gentle and polite as they come. He has a fascination with bugs and claims to have been raised jungle book style by a pack of wolves, but he's most determined to be seen as a gentleman. Angie Yonaga is the super high school level art club member, a carefree cloud cuckoo lander who can only be concisely described as quirky. Ever the dedicated acolyte to her ambiguously defined religious order, she often seems sort of out of touch with the severity of what happens around her and fears no death, even seeming to encourage sacrifice within the context of her religious practices. Oh boy, is it that time already? Yeah, might as well go ahead and nip this one in the bud now, since it seems like a more appropriate time for this one isn't gonna be singled out as specifically as some others. Let's talk a little bit about Yonaga's religion. If you're playing the English localization, you'll probably be pretty familiar with Yonaga's god as a being she refers to as Achua. Well, would you believe that in the original Japanese release, this isn't anywhere to be found? Indeed, in the original version of the game, she simply calls her god, God, or Kami, with no real specification other than that. In fact, she relies on this vague imagery to frequently contradict herself when describing aspects of said god, basically doing whatever she can to appeal most to whoever she's trying to rope into it. Her religion as originally written has no real direct similarity to a real world one, as much as it is a big fictionalized mashup of cult tendencies. Now, let's be clear here. This already isn't very tasteful. Yonaga's got a heaping helping of exotic savage stereotypes revolving around her, and I think you can probably guess why that's inherently questionable. That said, at least Kodaka didn't have the nerve to correlate all of this with a specific real-world religion or location in the game's script. The localizers did, though, because guess what? Atua, the name the localizers used for Yonaga's previously unnamed god, yeah, that's a real one that has a very specifically real significance to indigenous residents of Polynesia. Correlating that with Yonaga's cult-like behavior, blood rituals, human sacrifice, and etc. is both totally unnecessary and frankly super disrespectful. It is callous misinformation at the very least. Yonaga as originally written wasn't exactly the best look for the game anyway, but this is one of several examples where I think NISA took things even further south. Well, at least I don't have any upsetting writing decisions to point out about who's up next. Kurumi Tojo, known as the super high school level maid. Tojo is defined by the word professional. She constantly upkeeps a refined image, speaks incredibly formally, and is always willing to cooperate. She has a strong sense of duty to work for others and devotes herself to that purpose, though she dislikes being considered motherly, thinking it ridiculous because of her age. The well gets a bit deeper on her, but I don't actually have that much to say about her right now. She's a perfectly serviceable addition to the cast, and in her own style, I suppose that's appropriate. And with that, we've introduced everybody, which means we can finally get to the inside exciting gym meeting which is bound to kick off our proceedings once and for all. Everyone gathers on command from the cubs and are once again confronted by the exosols. Again, everyone reacts to them as though they've never seen them before. Sure that they're up to something, Amami goads them into explaining their objective, but they end in a feud over who gets to explain themselves. 
Of course, only one bear to end all bears can put a wrench in this feud, and it's who we're all expecting. Descending with angelic wings before the very students he intends to make realize he's a devil in disguise, it's our favorite kingpin of bastards himself, Monokuma. After a few Dragon Ball references to kick things into a more familiar gear, he tells us exactly what we're expecting to hear. Everyone is trapped here, you can only escape by killing someone. When you kill someone, you have to get away with it by getting through a class trial and fooling everyone. The tax couldn't get more brass if you tried, but that's what we're here for. Monokuma and his children begin cackling at their new sets of eclectically dressed and hyper-talented victims as they tremble in fear of what's to come, and we zoom slowly into Akamatsu's eyes, ending the prologue. This one is a bit of an interesting case. It feels like in comparison to previous prologues in the series, not a lot happens here. It essentially feels abridged in many ways, like we're sliding through the ever-familiar setup to just get to the meat already. But perhaps something about that haste is telling in itself. We still don't quite know what was up with the first go-round we saw before things seemed to actually get going. Why was everyone dressed like normies? Why couldn't they remember their talents? And why, because of this, did the colorful mascot crew have to kaleidoscope beam them back into their starting places like actors who had forgotten their lines before going on stage? Why, when they returned to those places, did they seemingly completely forget the rehearsal they just performed? Everything about this, without even knowing the deal yet, seems meta to an extent we haven't quite seen Danganronpa dabble in yet, and it's this genre awareness of itself that makes what's to come all the more tantalizing to untangle. I'd say this is on the weaker side of prologues for me in terms of pure substance, but in terms of what it promises us, it's a strong enough hook. And if we're this many games deep into Kodaka's neon pink trap, that's probably all that matters. It'll get us into chapter one. After a brief rundown of the rules we're all familiar with, Chapter 1 kicks into gear as everyone gathers around a manhole in the back that they found while searching around earlier. Thinking this might be a viable route for escape, they get Gokuhara to show off the Goku in his name and descend into the sewer. Of course, once they get down there, there's a tunnel with a dubiously labeled exit sign, meaning the mastermind is pretty well aware that somebody's gonna try this, and that doesn't bode well for everyone's chances. Still, Akamatsu insists that they try, giving everyone a rousing speech which inspires them to do what they can. This leads us into a 2D platformer-esque minigame called Death Road of Despair, which I can only liken to something like Cat Mario, in the sense that everything appears pretty simple at first, only for you to realize within several horrifying seconds that everything can and will kill you until you inevitably get your sh** rocked in under a minute. Yeah, this thing is not designed to win. It is technically possible to win. However, if you do, you only get a cutscene where everyone is allowed to escape by Monokuma, only for them to exclaim in despair about the state of the outside world which is left ambiguous, but suffice it to say, not what they were hoping for. Of course, when you lose, not if, Monokuma appears to basically cackle about how he totally knew you'd try it, and he basically just put this here to make everyone miserable about the fact that an escape method is literally right next to them, but they're going to exhaust themselves so much trying it and failing over and over that they will inevitably give up on it and decide to start killing each other. There is something deliciously dark and twisted about this in a way that I always love from Monokuma's character, because not only is it horrible, but it's done in such a way that it's supposed to kick the characters while they're down and expose them for what he thinks they truly are inside. It's that ever-present philosophy carried through. Sure, you guys have an escape right here. If you worked hard enough for it, you could probably even use it to get out of here and nobody would have to die. But you won't do it, because when it comes down to it, you value your own life more. And if it comes down to suffering through this for everyone's sake or just killing somebody for your own, you'll choose murder, because as impossible as you try to make it sound, it clearly isn't. This despair carries through even more intensely when they make you try the minigame again, and while you may get a bit farther, you are quickly made aware of how inevitable your loss will be once again. Though the game itself doesn't force you to carry on, Akamatsu's narration even clarifies that the group tries at it over and over again, but the result is always the same. And as she's about to try psyching everyone else up again, Oma basically chews her out, saying that trying to act the role of the positive leader in subjecting everyone to it is forcing them into a state of complete clients, where they're seen as the bad guy for not wanting to put up with this torture anymore. While some, like Momota, stay on Akamatsu's side, some express their own frustration or lack of will to continue, and Akamatsu is burdened with feeling like she's done something horrible, as everyone disappears back into their rooms, having to finally accept that they're definitely stuck here. 
The next morning, everyone meets up in the cafeteria, at which point Oma flips the script and acts like everyone else was getting on Akamatsu's case, proving that he's still very much going to be on this crap for a while. Monokuma's sudden appearance, however, kicks the plot right along before we have a chance to think things are slowing down. He's got a motive for us, as is his usual shtick. He's here to announce the first blood perk, where the first murder that occurs will not have a class trial of any sort. So long as a murder happens and the culprit fesses up to it, they alone will be let out of the academy safe and sound. And unlike the regular class trial etiquette, this will not mean the execution of everyone else afterward. It's a totally free kill in exchange for freedom. Of course, nobody takes very kindly to this, and Momota tries to confront Monokuma directly, but the Monocubs step in to defend him, only to accidentally crush him with an Exosol. Of course, this gets some people thinking that Monokuma's just out of the game and that everything is over since he doesn't immediately pop back up, but yeah, could you do me a favor real quick? Uh, yeah, look at the time code on the video currently? Yeah, so moving right along. The next morning, Akamatsu goes to the library where she's been called by Saihara, at which point he reveals something strange he's discovered to her. Behind a shifting Scooby-Doo bookshelf is a hidden door that has Monokuma's coloring on it, seeming very similar to the Mastermind's control room from DR1, which Saihara speculates is very much something like that. It even has a card reader for access, meaning not just anyone can get inside. This leads Saihara to a certain speculation, that being that one of the students might be in league with Monokuma, because otherwise there's no need to hide this door for access, seeing as if it were only for Monokuma's use, he could just leave it out in the open and have an exosol or two posted as guards or something. So hatching a plan to confirm his suspicions, he puts a bit of dust in the specific part of the reader itself, so that if he checks it again later and the dust has fallen out of place or moved, he'll be able to tell if someone has accessed it since then. The next day, everyone is disappointed by Monokuma's inevitable reappearance, where he seems to be referencing Yokai Watch or something? I don't know, I don't know anything about what the youth is into these days. Anywho, he's here to put an addendum on the motive, saying that if a murder doesn't occur by the time nighttime rolls around two days from now, he'll just go ahead, clean house, and kill everyone. Full scorched earth. He's pretty focused on making sure that we, the audience, do not have to wait long to get our Danganronpa fix. And much like a visionary director who treats his actors like crap, he's willing to get in there and apply some intense pressure to make things go his way. It's a wonder he didn't do something like this before, frankly. This means everyone's really getting in their heads now, and while some, like Oma, seem to be deliberately disturbing the peace, others are trying desperately to cling on to it, discussing possible plans to confront Monokuma and the Exosols at the last possible second, preferring to die fighting if nothing else. This leads Akamatsu and Saihara to become more proactive, checking their card reader scheme and seeing that the dust did indeed disappear overnight. This, combined with the cubs previously stating that there's a machine somewhere in the school making Monokumas, makes Saihara suspect that the Mastermind needed to come here to get Monokuma active again, and he furthermore points out that Monokuma's very specific phrasing in his motive was that everyone forced to participate would be killed, meaning that perhaps there is a student who wasn't forced, but is in fact here voluntarily, meaning that under that specific wording, they alone would survive. With both determined to expose the mastermind before the time limit is reached, we are given our first opportunity for free time. If you need a refresher from the last couple of games that weren't shooting spin-offs, free time events are sections of each chapter where the plot pauses for a bit so you can hang out with the character of your choosing. If you gift them something that they might like, which you can acquire from the in-game Mono Mono machine, you might get a scene with them, which tends to reveal extra information about their personality, backstory, or other such things, which may not be elaborated upon in the main game. They work exactly the same way here as they did in previous installments, and I've already talked a bit in both DR1 and SDR2 about what I think makes them cool and potentially frustrating and how they're integrated into the game itself, so I won't really reiterate those things for a third time here. I decided to spend my available slots here with two characters. The first I hung out with was Iruma, despite my better judgment, because I was wondering if she could really stay so insufferable in a more personal setting. This proved to be true, as she spends her entire first event insulting Akamatsu's boobs, but then gets smacked when Akamatsu proudly declares that she has great boobs, and Iruma tries to cop a feel. Further attempts to prod her proves at least something worth digging into. It seems that she actually does want to interact with people and make friends, but she's just barely gotten involved in social activities activities of the like because due to her genius, she's never really been forced to interact with people properly. Akamatsu insists that because her inventions are needed by people, Iruma should try to talk to people more, and she offers some backhanded praise for the pianist's trouble. Though she's still hopelessly bad at conversation, she at least seems grateful that anyone attempted it with her, which reveals some depths worth exploring, I think. 
With one day passed and Mono Kid drunk on honey, we head into our next plot point before we can continue free time. Saihara has an idea for how they can catch the mastermind, and it's rigging timed cameras with motion sensors in the library to get pictures. Of course, mixing the motion sensor and camera tech together is going to take a good brain for this sort of thing, and Saihara is quick to admit he's no whiz in the field. Who could possibly do something like that, I wonder? Well, how about a great inventor who seems super into themselves and their abilities? Yeah, there's a reason I hung with Iruma first. Obviously doing so does doesn't affect the actual story here, but it lended this moment a bit more weight, as though she initially refuses to help, Akamatsu getting down on her knees to beg Iruma, as well as Saihara joining in, causes her enough shy duress at being asked so sincerely to finally concede and agree to help. It's definitely a moment that in isolation is unexpectedly nice for Iruma, but with the added context of Akamatsu trying in vain to be nice to her even when she's horrible at returning the favor, and Iruma herself seemingly wanting companionship despite sucking at showing it, I think this moment slightly blossoms a bit more. It's not a huge thing, but it enhanced the narrative appropriately when I made the effort to engage with the game, and I think that's cool if nothing else. So the duo go to the storehouse to get their supplies, with Akamatsu marveling at all the crap stored in here, from disposable cameras and sensors to heavy shot put balls. It certainly isn't lacking, that's for sure. Then they bring it all to the door of Irima's lab. Oh, right, I should probably explain the labs, huh? Yeah, see, apparently every student is supposed to have a lab of some kind dedicated to things revolving around their talent and being able to utilize it. They get unlocked over the course of the game, so naturally not everyone's going to live to get to see theirs, but Iruma is one of the lucky ones who gets hers opened up pretty early on, which allows her to use it for this little job. With all of this set into motion, I opted to use the rest of my time to spend chatting with Amami because, you know, he's pretty mysterious. We chat a bit about who seems the quirkiest, then about his talent that he can't remember, which makes him ponder whether Akamatsu would still want to be his friend if his talent turned out to be something creepy or bad. Then they talk about how nice it would be, once everyone escapes, if they could all be friends and hang out together, in what seems to be the most transparent attempt to make me preemptively sad. And it works. And with that, our final day before the time limit arrives. Akamatsu kicks it off by ringing Saihara's doorbell a few times and worrying herself sick that he might be dead, before he emerges and apologizes for being in the bathroom while she was doing so. Yonaga tells us there's some conflict going on in the cafeteria, and when we arrive, we find that Hoshi is volunteering for everyone to kill him since he doesn't really want to live anyway, and somebody being allowed to escape may be able to bring help from the outside. However, Amami chips in that such an action isn't necessary, glowering that he has a plan to outfox the mastermind, which makes Hoshi retract his suggestion. Saihara retrieves the equipment from Iruma and prepares to set it up while ensuring that he and Akamatsu can have a good view of people going down to the basement, if they camp out in this nearby classroom. There is also an air vent which is connected to the basement library, which Saihara wants to keep an eye on because it's big enough for someone to sneak through. Setting up their equipment in the library, Akamatsu removes the vent grate and also decides to clean up the messy piles of books on top of the shelves, hoping to apparently find better places to place the sensors, as well as making it harder for someone to access the vent itself. The CGs here are pretty rough. The weird perspectives kind of show off how wonky some of V3's anatomy can be in these scenes. And while there are more awkward ones to come that illustrate this point better, I think this is a good time to point out that I definitely feel like a lot of these special scene artworks were done in a far more rushed work timeline than previous entries were. There's just something about them that screams, I did the line art really quick and there really wasn't time to go back and fix it before we needed to color it and get it done. With their cameras and sensors placed, it seems like everything is rigged so the Mastermind will inevitably be caught on camera, no matter what entrance they come creeping through, and with that assurance, the duo head to the classroom to wait. While they wait, Akamatsu prods Saihara about his lack of confidence in himself, at which point he reveals a bit more about his talent and his background. You see, apparently Saihara was given his title of the super high school level detective because he solved a murder he came across completely by chance. However, Saihara doesn't have any pride in solving this case, as he later learned that the suspect he helped get caught had been taking revenge against the victim, who had themselves been an abuser who drove the culprit's relative to suicide. During the culprit's apprehension by police, he stared with pure hatred in his eyes at Saihara, making him fearful of eye contact, which explains his fervent need to wear a hat, and his act of offense when Irima made fun of him for it earlier. This also underlies a very central fact about Saihara's character, which will become more important as we go along. He's a lot like many of the main characters we've seen in Danganronpa before a person burdened with the responsibility of uncovering truths in his daily life. However, while many of those characters had a determination to carry this through, despite how painful it might have been, Saihara stands in stark contrast. 
Because of his situation, he's been forced to consider whether exposing the truth is really something he should aspire toward or not. And in fact, he's even afraid of exposing the truth, thinking that it might just be worse in the long run. In a mystery game series where revealing the dark truth is often the goal of the genre that supersedes all else, that borders on somewhat thought-provoking, and I do think it's legitimately very sweet when, directly afterward, Akamatsu admits that as amazing as he thinks she is, she'd be a mess if he weren't by her side and helping her, holding his hand to show him that she's shaking, and imploring him to be more confident in himself because she trusts him. He promises to try. Before we can dig into the substance of what will essentially become a crux of the game's main theme, however, the countdown starts over the intercom, warning the students by way of horrible, anxiety-inducing music that nighttime is coming. Gokuhara, Momota, Harukawa, Chibashira, Yonaga, Yumino, and Amami are all headed to the basement to prep their battle plans against the Exosols, and Saihara goes to check the basement while Akamatsu remains in the classroom. Anxiously, she begins to sweep in the corner as she waits, and when Saihara comes back, the receiver in his hand goes off. Dropping everything, they dash to the basement, running into Trebashire and Momota on the way to the library, who ask both to join their strategy meeting. Of course, we've got more important things to attend to, so they instead convince both to join them while they run into the library. Though they expect to open the door and discover the mastermind beyond it, they do indeed see the closing bookcase. But next to it, they find the bloody body of one Rantaro, Amami. Of course, everyone present begins to completely lose it, and slowly, everyone not present begins to trickle in while doing the same. At first, Akamatsu tries to convince herself that maybe Amami was the mastermind and that everything is over, but we know better. As the body discovery announcement chimes in literally just after, as if to dash her hopes instantaneously. Of course, this is immediately followed by the appearance of Monokuma, who spells it out completely, and then goes about extending his offer to honor the first blood perk. Of course, this is Danganronpa, so nobody ends up raising their hand. And since Monokuma is going to remain stubbornly silent unless they do so, he ultimately decides that if the prize isn't claimed, a class trial will just have to be held, because the culprit must prefer it. And with that, we've got an investigation to do, so let's run down the usual roster of evidence, shall we? Of course, we get the Monokuma file to start us off, specifying the time of death was 9.10pm and that Amami died from blunt force trauma, likely due to the shot put ball next to his body. Monofani appears to offer to develop the film with the camera, and though nobody trusts her with it, she swears that she'll abide by the rules and won't remove any of the pictures produced in the process. From there, we discover that the card reader still has dust on it, Iruma gets to work making a library floor plan with a drone, and Saihara wonders about why Amami's body ended up in the place it did. Amami's belongings also produced no card key, so he definitely couldn't have been the mastermind if he came without one. Harukawa tells us a bit about the group meeting, but she basically confirms that it was just Momota spitballing about fighting without really coming to much of a conclusion. She also confirms that at one point he went to the bathroom and Gokuhara was in the AV room the entire time. When asking him about it, he swears that all he did was watch videos of bugs to inspire his will to fight, but a few people are pretty suspicious of him because of the back door, which is directly across from the back door to the library. However, looking at it proves that this likely doesn't add up to much, since it's aligned improperly and barely opens correctly. Yonaga and Shibashira were together and can confirm their alibis, and Shinguji was eating in the cafeteria with Iruma nearby at the time as well, with Shiragane dipping out to go to the bathroom at some point. Kibo admits that he was alone in his room. Oma doesn't offer an alibi at all, preferring to treat the whole thing like a game that he'll get into once the trial starts, and Shiragane, well... Okay, so Akamatsu kind of starts the line of questioning that uh, she could disguise herself as someone because she's a cosplayer, but then she drags Akamatsu to the bathroom, demands to wear her clothes, and shows that when she tries to cosplay as a real person instead of a fictional character, she gets a weird rash that she calls cospox, which proves that she couldn't have done it, so... Yeah, just roll with it. Anyway, with the film finally developed, the duo heads to the storehouse to get all of their photos and give them a look. All they really seem to show, however, is everyone entering the library after the body is discovered, a couple of accidental shots when Saihara was setting up the cameras, and then just a bunch of shots of Amami himself entering the library, finding the bookcase entrance, approaching the camera as if he noticed it, and then that's it. While Akamatsu's stomach drops, wondering why in the world there are no more pictures, much less any of the mastermind, Monokuma calls everyone to assemble in the courtyard's Shrine of Judgment. The class trial is ready to commence. Doing so, we're treated to a lovely transition where the buff Monokuma statue within crushes his pouring goblet, sinks into the water, and reveals an elevator behind the large ornate waterfall, Revolutionary Girl Utena style. Nobody wants to get on the elevator, of course, but they have no choice. 
Akamatsu tries to inspire everyone once more, telling them that they can all work together to overcome this, and while some may proceed more reluctantly than others, they all do so nonetheless. As the elevator falls, Akamatsu tries to give Saihara one final speech to boost his confidence. That everyone is scared of learning the truth sometimes, but that you can only decide your fate once you've done so. You need to know what's the truth and what's a lie, otherwise you won't even know you're on a path to begin with. Imploring him to seek the truth even if it scares him, she reiterates that the strength of others will always help when he's afraid, because knowing that you're helping people will in turn strengthen you, the same way that knowing people were brought joy by her performances helped her when she was anxious before a concert. With those wise words said, we arrive at the trial grounds, and the long-awaited class trial finally begins. Before we can even get into story stuff, let's talk game mechanics for a little bit. It's been a little while since we've gotten to do that, hasn't it? For once, we can even talk about the ability to equip skills in the court prep menu too, because instead of being relegated to simply specific skills you unlock from free time events, the game has changed a bit. Here you can use points you acquire from free times to spend in this little in-game menu, choosing which specific skills you'd like to buy and equip with a limited number of slots to fill which you might increase in capacity over time. It's an interesting way to broaden the potential build you put to use in a trial rather than simply gaining random skills you often can't predict from certain specific character free times. I think this way of doing it is a lot more useful, even if it means the skills themselves are less cheekily tailored to mirror specific characters you might acquire them from. Though you still get skills from completing a character's free times which are tailored to them, so I guess it's got the best of both worlds here. Returning as always are non-stop debates, which work exactly the same as they have in previous games, with yellow statements presenting opportunities to fire a truth bullet that contradicts them, and blue statements, which return from SDR2, providing opportunities to concur with said statement and piggyback off someone else's point. Multiple choice answer sections and evidence presentation also returns and functions basically the same way, albeit with a bit more streamlined UI. In fact, this would probably be a good time to state that the UI in this game is, in general, one of its best elements, I feel. I know these kinds of things are often so understated in video game discussion that most barely even stop to think about it, but these presentational elements often sculpt the entire feel of a game, and it's doing V3 a lot of favors by being pretty gorgeously stylish to look at. It lends the entire game a sense of mystique and aesthetic that makes it the most pleasingly sleek Danganronpa game to look at for the most part. And it gives a lot of these gameplay sections a really satisfying edge, because the visual and sound design alike just makes it feel good to play. This carries right over into our first unique addition to the gameplay sections, which is the mass panic debate. MPDs work basically the same way a regular non-stop debate does, but it includes several people talking over each other at once. You can hone your reticle in on one character to listen to them more closely, but for the most part you're basically doing all of the same legwork as usual, just trying to weed out the most important statement of the bunch while everyone talks over each other. It's eclectic, chaotic, and just as engaging as you'd expect. It can get a little much, but it's certainly not a terrible addition when it comes to spicing up the usual gameplay loop. Speaking of spicing up the gameplay loop, rebuttal showdowns make a return from SDR2 as well, and work just about the same way as they did there. They're like one-on-one -on -one non nonstop debates where you wait for your chance to strike against your opponent with the correct truth blade, while defending from their regular statements. This time the controls have changed a bit, however. As in SDR2, you would swipe automatically with the flick of the control stick, but this time you use the stick to line up your strike, then have to press the button to actually slash. It makes precise aiming a bit easier, and it definitely helps with V3's new mechanic, V counters, where if you hit the statement at the exact right point, you get more points overall at the end of the trial. This is where things get really interesting for the debates, however. While SDR2 added the ability to agree with others, iterating upon the regular disagreements, V3 has added its own quirk to the bag, with the ability to lie during non-stop debates. With the idea in mind that sometimes lying for the greater good is also a way we must reach an overall truth, you have to hold down the button you use to shoot your truth bullets to turn said bullet into a lie bullet. A lie bullet is basically like a version of said truth bullet which relays a falsehood about that piece of specific evidence, rather than the truth about it. Looking for specific places in debates to use these lie bullets will help steer the conversation, in theory, away from something that appears to be leading everyone down the wrong track, which should hopefully steer the discussion back in the correct direction, if utilized appropriately. Sometimes these opportunities can even present themselves in optional backdoor routes, which aren't specifically pointed out to the player and aren't necessary to utilize in order to progress. These offer the opportunity to get slightly different discussions, but they will inevitably rejoin the regular narrative at one point, so this doesn't really affect the outcome, per se. Lying will be mandatory at some points, though, and I honestly find this very interesting for reasons I'm sure we'll get more into later. I just wish it was more heavily utilized, because as it is in the final game, I feel like the mechanic actually gets pretty underused, 
use despite its thematic relevance. It pretty much only gets one major mandatory use per trial, in fact, which seems a bit silly considering how important the whole idea of lies is supposed to be here, which ironically I consider one of the bigger gameplay faults. But oh well. The next unique minigame we get is one of my favorites, and that's the debate scrum. This comes about when the class is split evenly on an issue and can't come to an agreement about it. You'll basically have to listen to everyone in the opposing side's statements and match them to a relevant statement from your team, whittling them down until you've accounted for all of their individual objections. In terms of gameplay, it's not actually the most interesting minigame of the bunch, but the presentation and absolutely banging music that goes along with it does more than enough to sell it as one of the better parts of V3's new gameplay additions for me. I just wish they took a little longer and had a bit more meat to them, but I will gladly play the OST track on loop to myself whenever. And now, though there are more minigame types to cover, we have to double back to the plot for now. There are a couple more to mention in this trial, but there's something specific we have to talk about before we can show those, and any others are ones that don't appear until after Chapter 1, so we'll mention them in the trials they become relevant in. For now, let's rewind and talk about what all the discussion behind these minigames we've been showing off is, shall we? Because by the time we've gotten here, we're already, like, halfway through it. Obviously, the discussion of whether Amami was the mastermind ends pretty quickly, since it's easy to prove he wasn't, but Akamatsu is still determined to use the trial to expose said mastermind's identity. What we need to focus on firstly, though, and what ends up taking a lot of the trial's real estate, is the matter of how Amami was killed if the culprit never showed up in any of those photos. This leads to a line of questioning spanning several suspects, starting with the one who made the cameras, Iruma, who was accused by Alma. Thankfully for her, we can already prove that she wasn't responsible, as she has an alibi verifiable by both Shinguji and Shirogane, and even though Shirogane left at one point, Shinguji was with her the whole time. Oma even admits after this that he knew the whole time that she had an alibi, but basically led everyone on the conversational equivalent of a wild goose chase for the hell of it. What a bastard. The matter of Shirogane disguising herself comes up, but we already know why that can't work either. Everyone at the strategy meeting denies being involved, but they do point their suspicions back toward Gokuhara for closing himself up in the AV room, and having no excuses other than, I wanted to watch a bug movie so I could punch better. Though it's quickly established that he couldn't leave through the back door because of how narrowly it opened, Tojo argues that he could have possibly used the rolled up screen to stick through the crack, open the library door, and then throw the shot put ball from across the hall to kill Amami with. Considering his superhuman strength, it does seem technically plausible, but there is a problem with this line of reasoning which stops it in its tracks. In the pictures, it's clear that Amami had the hidden shelf open directly prior to his death, and it only closed after he was actually dead, meaning that if someone threw the ball from across the hall, it would have hit the shelf and gotten blocked, meaning this solution is a bust too. Yonaga argues the culprit could have hidden behind the hidden door, but the dust being in the card reader already confirms that nobody used it. They couldn't have used the vent either because the book pile would have collapsed if they tried to crawl on it. At this point, however, Irima reveals that because of the nature of how the camera auto rolls, the camera can't take a new photo for 30 whole seconds after the shutter snaps. The fact that Saihara completely neglected to mention this before casts a lot of suspicion on him, not to mention the fact that he's been acting awkward this whole time anyway. This obviously gets everyone discussing whether or not he's the culprit, which leads to the moment we have to lie in order to protect him. Akamatsu does this by claiming that the receiver was on her person rather than Saihara's, and this visibly shocks Saihara, who knows for a fact that this isn't the case. This culminates in a debate scrum, which ends with Akamatsu imploring Saihara to speak his mind about what he's been withholding. Finally, Saihara comments on how suspicious he thinks it is that Amami noticed the camera at all, with him concluding that he must have because the lighting in said photos clearly showed that the flash was on, seemingly done to lure Amami over to it. Seeing as Saihara was both very methodical about not wanting the flash to be on while setting up the cameras, this bothers him, and it makes it very clear, despite how impossible it seems, where our suspicions should be directed. The only other person who knew about the plan beforehand, who could have turned the flash on while nobody was the wiser, was Akamatsu herself. Lamenting to herself how Saihara has noticed the truth, and that he has to pursue it no matter how painful it is, we watch as the UI goes colorless and flickers out around her, with the internal monologue switching to Saihara's own, and reviving as he promises to expose the truth as she's entrusted him to do. Yes, they just went there. Our supposed main character all along was an unreliable narrator who committed the murder herself. And now we pivot the main character seat over to Saihara, who must honor her final wishes by revealing the truth he was so terrified to acknowledge, even when he had already begun to suspect it long ago. The truth that was always too painful for him to want to expose, he has no choice but to do so now. 
And this decision is a little controversial for some, but I'd rather wait to get into it and my thoughts about it until we reach the end of the trial, where we can dig into my overall opinions of the chapter itself more broadly, so tuck this one into your hat for now, we'll definitely be getting to it later. To test Saihara's dedication to his accusation, Akamatsu basically turns right around and starts insisting that she can't be the culprit, in an attempt to see if he really has the strength to carry forward. Her excuse of choice is that she was in the classroom with Saihara as Amami was killed, and she wouldn't be strong enough to throw the shot put ball, but it becomes clear how she could have done this if you think about where she used it. This leads us into the third and final version of Hangman's Gambit, a minigame that took until V3 to actually be remotely good. You see the reason now why I put off talking about these last few minigames, they show Saihara on them instead of Akamatsu, so I figured I'd wait for the reveal to pass. Anywho, in this version of Hangman's Gambit, you have a limited range to flash light on these otherwise grey indistinct bubbles, which reveal what letters they are when you do so. You can select them and add them to the anagram and complete the word to answer the question. It's simple but effective, but it's a bit more engaging than the piss easy one from DR1 one, and it's nowhere near as convoluted and horrible to play as the one from SDR2. It strikes a nice middle ground, and that's all it really needed. Anyway, the answer is the vent. More specifically, she took the ball out of her backpack, which she had bundled up in a spare vest, rolled it into the vent that connected to the library, and then it came out and bludgeoned Amami. How did it do this, you may be asking? Well, we can actually answer this thanks to the layout photos taken by Iruma's drone. When Akamatsu was clearing books earlier, she actually made an elaborate slope behind the stacks, which lead down and open up to make a perfect slide. She even made sure the vent was open in the library beforehand to facilitate this. Then the camera's flash led Amami to the spot where he'd need to be standing for the ball to hit him. The reason the noise wasn't noticed by anyone is because of the blaring time limit music that Monokuma was playing at the time, and she obviously could have gotten the shot put ball from the storehouse to put in her bag when they were retrieving the camera equipment. However, despite all of this, Saihara still believes in Akamatsu's good intentions, which she interprets as him still running from the truth, but he's determined to prove to her that he isn't, leading to the argument armament. This sort of resembles the BTB and PTA from the previous two games. It's a rhythm minigame to finish off the culprit's argument. It's still a little wonky, but the focus is now on clearing individual statements with specific button presses at the right time, rather than a constant beat, and this works a bit better in my opinion. It also includes cool shadow self art of the character in question that you're arguing against, which is dismantled along the way. Again, the final statement is delivered with specific words being assigned to each face button and needing to order the statement correctly. In this case, we spell out Akamatsu's intentions, to get rid of the mastermind. She was convinced that the person coming to the library would be the mastermind themselves after all, and she made a drastic decision to try and end the killing game and free everyone. Saihara is quick to reason that because he told all of his ideas and theories to her that his own detective work is to blame for this outcome, but in tears, she insists that nobody is to blame but her. Her final request is for Saihara to spell out the whole case, to convince everyone who still has doubts, and this leads to the end of trial staple, the climax inference. As with previous games, we fill in the empty manga panels to spell out the sequence of events that comprise the crime's narrative. Like in SDR2, we get a limited stock of panels to work with at one time, and unlock more when we've allocated them properly. The presentation is very stylish, but I find that it's a bit more difficult to see than in SDR2 with its bigger panels at the bottom of the screen. I still think it's a bit more intuitive than DR1's climax inference sections, but the presentation could be improved. If there's one thing I have to hand these sections in V3 though, it's this game's version of the Climax Inference theme music. In previous entries, it's been this sort of funky lo-fi song that feels like you're finally unraveling the truth. In V3, it's almost melancholy, still keeping that familiar pace, but almost feeling resigned, embodying the attitude of Saihara himself, who desperately wishes none of this were true, but must reluctantly peel back the sordid layers of truth anyway. With the crime spelled out, Akamatsu confesses, and everyone is dejected. Even so, she still tries to convince Saihara to be brave, to carry on her wishes, and to protect everyone so that a killing doesn't happen again. The vote rolls in, and Akamatsu is found guilty. Though a few people briefly try to fight Monokuma and the cubs to prevent them from dragging her away to her death, they intervene with the Exosols, and Akamatsu begs them not to get themselves killed fighting on her behalf, but to instead keep surviving and find a way to end all of this. 
As everyone promises to do just that, the execution begins. Akamatsu is dragged by the neck to a giant piano and dangled by her throat, forced to play a melody that rapidly increases in pace by the tips of her dangling shoes. As it chokes the life out of her, the song finally ends as she sways lifelessly, the spiked back of the lid closing over and crushing her corpse into a bloody pulp, while the frequently bullied Monodam decides at that exact moment to push Monokid in the way, also killing him along with her. I really wish they had found a different way to kill off the cubs. Though their deaths do factor into the plot to an extent, I find it really jarring and tonally inappropriate to throw their deaths alongside the characters we are ostensibly supposed to actually care about. Akamatsu's death is horrifying, grim, and emotionally impactful, and tossing Monokid into the mix in this nearly goofy slapstick manner really just seems to spoil the mood. I'm sure this probably isn't as big of a deal to some people as it is to me, but it really took me out of this otherwise effective scene, and it kind of pisses me off a little bit. Well, speaking of pissed off, after the cubs disappear, with Monodam claiming to have done what he did for the rest of them, Momata punches Saihara and knocks him to the ground. Apparently, he's pretty mad that while Akamatsu passed her wishes on to him, Saihara didn't say a thing to Monokuma, and questions how he can call himself a man because of this. Wait your turn on the localization discussion train, Momota, we will be getting to you. As everyone leaves, he calms down a bit and tells Saihara to visit Akamatsu's lab, thinking that the memories of her left there may be enough to console him when no one else can. Saihara heads there, finding a CD of Claire de Lune, a song she once mentioned to him. As he stands silently listening to it, he thinks back on all of her kind words and resolves himself to carry on fighting and facing the truth for everyone's sake, and hers too. A ghostly image of Akamatsu appears playing the piano, reiterating her trust in him and saying goodbye. As chapter one comes to a close, 14 surviving members of the class left. This is certainly an interesting chapter. I don't know if this is controversial to say, but I honestly find it to be one of the most strongly written chapters of the game, and certainly one of the strongest opening chapters in the series. The foreshadowing is excellently planned, Chekhov's guns go off expertly, and exactly when they need to, and the characterization for the key players is mostly very strong. The mystery is very intricate, but still resists being too mechanically convoluted. Most of the difficulty, in fact, I would argue, comes from the fact that players aren't necessarily going to expect that the character they're playing as would actually turn out to be the killer. This has never been done before in Danganronpa after all, so it certainly comes as a shock. Speaking of which, let's talk about that twist a little bit now that we have a moment. Specifically, let's talk about why it really, really bothers some people, and what I think about this personally. So, if you didn't know this before, Akamatsu is practically all over this game's marketing, especially leading up to its release. Her position as main character was made very clear in all of this material, and when you look at it all cumulatively, it's easy to see this as another example of the DR team pulling a Mizuno, where they got people adjusted to the expectation that a specific character would have a large role, only to kill them off early as a source of shock to the player. With Mizuno, this wasn't seen as particularly egregious. It was certainly shocking, but Mizuno was not supposed to be the main character. If anything, people expected her to be the sort of Maya Fey-esque assistant to the main character, which made her status as first kill very surprising. Akamatsu, however, was a character many people were excited about before even knowing much about her, and that's for one simple reason. She's the first female protagonist in a mainline entry of the series. Now, sure, we do have Komaru and Ultra Despair Girls, which is narratively important to the original story if you actually want to finish it, but many people didn't feel as though that really carried the same weight as DR1 or SDR2 since it was technically a totally different genre and wasn't labeled as a main entry. I think as far as female protagonists go, Komaru is really excellent, and even beyond that, Otonashi is also a female protagonist for the series in Danganronpa Zero, and I also find her excellent, but I get what people are saying here. They want a female protagonist in an entry of the series that is the same as the main two prior. For that reason, Akamatsu was an exciting prospect, and she was also an excellent character in her own right, very fresh compared to previous protagonists, and with a very well-fleshed out and likable personality. And now, here she is getting killed off in the first chapter to make way for yet another boy. A lot of people will call this an example of fridging, which, if you don't know what that means, I'll go ahead and summarize it right now. This term refers to when a loved one, typically a female character, is hurt, killed, or traumatized to facilitate another character's motivation in the plot or move their story forward, meaning they only served that purpose and weren't really given much opportunity to matter as a character on their own. This was popularized by Gail Simone through her website Women in Refrigerators, which compiled many instances of female comic book characters being used for just such a purpose, and being named after an example in Green Lantern A New Dawn, where Kyle's girlfriend is killed and stuffed into a fridge by the villain for him to find. 
The trope is often seen as very lazy, serving to motivate the protagonist while disempowering and devaluing a female character for angst, and that female character is often a love interest as well, which makes this even more blatant. In terms of whether or not I think this applies in V3, I'd say it's complicated. Akamatsu, to me, does seem pretty well fleshed out and individually is strongly characterized. She has an understandable character, which I don't think seems too much like an accessory to anyone, and furthermore she has an arc with a beginning, middle, and end. It's easy to follow it through and is internally consistent as well as impactful. Her death does motivate and sadden Saihara, but it also serves more of a narrative purpose later on and also ties into the game's overall themes, emphasizing them as the story moves forward. For that reason, I don't find it necessarily accurate to say that this is a straight played example of fridging, at least not in the literal sense, but it doesn't have to be for me to understand why it still feels kind of shitty to some. It's still true that she was marketed as a main character, and that having a female main character for a main entry was a pretty big deal to people. To have her die in chapter 1 and be replaced by yet another male main character must feel like a pretty obnoxious betrayal to those people who got excited for her, and as a larger media trend, it's certainly very understandable why this would be frustrating. That said, given the direction the story takes with this in the future, I do think it has relevance beyond what people are sometimes willing to give it credit for. And furthermore, I don't think that just because this decision was questionably handled, that Saihara is a bad character. We'll be getting more into what I think about him as we go, but I actually like him quite a bit, and I don't think his character's strength should be ignored, even if this transition is very much worth criticizing. With that elephant in the room addressed, I also do want to take a moment to compliment the way this twist was delivered, annoying implications about it put aside for now. Like I said, nothing like this has been done in Danganronpa before, so all of your franchise savviness really falls by the wayside when this sneaks up on you, and it does an excellent job at blindsiding you and leaving you totally stunned when you realize that your POV character's perspective hasn't been entirely objective or truthful. It's the logical extreme of the Hinata twist in SDR2 delivered in so much more of a directly cruel and saddening way and it really sells the impact of the chapter's individual narrative to me. My only other complaint would simply be that I don't think Amami got as much characterization as he needed for me to really care about his death. I know he is deliberately mysterious, and this becomes relevant later as well, but I think a bit more of a personal connection to him could have made this case reach even higher heights, and not doing so was a bit of a missed opportunity in my opinion. That's the reason I did his free times, in fact, because I was hoping they would add a bit more depth of character, but honestly, it wasn't much, and if you don't do his free times, you get even less than that. As he is in the final game, Amami just comes across as aloof and a little mysterious, but he doesn't really make that strong of an impression on me. And as the game's first victim, this is a little disappointing. Overall, I think this chapter certainly has aspects worth criticizing, but it took a lot of risks and delivered pretty strongly regardless. And for that reason, I can't give it too much grief and have to say that it's probably one of the highlights of the game to me and puts a strong foot forward. As to whether or not the rest of the game can stack up to the example it presents, well, we'll see, won't we? As we start up this chapter, we get a mysterious few people lamenting over what appears to be Akamatsu's death, attributing supposed fault to a group they don't specify much more about. Afterward, we see Gokuhara discover some mysterious writing on the ground that says, the horse A. <laughs> I'm sorry, give me a minute. Rejoining Saihara's POV, we see that he answers the door for a badgering Momota, who invites him to the cafeteria for breakfast, apologizing for punching him while he's at it. Once Saihara arrives, we see that he's abandoned his hat, no doubt spurred by Akamatsu's death, to be more confident in himself. Underneath lies the Danganronpa protagonist's typical design quirk of a giant cowlick, so he's basically cemented his transition into the role. While Tojo makes and serves breakfast, everyone tries to act normal, but clearly they're all still shaken up. Gokuhara mentions the graffiti he found and says that he could swear he saw a bug too, but people raise their doubts considering the closed environment. Before too much time can pass, of course, Monokuma has to show back up, along with the cubs. They bring a mysterious array of items, an ancient passport, a dragon gem, an ocarina, and a hexagonal crank, that they expect us to use somewhere throughout the school and pretty much leave it at that, though it's clear to see that their unity is getting shaky with Monosuke now perpetually afraid that Monodam is going to kill another one of them. Meanwhile, Monodam swears up and down that peace is secured and he should just chill out. 
With that said, we now have to roam around finding exactly where to use these things, and while it may be a bit annoying, their applications do lead to some interesting discoveries, namely of more research labs. First, from the passport we discover Yuminos, which has a lot of magician supplies. Then from the Dragon Gem we find Tojo's, which has a Victorian aesthetic and many appliances and tools for housekeeping. Beyond that, we can also explore the upper floor a bit more and find Gokuhara's lab full of bugs, and a treasure chest with a mysterious flashlight-looking device inside, which Yonaga quickly takes to try and figure out on her own. On the third floor, we find Hoshi's lab, which contains a full tennis court and some kind of pitching robot, as well as a shower room that we can't quite enter yet. Down the hall is a mysterious pixelated door that appears to be painted on the wall, as well as Harukawa's lab, which we can't really get a good look at because she refuses to let anyone enter it. Going outside, we can use the ocarina at a stone monument to clear leaves away from what turns out to be the pool building. Though the place is pretty nice, the water is kept mandatorily shallow enough so that getting in and out of it would be slightly difficult, and swimming is forbidden after nighttime regardless. It does have windows connected to the gym and some other mysterious place we're not aware of yet, but aside from that, it doesn't seem to have much beyond a storage room that has the kind of stuff you'd likely expect to find at a pool. Near a strange door outside by Momota, we use the final item, the crank, to access the courtyard's night spot. There, we have two attractions to approach, starting with the casino. Inside are a variety of games you can play, done by exchanging mono coins for casino coins. Any winnings you make can be used to exchange for prizes at the counter, though if Momota's rise and subsequent fall are anything to go by, it's not as easy as it seems. The two available games right off the bat are Salmon Fishing, which is kind of like the Hangman's Gambit where you try to remember the correct colored fish instead of the letter you need, and your average slot machine, which is totally not addictive or anything. Okay, just one more time. <laughs> yeah! Once you finally peel yourself away from the slots, you can also see that there's a love hotel, which... Okay, well, let's just get this out of the way now so I don't have to talk about it later. The Love Hotel is a place where you can get some optional scenes if you spend an absurd amount of casino coins on a love key. This gives you a randomized scene with one of the still-living characters where both people mysteriously enter in a dreamlike state and the other character sees you, the protagonist, as their ideal person. This tends to lend some character insight, and while some scenes can be okay, others are, uh, not great for reasons of, oh good, more ins jokes and oh good more assault jokes among others i mostly hate this feature and i didn't bother with it on my replay of the game so moving right along when we exit yonaga arrives to say she's finally figured out the flashlight and calls saihara with everyone else to the gym turns out she just asked monokuma who explains that this is a flashback light meant to restore some of the cast's fuzzy memories though they do have some deliberation about it the choice is ultimately made to take the light head on which leads to everyone remembering more about the super high school level hunt that was mentioned before this was mentioned by Amami before. I, I can't actually remember if I put this in the script earlier, but uh, well, it, it doesn't really matter anyway. All he did was name drop it, so uh, there you go, you're caught up. Apparently they were all being hunted for their talents, but ran and chose to use experimental technology to abandon said talents by having their memories put to sleep. They can't really remember why the hunt was happening though, nor what happened afterward that got them into this situation, but they speculate that those responsible for the hunt may also be responsible for the killing game, to which Monokuma obviously won't say one way or the other. In the mix, Saihara also hears himself talking about how he doesn't want to live, how he wants to die with everyone, which understandably shakes him up quite a bit. Given that we have a bit of free time after this, maybe it wouldn't hurt to hang out with somebody else who's seemingly having some trouble finding a reason to live. Maybe it'll do us both some good. So I decided to use all of my slots for this chapter on everyone's favorite tennis player, Ryoma Hoshi. Though his backstory is a bit over the top, entailing his exploits of trying to show up a rigged tennis game that some mafia members are holding underground, then getting all of his loved ones killed in retaliation for it, then using those tennis skills to kill those mafia members in revenge, there is a certain grounded feeling to the emotions of it. Hoshi has practically nothing left to live for anymore, and he's used his talent for something he considers reprehensible, which only further fuels that self-hatred. Only when Saihara genuinely asks him about his interests and tries to engage with him as a friend without using him for purely voyeuristic pleasure does he begin to actually open up. He does briefly try to push Saihara away, but once the cat's out of the bag about his past, he starts to really appreciate the effort Saihara's put into understanding him, which culminates in a fierce tennis match between the two where they both collapse on the court and chat aimlessly with one another. Hoshi's saying that once he gets out of here, he'll pick everything he's abandoned back up, Saihara literally having given him his will to live back for something. As sweet as this is though, the main plot chugs along, everyone receiving a strange pad from the Cubs one morning which contains a motive video. A motive video basically shows the most important person in someone's life and throws out a terrifying what if about their status, similar to the videos from chapter 1 of the first game. But it seems like everyone's gotten the wrong ones. 
Saihara, for example, gets Momotas, showing his proud grandparents who just want him to live happily, with Monokuma explaining that shortly after filming they got into some kind of accident, which he won't disclose the details of. Everyone gathers in the cafeteria to discuss these weird things, and there is a lot of disagreement about what to do with them. This obviously isn't helped by Oma trying consistently to get everyone to look at them, and many others arguing it will clearly only lead to another killing if they do so. Deciding not to watch them, another day of free time passes. At night, Momota asks Saihara to come out with him, demanding that they both train their bodies to become stronger. Saihara, who is unused to it, definitely struggles, and struggles even more emotionally when Momota says that this training is specifically because he wants to help Saihara become strong enough to carry Akamatsu's wishes. He asks if Saihara feels responsible for her death still, and he admits what he's been struggling with every night since the execution. That he does blame himself, and there's obviously an undercurrent of self-loathing and even that same suicidal ideation poking through because of it. Momota can't quite quite wrap his head around the fear of exposing the truth, but he does think training will help Saihara fortify himself and be able to get past it, and in the end he admits that maybe he does need something like that right about now. And sure enough, when he returns to his room, he's so exhausted from the training that he has no time at all to worry about the things that previously kept him up at night, drifting easily to sleep right afterward. This is honestly a really sweet scene, though I wish Momota was as tactful about someone's depression when it came to, say, Hoshi, who he basically calls a coward for it. Well, anyway, the next morning we've got other things to worry about, namely that it seems like Yonaga is strong-arming Yumino into her religion, and has announced a magic show that they're putting on for everyone as a result. Later on, Momota comes barging into Saihara's room to warn him about impending doom, which turns out to be Gokuhara going around and kidnapping everyone for some reason. Though Hoshi manages to get away, Saihara's attempt is not quite so successful. Why ending up in Gokuhara's lab along with Oma. It seems that along with Chibashira, Shinguji, Kibo, Yumino, Yonaga, and Shiragane, we've been brought here because Oma tricked Gokuhara into thinking everyone present hated bugs and needed to be shown how cool they were. Really what he wants is to sneak out during that time and steal everyone's Moda videos and then hold a forcible viewing party. Before he can do so though, Kibo plays back a recording which he was able to make with his onboard tape deck to prove to Gokuhara that Oma was just using him. In his rage, everyone but Oma escapes and here him being swarmed by bugs. The next morning, everyone gathers in the gym for the magic show, where Yumino is supposedly going to escape from a water tank behind a curtain before a bunch of piranhas are dropped inside with her. Everyone is very worried about this, and they start to worry even more when a lot of the timer passes without her emerging. Not able to wait, Gokuhara jumps on the stage to see what's happening, but the buzzer goes off and releases the piranhas into the tank. As everyone runs forward to open the curtains, they unexpectedly see Hoshi, handcuffed and floating in the water, who is promptly eaten. Though Yumino appears briefly after to announce her daring escape, she notices too late that behind her is a tank full of blood. Well, this is certainly pretty screwed up, huh? I know, I know, understatement of the century, but needless to say, we've got to figure out what happened here. Nothing is more important than... Hold on just a second. Come on, come on, come on, damn it! All right, what were we talking about? Oh, right. So after Chibashire and Gokuhara literally toss Kibo into the tank to break it, we can finally start to clean up and get to investigating. And there is quite a bit to cover here. Quite a few people are suspicious of Yumino since she's the one who was doing the magic show in the first place, but under the guidance of Momota, who insists that Saihara is now his sidekick, we'll try to wrap our heads around what's really going on here. The cause of death says drowning, but the time is obscured. Apparently several people helped with preparations, with Momota, Kibo, Yumino, and Yonaga prepping the supplies, and Tojo helping to sew curtains and arrange other things last minute. The piranha tank is attached to the stage battens, and only the front side of it is glass, with the others being wooden and there seemingly being no lid. There's also a control panel for helping to lower and raise the battens. Getting the ladder to check the upper window, Saihara finds the window to the pool area is open, and the frame has some strange abrasions. Near the tank itself, Yonaga confides that she thought the piranhas looked much more plentiful than before this morning, but they obviously couldn't have multiplied overnight. On the bottom of the tank, there's a strange square pane of glass, as well as the handcuffs Hoshi was wearing, which have strange scratches on them. When asking Gokuhara what he saw, he says he saw nothing was in the tank at all when he got up on the stage. To the side of the stage, there's also a staircase, a rope, and a puddle of water. At the pool, there's an inner tube floating in the water tied to a rope, and a mysterious scrap of black cloth as well. Monokuma also appears to reiterate that it's against the rules for anyone to have been swimming after nighttime, and Saihara speculates because of this that maybe the tube couldn't be retrieved from the pool because of this. In Hoshi's room, Saihara hopes to find the motive video he had, speculating that he might have had the culprits, but it can't be found anywhere, which also definitely carries some implications along with it. 
Momota briefly muses that maybe showing everyone each other's Mota videos would have been for the best after all, but is confused when Saihara brings up that that's what Oma was trying to accomplish. Unsure how to process that, considering he clearly hates Oma. In Yumino's lab, we get an alibi from Oma for the hour he was unaccounted for during the insect meet and greet, claiming to have been scolded then chased around by Tojo. He also claims to have seen a girl wandering around in her underwear, which, when combined with Irima's statements about how she escaped Gokuhara's capture by using her secret woman weapon, paints a pretty clear picture of where she was during all of this, too. In the room, there's also a backup water tank similar to the one used during the performance, which Saihara is able to investigate to find a secret escape hatch and deduce Yumino's trick. In Hoshi's lab, we finally investigate the shower room, which is themed more after his status as a prisoner than a tennis player. A set of handcuffs is missing, and similar scratch marks that were found on the gym windowsill and pair of handcuffs Hoshi was wearing are found on the sink. We also figure out that the other window overlooking the pool is from the shower room, with yet again scratches on the windowsill. In the main lab, Saihara also notices the tennis net is down and the cable has been removed. It's just about as long as the rope that was found in the gym. Finally, near Harukawa's lab, Tojo is keeping an eye on her and confirms the last Hoshi was seen alive was around 8pm when he escaped from Gokuhara. Furthermore, Harukawa establishes that she has no good alibi because she was guarding off her lab the entire time, like she already had been doing for a while now. And with that, we've gathered all the clues Monokuma thinks we need, which means that it's time for the ever-anticipated class trial. Reiterating his belief in Saihara, Momota states something that's pretty thematically salient, and for that reason I want to give special attention to it here, because it's going to come back up. Why? Why do you trust me, Momota-kun? There's a chance that I'm the culprit. I believe in you because I want to. Do I need a reason other than that? Isn't that why you believed in Akamatsu-san? I mean, sure. I might get betrayed in the end, but if I worry about that, I won't be able to believe in the people I want to believe in. Shuichi, we're still young. I can't die before I've had my first drink or gone to space. If you're not going to get yourself in gear now, then when? Now's all you've got. Yeah, Momotaka. I know. Yeah, that's the expression I wanted to see. <laughs> that's my sidekick. In the process, he briefly flashes back to that confusing, isolated statement. I want to die with everyone, and throws it away. No, Sayara says. I want to live. And on that heartwarming note, we head down to the Shrine of Judgment, ready to face whatever horrors may await down the elevator and amidst the trial grounds. Once again, before we start the trial, we have a couple of mini-games to talk about that are only introduced in it. The first new addition is probably one of the most iconic in V3's arsenal, that being Psyche Taxi. It's somewhat similar to the Logic Dive from SDR2, but instead of riding a mind snowboard, you're driving a mind taxi. I was never that good at Crazy Taxi, but thankfully you don't have to be to succeed here. You just have to floor it while collecting little Mario Kart item blocks that slowly fill in the blanks of a question. And by slowly, I do mean slowly. This seriously takes freaking ages. It's honestly why I kind of prefer Logic Dive. Well, anyway, once you've assembled the question, you're then given some potential routes and a passenger that corresponds to each. Each one represents a specific answer to the question, and to choose yours, all you need to do is ram into that answer's respective passenger, which flips them into your car instead of getting Saihara charged with vehicular manslaughter on the astral plane. If you get it right, the minigame proceeds until it ends. Pretty simple once you get past all the wacky set dressing, but I feel like its previous incarnation handled things a bit better in terms of its pacing. This by comparison kind of drags because of the part where you have to collect the blocks. Oh well, at least it looks cool. The next minigame type is Mind Mine, which uh, kind of like if Minesweeper had a love child with Tetris and a jigsaw puzzle. It's not as complicated as it sounds really, you just have to select blocks that are next to blocks of a similar color, which will cause chain reactions and flip other blocks, yada yada yada. You do this to uncover the picture of the specific item that you need to point out, and if you get stuck you can also break single blocks forcefully at the cost of time on your timer. This one just kind of sucks, to be honest. I mean, it's not like SDR2's Hangman's Gambit or anything. It's pretty easy to wrap your head around, but it just feels kind of like a waste of time. And like the question I'm being asked could just as easily have been another multiple choice question. So yeah, it's probably my least favorite minigame of the bunch, truth be told. And with that out of the way, on with the trial itself. A lot of the start of the trial focuses around explaining Yumino's magic tricks, since she's obviously going to remain stubborn and refuse to call it anything aside from actual magic. Thankfully, the hatch we found on the identical tank is more than enough to get the ball rolling. Because said hatch was perfectly aligned with the stairs on the side, we can now see that Yumino escaped into the staircase once the curtain obscured the tank. From there, there was an escape hatch facing away from the audience that she got out of, explaining the puddle of water by the backstage area. Then, all she had to do was dry her hair a bit, change into a spare change of clothes, and put her hat back on. At that point, nobody could really tell the difference. 
However, when it comes to explaining where Hoshi's body was hidden, the stairs are pretty much ruled out. The space was too cramped for Yumino and Hoshi to both be inside it, and if she pulled it out at that moment, Gokuhara should have at least seen one of them when he got on stage. But recall if you will, Gokuhara didn't actually see anyone. So what's going on here? Well, what if Hoshi's body was actually in the piranha tank? Now, this would be a bit difficult to explain given that they didn't eat him until afterward, but we actually have a piece of evidence that can already explain this. The single pane of square glass on the tank's bottom, or as we come to realize, the lid of the piranha tank. It was supposed to stay atop the tank, but was laid inside at an angle, both serving to separate the hungry fish from Hoshi's already drowned corpse, and to force them all to the front so that his corpse was obscured from view until the moment they all dropped. This proves to be a bit tricky, though, considering that the time to do this is rather limited. It seems like the murder and setup would have to have happened before nighttime the day prior because a siren will go off in the gym if you enter it after nighttime, and hiding the body in the morning before the show would have been impossible, as Yonaga and Yumino were waiting in front of the gym for the morning announcement. Considering he was seen near the time of the insect meet and greet, it's easy to say that he was alive around 8 o'clock, so that would mean he'd have to die between then and 10 p.m. The only people not apprehended by Gokuhara at that time were Tojo, Momota, Iruma, and Harukawa. Tojo was alone in the gym for a bit, but it was only for around 5 minutes till 9pm. We also know that she was scolding Oma and chasing him around from about 9pm to 10, so this gives her very little time to do anything. Iruma can be easily eliminated from suspicion because it's pretty easy to figure out from context clues, plus hers and Oma's testimonies, that she was walking around half naked to prevent Gokuhara from capturing her. And indeed, this worked out for her as he was too embarrassed to grab her while she was stripped down. With this narrowing the pool down to Harukawa and Momota, Oma insists that both argue their own cases because only the innocent party can know who between the two is the murderer. It's at this point we learn who took the cubs pad from Hoshi's room. That's right, it was Oma. And this motive video happens to belong to Harukawa. In fact, it's easy to tell considering Saihara had Momotas and would know right away that it wasn't his because of this. This casts a lot of suspicion on Harukawa herself, but in a surprising turn, Momota refuses to concede to Oma's logic, refusing outright to suspect Harukawa, all purely because of a hunch. He's decided to believe in her, and because this reminds Saihara of his words of belief in the detective himself, he decides too to side with Harukawa. This prompts Harukawa to speak up a bit more, admitting that Hoshi had been tipped off about her having his video and coming to ask her about it. Of course, Oma is the one who told him this, and Harukawa claims to have had no problems showing it to him. Of course, not everybody's on board to believe this story since it can't really be corroborated, and that gives us our mandatory lie of the chapter, where we chime in with Momota to insist that during a late nighttime workout session that never had the chance to happen, they both heard Harukawa talking with Hoshi and could therefore confirm the meeting even if only by sound. Momota seamlessly chips in to agree with this narrative, but this seemingly proves that Hoshi was still alive after 10pm, which opens the possibilities back up for who killed him and how his body was placed in the piranha tank. So how could his corpse make its way into the tank after nighttime, if access to the gym was forbidden? Well, how about through the window? It's certainly possible, but it would require a big setup and a lot of precision. You couldn't just toss the body through the window and expect to get everything perfectly in place. Surely this will be easier to figure out, though, if we just stop to consider where and how the initial murder occurred. Obviously, since it's past nighttime, it was impossible to drown him in the pool, because swimming after nighttime is against the rules, so where does that leave? Well, if you'll recall, Hoshi's cuffs share some distinct scratch marks that were seen on the sink in his lab's shower room. This means he was probably drowned in the sink, then transported afterward. How did they transport him, though? Simple. Through the window in the shower room, which overlooked the pool. Judging by the rope in the gym, the tennis net cable in Hoshi's lab, the scratches on both windowsills, and the inner tube in the middle of the pool, perhaps the culprit made a makeshift ropeway to move the body. Once at the windowsill, they could have stood on the side without entirely entering, then carefully dropped Hoshi into place. Monosuke even accidentally reveals that this wouldn't count as entering the gym, as he says that last time this was asked, it was determined to not technically count. Which means, yeah, the culprit definitely asked to make sure that this was okay. Once the culprit was done, all they had to do was untie one side, descend, then retrieve the rope from Hoshi's lab, then toss the rope into the gym window, explaining why it was backstage when found. The culprit made a mistake, though, not being able to get rid of the inner tube because once the rope was untied, it fell into the pool, and the only way they'd be able to get it was by going inside, which was against the rules since it was nighttime. So who's the only person who could have set up such an incredibly detailed crime? Who's the only one with the dedication and force of will needed to carry it out? How about the skilled and diligent Kirumi Tojo? She seems pretty insistent that this isn't the case, but more than a few things implicate her. 
For example, all of the prep work involving the tank partition and the rope being tied to the gym window, it could have been done in the brief time she was alone in the gym. Not everything could be done, of course, but when it comes to just these preparations, it was certainly possible. The ropeway plan isn't just speculative either, as the markings on the windows prove something was definitely weighing down on them, like two whole human bodies in a tube. She says that she can't let us make the wrong choice, and it's for the sake of everyone, but Momota cries foul. It doesn't sound like she's talking about everyone here, he says, and Oma accuses her of having seen her own motive video. She deflects, appealing to everyone's emotions and insisting that she's looking out for them, even dragging back out Akamatsu's promise as a way to do so. But Saihara obviously can't let himself be swayed by such obvious manipulation. It's time to drag the damning final evidence that Tojo committed this murder out into the light. As she breaks down, calling him a self-righteous brat who can't save anyone, he hits her where it really hurts. The mysterious scrap of black cloth we found alongside the inner tube. You see, it's hard to imagine that someone could zip down a rope to move a body without building up some serious speed. If she went flying when she hit the window, it could have been bad, so Tojo controlled the speed by gripping the rope. Thankfully, she didn't suffer burns because she was wearing gloves, but the friction would surely shred the material in the process and leave it right back down in the pool where she couldn't get to it. Because everyone has multiple sets of uniforms in their closets, she could just switch them out for spares later, but when confronted with the possibility of having the scrap compared to her own gloves, she's out of excuses. The murderer is indeed Tojo. Talk about customer disservice. With the whole thing wrapped up, naturally it's time to learn about her sordid motives, right? Well, yes, but they're probably not quite what you'd expect. So Tojo did indeed see her own motive video. In fact, she got hers to begin with. The monocubs mixed them up by complete accident and she just happened to get her own. This reminded her of a mission she'd been given prior to being brought here, namely being asked by the country's own prime minister to basically act in his stead to prevent a widespread crisis that would destroy the lives of every citizen in it. Apparently, Tojo's reputation preceded her, and after doing many difficult tasks as well as plenty of direct consultation for other politicians, the guy thought that this maid was the appropriate pick for a shadow president to lead the country out of harm's way. When she remembered that she was the only person standing between the entire population and certain doom, she plotted to commit a murder so she could escape and save the country, figuring that the lives of the many entrusted to her far outweighed the few that were trapped in this school by comparison. Basically a real-life trolley problem with Tojo given charge of the lever. With her memories lost and only the vague notion of the super high school level hunt to go on, she was trapped by her strong sense of duty, and Monokuma doesn't make this much easier for her by claiming that nothing is outside the realm of his power, and that he's plenty capable of doing terrible things to the world at large. As for why Hoshi in particular was killed, Tojo apparently talked to him about her motive video. Admiring that she had something to live for, he mused silently to himself, turning his back to her even when she clearly had the intent to kill for her goals. Tojo interpreted this as a silent acceptance of his imminent death, and though we don't know whether or not that was actually what he intended to communicate, she knocked him out from behind and proceeded with the murder as we now know it to have happened afterward. As for Hoshi himself, he seems to have given up thinking he had a reason to live after his conversation with Harukawa, as he wanted to see his own video precisely because they contained people important to the viewer, spurred on by their intent to kill by proving that they had something to live for and return home to. When Hoshi saw his own video though, all he was met with was a depressing message from Monokuma that he couldn't find anything to motivate Hoshi because he had nothing to live for. Momota rejects the notion that life's value can be determined by numbers alone, claiming that your life isn't just something that belongs to you, but everyone that cares about you as well, and that you have to keep living as long as you can instead of throwing it away because of this. Of course, this applies to Tojo too, who decides to do everything she can to live, even if she has to act completely undignified in the process. Everyone cheers for her to run as fast as she can, but we all know how this is going to end. Monokuma has no intention of letting Tojo make any kind of exit, dignified or not. Not. She sprints out, her path blocked by effigies of protesters. Given a single exit, a hatch in the ceiling, she is made to climb a rope made of vine covered in thorns. As she ascends, she realizes she's surrounded on all sides by giant saw blades, and as she tries to climb in pain, she's assaulted by those blades from every angle. Finally, when she thinks she sees the light, she realizes that all that lies at the top is a false opening doodled in crayon. As she fully sinks into despair at the realization, the rope snaps, and as Monodam shoves Monosuke to the pit center, Tojo's tattered body comes crashing down, crushing him as she splatters lifelessly against the pavement. 
Saying some cryptic words about how not even Monokuma can stop the Monocubs from getting along, Monodam makes his exit, and everyone else laments the death of Tojo. Everyone briefly speculates that the video may have had similar properties to a flashback light, considering that Tojo's caused her to remember something she previously had no urgency about. And as they all exit from the trial grounds, they are given one last surprise. Oma claims that there's a worse liar than himself here, and explains that Hoshi wasn't simply asking Harukawa to see his own motive video, but was likely blackmailing her into being given it, since he had hers and could reveal what was on it, namely, as Oma says, her true identity. Moving so quickly that she appears to disappear, Harukawa grapples Oma by the throat, holding him in midair as he chokes out his words. <laughs> you know, this is an interesting turn of events, but would you really kill me in front of everyone? Hey, Harukawa, what the hell is going on? Yeah, you can probably snap my neck like a twig right now, but that's not your style. You would rather kill from the shadows, right? Miss Super High School Level Assassin. And with that, we're down to 12 students, and Chapter 2 ends. So, right then, this one is a little complicated, and I don't just mean the murder itself. For one thing, while I do appreciate a lot of what's going on in the background, like the continued character building between Saihara and Momota, and Harukawa becoming a bit more of a relevant figure, I do have a few bones to pick with the narrative so far, too. Surprisingly, Oma is not one of them. While I do maintain that he's a bit more irritating than he is compelling so far, he is at least an active agent when it comes to shaking up the plot, and so far he's doing a pretty decent job at it, even if his information gathering skills do occasionally border on seeming a bit too narratively convenient. Now, I've got more of a stick to shake at the entire direction of Hoshi's character here. Now, in previous games, there were plenty of opportunities for free time events to sort of desync with the mood of the regular plot, especially depending on when you did them. It goes without saying that slightly more innocuous conversations with Komaida, for example, would stick out like a sore thumb if you were to complete them around the time in the plot where a wedge is being driven further between him and Hinata, and he was on the verge of deciding to get everyone killed. For Hoshi, however, this dissonance comes as part of the natural story experience if you even want to do his free time events at all. Akamatsu had her own free time slots while you're playing as her, you see, so when you pick things up as Saihara, you're starting from scratch. Every character has five total free time events, and there are only five opportunities for free time in this chapter before the murder occurs. Meaning that to complete Hoshi's free times, you literally have to start and end all of them in a row in this very chapter. It then causes a bit of a tonal whiplash to see Hoshi go from determined to return to society and to what he loves, even if he's lost what previously motivated him because he has new friends, to a asserting that he has absolutely nothing worth living for and lying down to get drowned. Furthermore, I know talks of potential in Danganronpa are often seen with a bit of deserved scrutiny, seeing as dramatic irony is sort of the name of the game, but I think it's just narratively a bit of a waste to resolve Hoshi's arc this way. I mean, aside from Saihara, he's basically the feature character for the idea that wanting to die is unfortunately very common and depressingly easy to fall into, and takes a lot of love, support, and understanding to move past, and it may not ever fully leave you, even on the best of days. Would it not then be much more powerful for for a character who is determined to throw everything away to live until the end and in the process find some kind of motivating force to continue living? I don't know, it just rubs me the wrong way that this guy's narrative arc is literally just he's suicidal then he dies. And clearly they can tackle this subject with a bit better tact because they do exactly that with Saihara in this very chapter, even if perhaps a bit more subtly. And I mean, of course, we can't really discuss this chapter thoroughly without addressing the big old elephant in the room. Tojo's motive is interesting. I'm honestly not really sure even now if the game wants for me to take it entirely seriously. I'll save my comments about how it ties into later reveals in the game's story for when they become relevant, but for now, as it currently is presented at this point of the narrative, this skews in two wildly different directions simultaneously. On one hand, it seems like the game wants me to take this entirely seriously. Tojo is openly emotionally strained and filled with raw determination to fulfill her goals of saving the country and everyone genuinely laments that they might have made a mistake when she's convicted and her motive is explained. Everyone cries, Tojo included, and they're all desperate for her to escape until she is cruelly executed in ways that twistedly mirror this very devotion. And as an aside, despite one complaint I will mention in a bit, this execution is honestly really well done, perfectly suited to her and just as ironically cruel as some of Monokuma's previous best. Yet at the same time, the premise is so obviously and upfrontly absurd that it's 
hard for me to fully immerse myself in it. I mean, sure, if this were all real and I was given no choice but to accept that it was true and really happening, then I'm sure I would feel for Tojo, perhaps even cry myself. But this situation as presented within the game's story and as a piece of fiction is so outlandishly unrelatable that it comes across as far more farcical to me than it does sympathetic. Furthermore, it just begs a lot of questions. Like, yes, it's fun, it's over the top, and it's interesting, but frankly, it's just a bit too much. It comes completely out of nowhere and doesn't really have very many convincing ties to Tojo's character up until this point. I don't think the game really communicates effectively what makes her so specifically suited for the role she's been given beyond the most abstract gesturing at, oh well, she's diligent, she's competent, she does a lot of things for people, but cleaning a school making pancakes and setting up a magic show are far different from acting in the role of a country's leader. Hell, I don't even think her reputation of being able to carry out whatever order she's given is a very convincing argument for hiring her for that anyway. I mean. I wouldn't really want someone who only follows orders to be the Prime Minister, would you? Well, it's not like the plot doesn't function, at least. That's not especially high praise, I realize, but as much as I'm seemingly complaining about this, I don't want it to seem like it's the worst thing ever. It's perfectly functional, don't get me wrong, but functional and resonant are two different things, and while the story functions well enough to get the job done, it doesn't do so with enough consideration to really resonate with me, if that makes sense. It's inoffensive, but it doesn't really stir my emotions very much, and it certainly falls short of the prior chapter in my eyes because of this. Speaking of Tojo, I know this is kind of a like, what did you expect kind of thing to comment on, but was it really necessary to have shots leering at her underwear while she was getting cut up? I mean, I realize that realistically her clothes would be the first thing to go if she's being bared down on by saw blades, but it feels a bit tonally inappropriate to be getting cheesecake shots of her body while she's literally in the process of being tortured to death. Just me? I don't know. Let me go ahead and get my remaining complaints out of the way so I can be a bit more positive. The difficulty curve in this chapter is a little bit weird to me too, in my opinion. The first chapter wasn't painfully easy, but it was still easy enough to wrap your head around. It had nuance, it had several moving parts, but ultimately it balanced these things well to create a case with the perfect amount of starting difficulty in my eyes. This takes a sharp upturn with chapter two, where the moving parts become so numerous and complexly intertwined that it just seems to be jumping the gun a little, I guess? SDR2 also had a fairly complicated second case, with the case within the case serving to make it all feel a bit more tangled up, but at the end of the day, I feel like the actual murder was pretty clear cut once you got around to it. This on the flip side seems pretty simple when you explain it in short form, but the process of uncovering all of its layers takes so long and is so roundabout that it not only starts to overstay its welcome, but makes it feel all the more circuitous. Maybe brevity would have helped this case more than anything, but I'm just speculating at this point. At the very least, I can compliment this case for being inventive and really upping the stakes. I would say one of the only issues the early game has is feeling like it kinda takes its time to become Danganronpa, and now it feels like we're fully in the swing of things. Monokuma still gets pretty unfortunately limited use, and the fact that he was a late inclusion in the writer's room has become pretty evident by this point, but even despite that, the familiarly wacky vibes are here, and difficulty spike or not, the eccentric nature of the crimes on display truly make me feel right at home. I'm getting burned for daring to care about characters in this narrative, and that's a familiarly sweet pain. And I'm beginning to really enjoy Sayara's friendship with Momota, and become ever more curious about what Harukawa's assassin talent means, both for herself and her burgeoning relationship with the cast. It's these threads and promise of a familiarly good time that compel me, despite some of my misgivings, to carry on into NDRV3's third chapter. And boy oh boy, Danganronpa has never been good with threes, has it? We begin this chapter with meteors. Yeah, you heard me. A news reporter talks of meteors raining from the sky and how it's definitely totally real and people need to evacuate. Before we can think much more about that, though, we cut back to the action, with everyone surveying Harukawa's definitely fit for an assassin-esque lab. Within a few moments of discussion, however, Monokuma bumbles on by to tell us we've earned a prize for surpassing the trial. He tries to call on the cubs to dole it out, but Monodam is pretty vocal about calling the shots now that he's got a rebellious streak in him, even going so far as to call in the Exosols to basically tell Monokuma he's old news and that he can't tell them what to do. Monokuma is so shocked by his kids going rogue that he starts balding and goes catatonic, leaving Monodam in charge of the chapter's mascot proceedings. Of course, at this point, the cubs just hand over what they were told to anyway, which are new items to unlock more labs and previously inaccessible areas. This leads us back to the pixel door we found before, which when broken apart leads to a new staircase and a new floor. Floor 4 is a hellish corpse party-esque miasma of creaky floorboards and wall textures that look like they were ripped straight out of Silent Hill 3. 
The vibe is immaculately creepy and easily one of the best things about this chapter, honestly. There are some spare rooms, but aside from candles, they're basically barren, and the only notable thing about them is that there are holes in certain parts of the floor, and the fact that the floors have no nails in them, meaning that they're just big slabs laying across cross pieces. Needless to say, I wouldn't recommend jumping around in them. Aside from that and creepy statues, though, there's also some new labs to discover up here. The first worth noting is the artist lab belonging to Yonaga, which has a lot of supplies, including sculpting wax. It also has a front and back door with a cylinder and sliding lock, respectively. There's only one key that works for the front door, and Monodom eats it to prevent it from being used in a mystery game-esque fashion, which he reckons would lead to another murder, which basically ensures it can only be locked from inside anyway. We also get to see Shinguji's lab, complete with an ancient gold leaf katana that rubs off on everything. Gee, I wonder what that reminds me of. And a mysterious old handwritten booklet about a seance ritual from some cursed village, which I'm sure will not become relevant to the plot soon in any way. Back outside, we also find a statue which, when taking a scroll we get, reveals Chibashira's lab. A dojo with a lot of interesting things in it, which would be a perfect setting for a cool investigation, frankly, but guess what? It's never going to be, so get your disappointment out of the way now. We do get a scene of her flipping Saihara flat on his back in Yumino shortly afterward, though, so if you wanted to see that for some reason, there you go. As we try to leave and regain some sense of normalcy, we also see Iruma and Kibo in her lab as she tries to clean dust out of him, and they both treat it in the most sensual sounding way possible, and a lot of the dialogue is, you know what, never mind, what they do on their own time is their business, and I'm not interested in involving myself with it. Returning to the floor that looks like someone was already murdered on it because it feels safe by comparison, we see bald Monokuma leading us somewhere and give chase. Going to the end of the hall, Saihara deduces it's worth trying the last item here, the hammer, and does so by tossing it at the wall, revealing it was a false wall that was concealing a hidden passage. Behind said hidden passage is a massive futuristic looking computer room which looks like a kiosk for the first Xbox reveal. Monotaro claims the computer can be used to create an entirely different world, but the cubs collectively derail and disappear before much about that statement can be clarified. So Saihara decides to leave it alone. Besides, there's a flashback light found here anyway, which Oma immediately suggests we bring to the dining hall. After doing so, Momota drags Harukawa into the meeting, vowing to help her get along with everyone. Of course, everyone still acts fearful of her, and she's quick to point out that that's exactly why she hid her talent from them in the first place, because it was bound to cause problems. Claiming that they should all just agree to avoid her and go about their own business separately, she disappears, and everyone uses the flashback light. They see a conjoint funeral for all of them, not unlike the one we saw for Akamatsu at the start of Chapter 2, and of course, none of them can quite understand what it was for. They have some theories about either faking their deaths or it being symbolic, or worse yet, that they might already be dead and in some sort of afterlife, but needless to say, it's shaking them up regardless. With a bit of free time, I try the new casino minigames that are available, and they're just reskinned versions of Psyche Taxi and Mind Mine. I'll stick to the slots, thank you. And I do not have a problem, don't project on me! I try to hang out with Harukawa afterward, but she's not really in the mood, so I instead pivot my attention to, uh... Irima, I guess. Sure, why not? She spends a lot of her time showing Saihara weird inventions and half insulting, half coming on to him. It's a weird and uncomfortable experience for everyone involved, including you, and I'd recommend moving on from it as fast as possible. At night, as Saihara is leaving to do his training with Momota, he also sees that Yonaga is spreading her religious tendrils even further, which worries him, considering how that went with Yuino before. At training, Momota has dragged Harukawa along, and though she's still very cold about it, she seems to humor it once Momota asks what she's running from, and says that she should know and face whatever enemy troubles her, or else she'll remain pathetic and cowardly. This boldness seems to sway her, and she claims that it's only because he'll bother her even more later if she doesn't. Saihara and Momota both stay pretty bad at their exercise, while Harukawa flawlessly outclasses them in a matter of minutes, and is quickly able to dismiss herself from the meeting, though Momota still demands she continue to show up for subsequent meetings regardless. The next morning, he even goes out of his way to help drag her to the gym for a mandatory meeting as called by the Cubs. In the gym, which is now spotless since Hoshi's death, Monodam is here to talk about motive, and it's a really strange one. They're claiming everyone can revive one of the four students who have already died, and have them transfer back in using instructions found in the Necronomicon. Before anyone can even process this absolutely absurd sounding claim, it becomes pretty clear that Yonaga has successfully converted some people to her cult, namely Kibo, Chibashira, Yumino, Shiragane, and Gokuhara. Furthermore, Gokuhara discovered more strange graffiti where he found it before, and everyone wonders if it was a message left by the dead. The atmosphere is getting pretty strained by this supposed student council that Yonaga has formed, and for some reason their reveal backdrop looks like the Toho Films logo? 
Strange choice, not really sure what the significance is there. Anyway, they seem pretty determined to use that Necronomicon, even if everyone else has some serious doubts about whether or not it's a good idea, and I decide to de-stress by using my free time to check and see if Harukawa's ready to actually hang out now. To my surprise, she actually is. And in the process of getting to know her, we actually learn quite a bit. Namely, we learn that she was raised in an orphanage where she took care of the children that were younger than her, which naturally gravitated toward her, despite her lack of interest in being a caregiver. While she was being raised there, she was forcibly scouted by a cult organization who used its religious exterior to mask its illegal activities, namely that of scouting children to become assassins. They were originally going to scout another girl who Harukawa was close to, who she claims to have done everything with, including playing as a couple in games of house, which okay, bye as hell. But though she had more potential, Harukawa voluntarily took her place, knowing that the profession would be too much for her and would break her. She endured torment and abuse for the sake of her training, and eventually the girl died anyway, protecting another child in an accident. But she still carries around that girl's memory to inspire herself throughout all of the loneliness and torture she endured. It's genuinely haunting stuff, and the degree to which she's able to speak casually of it because of how ingrained into her it is, speaks volumes to what kind of life she's led and why she's ultimately so sympathetic despite her icy exterior. She's not great at appearing friendly, but she does clearly care in her own way. And despite her rather harsh sounding verbal tick of asking, do you wanna die whenever she's annoyed at someone, she's ultimately pretty amicable to those who don't put their foot in their mouth around her. Upon completing her events, she even claims that if Saihara wants so badly to help her get away from the assassin business, that he should use his skills as a detective to reduce complications in the world that lead to a profession like hers even being sought after or necessary to begin with, and she seems to show more than a little belief in the idea that he can do so. It's genuinely very sweet, and I think this goes a long way, along with things we'll talk more about as we go along, to show that she's a very layered and well-considered character who feels truly three-dimensional in all the ways that matter most. Speaking of Harukawa, at night she drags us to training where it's just her and Saihara because apparently Momota claimed not to be feeling well. When she asks him why he's doing this, seeing as a detective probably doesn't need to, Saihara responds that it helps him not to fixate so much on things and that spending time with Momota helps him not to worry about it. Harukawa claims to be jealous of how carefree he is because of how rigorously she was made to abandon anything that wasn't essential for her profession, and though Saihara tries to relate to her, she resists buddying up too much. Though Saihara still says he'll see her the next day. As she returns to her room, she's swarmed by the student council, who basically tell her that they're not going to allow anyone to walk around at nighttime anymore because the last murder occurred during the night. She tells Saihara about it the next morning, which really does prove that bonds can strengthen if you both have something to complain to each other about. And then he heads to the cafeteria, as is customary. Within, everyone is arguing with the council about their decisions, namely that they've decided to block the manhole outside because it tempts people who want to escape, claiming that they should all just get along and agree to stay here forever to prevent further violence. The cubs show up to try to stabilize things and even offer a new flashback light to unify everyone, but shit hits the fan when Yonaga flattens it under her heel, claiming that the student council has also decided not to allow further use of them, that they'll only remind the students of the outside world and tempt them even further. Monofani claims it will be really bad for their plans if the students don't use them, and the discussion spirals into disarray. They're even continuing with their plans for the resurrection ceremony, claiming that they want to bring back Amami because he seemed to know things the others didn't. As things pitter out, Momota is looking pretty bad, claiming to have chills, and heads back to his room for the time being. At night, he still doesn't feel much better, not having been able to sleep or eat very well, and telling Saihara and Harukawa to both go along without him or otherwise reschedule due to the council's shenanigans. Harukawa says she'll excuse his absence, but she doesn't want him changing the meetup time. Momota entrusts the training to Saihara until he feels better, and Saihara heads out to the courtyard. Outside, they're both seemingly confronted by Chibashira, but Harukawa quickly realizes she's not here on behalf of the council. No, in fact, Chibashira has never been with them, only having pretended to be on their side to look out for Yumino, and then she begs them both to help her foil the ceremony tonight because she fears what will happen if it succeeds. They both agree and head to Yonaga's lab, and Chibashira calls to her since she'll only answer the door for the council's members. As they're invited in, they all see ghoulish wax figures of the students who've perished so far clearly made by Yonaga herself. They ask her to reconsider the ritual, but she pretty much completely blows them off, realizing in the process that Chibashira has likely betrayed the council and ushers them out, telling Yumino as much as she comes by. Chibashira tries to get her to snap out of things and begs her to act on her own feelings, but it doesn't seem to have much effect, as a rift rises between the two. Heading back, the group laments their inability to do anything about the situation, but hope that nothing will go wrong overnight, trying to plan further action as they head to bed. 
When morning comes, Harukawa comes by with Momota to wake Saihara, with the latter even giving her the nickname Maki Roll, which she seems to be a bit incensed by. Momota claims all of his behavior has been because of his nerves regarding all this talk of ghosts and spirits, but though Saihara seems adequately convinced, I'm not sure if I am. They all head upstairs to see if they can take another shot at convincing Yonaga not to go through with things, but of course the door is locked and Yumino is stationed outside. When told to call for Yonaga though, she claims she already has and has gotten no response, which prompts everyone to understandably worry. Hearing the ruckus, Oma arrives, offering to use his lockpicking skills to open the door for everyone, and they reluctantly ask for his assistance in the matter. Lending just that, they're able to pop the door open, but predictably, they discover Yonaga dead inside, laying in a puddle of her own blood and surrounded by her own wax figures which are dangling upside down from the ceiling. This is a chapter 3, however, which has traditionally always been a double murder, so we can't put our guards down yet. Of course, everyone is as shocked as they usually are, but we already know the song and dance. Momota leaves the investigating to Saihara and Harukawa, which actually make for a pretty good team for this sort of thing, with Harukawa's assassination expertise actually proving pretty useful to interpreting the details of crime scenes, which I find to be quite unexpectedly novel. It just goes to show that detective stories can cleverly utilize plenty of different types of characters for these sorts of things in ways you wouldn't normally expect, and I find that a real strength to the writing. Anyway, the Monokuma file is quick to let us know that Yonaga died at 2 a.m. and was done in by a fatal stab wound to the back of the neck. She also had some blunt force trauma atop her head, but that doesn't seem to be what finished the deed, so it definitely raises questions about what exactly happened to her. At this point, Shinguji gets pretty insistent that they use the caged child seance described in his creepy little book to contact Yonaga's spirit and find out what happened that way. Clearly not many people trust that this will work, but Yumino, feeling depressed, wants to give it a shot. Since it needs to be in the dark, it can't be done in Shinguji's lab, so Yumino suggests one of the empty rooms, the middle one in particular, and Saihara gets to investigating with Harukawa while they do so. Behind Yonaga's corpse, they mysteriously find some bloody duct tape with her hair on it, and beside her is the Necronomicon meant for the ritual. The instructions within involve making an effigy, then burning the book itself to sprinkle its ashes on the effigy. Once this is done, the person performing the ritual is supposed to call the spirit name three times and wait to be tapped on the shoulder. This clearly doesn't seem to have anything to do with why the wax figures are hanging from the ceiling, nor why the one of Akamatsu has that katana from Shinguji's lab inside of it, but we might be able to get some hints about that through further examination of the lab itself. First of all, the katana's tip has blood on it, so it's safe to say that it was probably used to deliver Yonaga's fatal stab wound, but why would it be in the wax figure when this wouldn't really adequately hide it? Well, by the back door, they see gold leaf rubbed off on the sliding log. With further examination, Saihara notices that it can be moved rather easily. The room appears to have been locked from both sides during the murder, but that just means that inevitably some sort of trick is afoot. The blood beside Yonaga also seems a bit dry, and with this, we need to head to Shinguji's lab to look into details about the katana. Oma is there to grab the sheet they need for the seance, as they've already gotten the iron cage and dog statue. He gives a look at the pages about the ritual so we can see for ourselves how it's supposed to look and be performed, and Saihara agrees to go check out the seance just in case. Switching out for Kibo, because everyone wonders if a robot really counts, Saihara joins in and follows follows the instructions he's given to set up by Shinguji. Of course, Shinguji needs a volunteer to take on the spirit, and though Yumino speaks up first, it's actually Chibashira who steps up to insist she do it, telling Yumino that she should express her feelings honestly, train her heart, and push forward with everyone, living her life to the fullest, seeming to make up with her. Which, yep, death flag. Chibashira follows the instruction she's given, going to the center of Shinguji's magic salt circle as everyone carefully arranges the pieces while trying not to disturb said circle. Everyone stands in different corners, blows out the candles, and sing the song as described in the ritual. In the middle of the singing, there's an odd crashing sound, and when the song ends, Shinguji cannot get Yonaga to answer from beyond the grave. Everyone begins to fear the worst, and Shinguji instructs them to briefly light the candles back up, seemingly bothered that the ritual didn't succeed. Careful about doing things to the letter, he also gets everyone to carefully remove the supplies in reverse order, but when the blanket is lifted, Chibashira is still collapsed on the floor, surrounded by blood. Yumino rushes to throw the cage off of her, but it's too late. Chibashira is dead now, too. And let me just say before we get too much deeper into this that I'll at least give them one thing, discovering another body in the middle of an investigation is pretty darn cool. Chapter 3 has always been the double feature in every previous DR game, but this shakes things up just slightly in a way that definitely makes you anticipate fearfully what's to come. And given the context of the scene, it definitely raises a lot of questions about what could possibly be going on. 
Everyone is predictably dumbfounded, and Shinguji asks the cubs what the class should do if there are two murderers to be found in the class trial. Though Monodum tries to keep his grip on control, he actually has no idea, which means they have to call back Baldakuma and beg him to take back the reins. Monokuma then does so, revealing his mute bald counterpart to be a paid replacement he slotted in to get some vacation time, which is actually pretty hilarious, and answers that in this situation only the first murder will count, and investigating the second crime will basically be a waste of time because he's not even going to bother they're prosecuting it. We will come back to what I think of this writing decision later. The Monokuma file details a stab to the back of Chibashira's neck, which gets Momota's hackles up about a potential curse, and though he clings to Harukawa, she shoves him a bit harshly, which seems to injure him a bit more than you'd think it should, and he leaves. Kibo lights up the room with his flashlight eyes, which Irima installed for him, and with this new visibility, everyone is able to investigate more effectively. They find some blood on the cage, which seems to suggest that she might have been stabbed right when the cage was lifted, and also realize the floorboard underneath her is loose. The magic circle is in complete disarray, of course, so there's no way to see how it looked beforehand. But Shinguji claims he's got it memorized, so it was doubtlessly perfect. There's also a blood stain on the cloth, but no holes through it that seem to have been stabbed through. In the back of the room, there's a small hole that can be dropped through, and in doing so, we find more blood, a bloody sickle, some dry blood stains a little farther away and under a floorboard, a hole that leads into the next room over, and we even realize that one of the crossbeams has been deliberately sawed short, this being very close by the loose floorboard we found. Exiting the room, it seems almost like we've discovered a third body in Oma, but he's quick to spring up and say that we've been epically pranked, bro! The blood is real, though, because as he's quick to point out, he tried to look into the neighboring room, walked in, and fell right through the floor because the crosspiece was gone. As he staggers weakly away due to his blood loss, Monokuma calls the gang together for trial time. Buffer Monokuma shuffles us behind the waterfall, the elevator drops, and are we ready to get this mess out of the way? Yeah, well, part of me is and part of me isn't, but honestly we might as well preserve as much of our precious sanity as we can. You know how I've said before when I really hated a trial that I was going to work a little faster in summarizing them? Well, I'm going to do that again here. Last time I did this was with 2-3, however, I did get some complaints that it was a bit more difficult to follow, so I'm going to try to balance this a bit more, but I really don't have it in me to follow this one beat for beat, because it's going to be hard enough for me to talk earnestly about it in the first place, so uh, I hope this works for you guys. If you are at all confused about the case's proceedings, I invite you to please take comfort in the fact that even if I conveyed it all painfully slowly, it would only make a marginal amount amount more sense. Shiragane starts the conversation strong by doing her best Hagakure impression and insisting it was ghosts. It wasn't. Moving on. A lot of chattering is done about who could or couldn't enter Yonaga's lab because of who was and wasn't a student council member. Oma briefly trolls everyone by claiming to be the culprit even though he clearly isn't, but he can't describe the locked room trick. Turns out the trick was the katana was used to hit the sliding lock after the culprit left. But how was that done? Well, simple. They stuck the katana in one of the upside-down mannequins, spun it around, and let the rope unwind after they left so the effigy nearest the door would spin around and the katana's hilt would smack the sliding lock. You know, perfectly reasonable thing to do, easily replicable, don't worry about it. Oma admits he's not the culprit and was trying to lure out the real one, so good job throwing him off, jerks. He also briefly slams Yumino for not really caring about Shibashiro while she was alive and acting like she cares now, and Momota tells her to face that death head on so she can make sense of her conflicting feelings. So everyone officially decides to start talking about Shibashiro's death, even if Monokuma claimed it was pointless to do so, because they think it may help solve Yonaga's death too. Source, dude, just trust me. The various bloodstains the weird noise, the displaced floorboard, and all the other weird anomalies at the scene are all taken into consideration to pull together the weirdest possible theory in history, that the sickle was hidden under the sheet but over the cage, and the culprit stomped on the floorboard after the seance started to deliberately cause it to seesaw because of the sawed cross piece below it, this would then cause the board to lift Chibashira into the air, where her neck would instantly come into contact with the sickle and kill her. Shinguji is quick to accuse Yumino because she seemed to flippantly pick the room where these rigged floorboards were, but with quick thinking we prove that all of the rooms were rigged regardless, as proven by Oma's little slip and slide through the floor of the neighboring one. Seeing as this is an obvious ploy to blame whoever suggested a room, it becomes pretty clear who did this, but we still have to answer some questions, like perhaps, how a culprit could have kept everyone away from falling through the floor, or done this in the pitch black. Well, Shinguji drew the magic circle, and he insisted nobody disturb it and follow his instructions to the letter. He could ensure that Chibashira's placement was right at the center of the necessary floorboard, too. As for how he could operate in the dark, though, Sahara says he could have easily done so by stooping to the floor and feeling along the trails of salt as a guide. 
Because, as Kibo points out with his handy-dandy picture he took of the seance circle before he was shooed out of the room, there were additional lines running to the corners that were not part of the actual circle as drawn in the ritual booklet. I have some words to say about this, and like many other things, I will be saving them for now. Saihara claims that Shinguji threw the sickle under the floor when he was retrieving the sheet, and he immediately admits he did it, surprisingly enough. But he's pretty confident that he's in the clear because, like Monokuma said, the culprit of the second murder doesn't count, and he's still insistent that he didn't kill Yonaga. However, the dried blood under the floor and in different spots have Saihara wondering if he's telling the whole truth about that. You see, Yonaga was actually killed in this room too, because she came to get a candle for the ritual while Shinguji was preparing the room to use for the seance plan later on. Obviously, since she walked in, he wouldn't be able to use this method later without her pointing the finger at him immediately, so he decided to kill her on the spot by smacking her over the head with a loose floorboard. As for the art lab, the extra blood is from the killing blow when she was stabbed in the neck, as the first blow only knocked her out. Shinguji starts to verifiably lose it and seemingly interrupts himself with a Woman's voice, oh goody, oh boy. Everyone freaks out about this cartoonishly creepy behavior and we get some more Danganronpa patented thinly veiled transphobia for the road, and if you think I'm reaching, Momoto literally calls him a transphobic slur in the original Japanese script, so don't even at me. Saihara pins him down with the duct tape as decisive evidence, claiming that he must have used it initially to stop Yonaga's head from bleeding while he moved her, but neglected to get rid of it later when it fell behind her body. Shinguji breaks down while the other voice he's using tells him to calm down and pay his classmates no heed, but when the dried blood on the floorboard is brought up to tie this whole thing together, he breaks. At this point, he can't deny the truth any longer and confesses to his motive behind the crimes. He admits that he had a unique relationship with his now deceased sister, who he seems to have manifested some kind of traumatic introject of, and claims to have been, for a long time now, killing girls he thought were worthy of being sent to the afterlife to be friends with her and keep her company. In the most ham-fisted way imaginable, the theme of the chapter is made to clearly be about how we respond to and confront death, and this would be interesting if the everything hadn't just happened around it. Shinguji is tied up by the cubs, spun around to the point of sickness, and dropped through a floor hatch into a boiling pot where he is burned alive. Seemingly at random, Monodam joins him in the flames and they go out together. Shinguji briefly rises as a spirit from the pot to try to join his sister, but both she and Monokuma toss cleansing salt on him to melt him into nothingness, and they look on at the moon together. All the students are just as done with this shit as I am, Alma hammers in the game's themes a bit more by saying that lies aren't always a bad thing, and Yumino decides to stop repressing her emotions by crying a lot, which makes everyone else cry too. Gokuhara carries her back when she tuckers herself out and everyone walks on. Momota coughs hard into his hand, revealing by way of a super bloody palm that he's actually been acting weird because he has a vaguely defined disease of some sort that is slowly killing him, which is revealed in a way I can only liken to how 99% of Hollywood films convey that someone has tuberculosis. He claims that he's not going to die here, the survivor count drops to 9, and chapter 3 finally ends. Okay, where to even start? Perhaps since I know I'm going to be furious for quite a bit of this, I should start with the positives, because hey, maybe that will help lighten the mood for just a little bit, right? Let's hope so. I think this chapter has quite a few similarities to chapter 3 of SDR2, and that the daily life portion, while not perfect, is easily the best part of the chapter, and contains quite a bit worth actually caring about. The atmosphere of the new floor, like I said, is honestly pretty damn good, and the tension that rises between everyone as a result of the creation of the student council is actually pretty decent at creating an unsettling tone. In particular, the scene where Yonaga stomps on the flashback light is a real shocker, and it genuinely goes a long way to raise your hackles about how much her influence has grown in a short amount of time and what kind of damage she could do in the long term if she's continuously allowed to do as she pleases. By contrast, this also lends a sense of genuine shock to it when she's the one who ends up dead later. This is sort of telegraphed a bit too soon by Yumino literally saying she can't get her to answer the door, but it's still not who you'd probably have been expecting to bite it next, so it does wonders to establish a fittingly mysterious tone to begin with. The continued development of the training trio, as they would come to be known, is extremely charming, and I honestly really appreciate how they all bounce off one another. I couldn't remember much to say about Saihara and Harukawa together in particular before this, but having redone her free times and seen how she worked with Saihara during this particular investigation segment, I actually think the two have a lot of subtle, friendly chemistry to appreciate. It's not as overstated as some other friendships in the game, so I think it's easy to miss, but I enjoy seeing them talk with each other, and this really helps considering that Saihara and Momota already had 
had a pretty good thing going, and this helps integrate the three together all the more seamlessly. I can take or leave the burgeoning romance between Harukawa and Momota themselves, it's serviceable and certainly sweet if a bit plain, but I just enjoy seeing any of these three together, whether it's all of them at once or just a couple at a time. While I also have plenty negative to say about the direction taken with the character, Kenichi Suzumura absolutely kills it, no pun intended, with his performance as Shinguji in the latter half of this trial. When he starts really explosively yelling and going all out, you feel the layers peeling back on an otherwise very restrained but subtly eerie performance. And I think this does a lot for his reveal that while I don't think it saves the writing, it certainly makes it a bit more tolerable simply because of the talent on display, so that's saying quite a bit. Like I said before, I don't really play the Danganronpa games dubbed, so I can't really comment on the English portrayals much here, but I mean no offense by excluding them. They're all very talented people, some of whom I've spoken to or even worked with. My relationship with the series just predates the localizations, as I've said, so I tend to stick with what I hear first. Anyway, that is unfortunately about all the good I have to say here, because now I've got to start talking about the myriad of issues that mire this chapter for me. Hang on tight, I'll try to handle this as best as I can. Let's start small, the student council. Now, I said before that I kinda liked their presence here, and you're gonna hear me saying this a lot, but I do. In theory, I find the idea of the student council and their role in this chapter a lot more tantalizing than what's more or less actually given to us. My problem here is that they kind of just pop in and out of existence a little too quickly to leave the proper amount of impact. Instead of seeing Yonaga slowly but steadily convince people to join her, we just kind of suddenly see Yumino converted in Chapter 2, then suddenly see way more people converted in Chapter 3. Sure, Chibashira may be lying, but everyone else barring Gokuhara is talked into it off screen in what seems like a single night, at which point they all become extremely loyal and militant in following Yonaga's order. Again, I think this definitely could work, but it needed to be built up more, and this same problem carries forward into the group's dissolution, too. Because as soon as the trial's over, everyone basically just concludes that Yonaga's god nonsense was nothing more than hogwash and just gives up on it. I'm not saying that Danganronpa needs to thoroughly cover cult deprogramming or anything, because it hardly has the time, but a gesture at even the idea that the process would take a hot minute would at least make this seem a bit less apropos of nothing, if you get what I'm saying. Speaking of apropos of nothing, why the hell does Shinguji kill Chibashira? And no, they don't just get to say because he's crazy or because he wanted to send more girls to his sister. The first claim is just the lazy writer's excuse for when they have no better explanation, and the latter still doesn't make sense if you follow his own logic. How is that? Well, allow me to explain. So when Shinguji kills Yonaga, it's actually a pretty clean crime. The duct tape is what screws him ultimately, but we'll get to that in a few. Other than that, he's pretty much got everything worked out. The locked room trick creates some decent confusion about the process, the scene distracts a lot from the important details, and most importantly, the most damning evidence is hidden under the floorboards of an entirely different room from where the body is found. If he had just left well enough alone, he would have been home free, but he's stupid enough to try his luck for a second kill, and even allows it to take place in the exact same room. If this second murder hadn't occurred, there is no earthly reason anyone would have discovered the extra evidence that got him caught. He literally plays himself in the most inconceivably stupid way imaginable. His sister voice admonishes him for being too greedy and getting himself caught because he wanted to send more friends to her, but this doesn't make any sense either. Think about it. If he had left it all alone after the first kill and nobody was able to solve it in the trial, they would all have been executed and he would get even more girls killed anyway. It'd be a win-win as far as his goals are concerned, so there's really no decent reason for him to screw himself like this. Oh, except for the writers need it to be a double murder because this is Danganronpa and it's chapter 3. That is the only reason I can think of that he does this, and it is purely because of adherence to the formula rather than a reason that actually makes sense for the character. But wait, that's not the only thing about his plan that bothers me, there's also the fact that the logic just kind of sucks. The sliding lock katana thing was already goofy enough, but whatever, sure, I can roll with it, it's fine. The entire seance murder though, this stuff is just kind of ridiculous, I'm sorry. I know your mileage may vary on some of these things, so I'm not gonna make a huge deal about them. Detective fiction typically requires at least some suspension of disbelief after all, but mine can only be strained so much before it starts to kind of take away from the actual mystery itself. So for starters, the sickle. It's under the sheet, but on top of the cage, and Shinguji can hide it because he's the one who puts the sheet on. However, when he's putting it on, he's clearly fanning it out. Now, this leads to one of two problems for me. Either one, you have to hold the sickle through the sheet and create a super obvious lump in the sheet that literally everyone can see, which makes it clear that you've hidden something under it. Or two, you just drop it and it clangs against the iron cage, which is even more obvious. I don't see how you could put the sickle where it's supposed to be without doing one of these two things. 
Now, let's talk about the magic circle. As I said before, the salt is used as the explanation for how Shinguji is able to move in the dark to the floorboard he needs to jump on to do the seesaw. Keep in mind that while he is doing this, he is supposed to be singing loudly with everyone else for the seance. So do you mean to tell me that nobody can tell from his voice that he's ducking to the floor, moving from the corner across the room, and most of all, that he's jumping on the floor? I can maybe buy that since everyone's voices are together that they might be distracted enough not to notice his voice shifting directions, but I cannot fathom that he would be able to jump, slam his feet down on the floor like he is slaying a Goomba, and nobody was able to gather from his voice that he was doing this. Try singing loudly while doing a huge midair jump stomp. I think you'll find it pretty difficult to mask that extremely obvious action while doing so. I also just don't know what to think about the fact that he was able to do this without falling through the floor Wily e. Coyote style. You mean it just lifted back up? I know the drop to below the floor isn't that steep, but it's still deep enough that I don't think you'd just be able to step back out with ease. I mean, hell, if Oma's anything to go by, the drop literally made his head bleed. I know Shinguji is quite tall and Oma is gremlin-sized, but that says a lot about the distance of the drop, and I find it difficult to imagine that you could just stomp with both feet on the floorboard, especially with a sawed cross piece below it, and no nails in said floorboards, and not plummet below the floor in the process. To top it all off, the duct tape which does him in also doesn't really make sense to me. Supposedly, he puts it on Yonaga's head to prevent her head wound from bleeding while he transports her and he fails to notice it fall off behind her. The climax inference even shows it pathetically waving off and behind her back. But this is duct tape? Duct tape strong enough to prevent her head from bleeding for a hot minute there. There is absolutely no reason that the tape should be weak enough to casually fall off only a few minutes later, especially if it was strong enough to rip off some of her hair in the process. There's just no making sense of this no matter how I slice it. The logic of this case is really flimsy, and while I might could overlook a couple of these issues in a vacuum, they really stack up when they're all together like this. And of course, that's not to even mention the absolutely horrendous writing decisions made with Shinguji's character toward the back half of this trial. First of all, let me poke this hornet's nest yet again and come back to what I said about Genocider Show back in Danganronpa 1. Now, I already said before that the serial killer with the dissociative disorder trope was super overdone and harmful at the best of times, but I could at least give Sho some amount of credit in that she takes that trope and subverts your expectations. She shows up in the middle of the murder plot, but she doesn't actually turn out to be the killer, and furthermore, she doesn't even end up killing anyone in the entire game. That was unexpected, and while I take issue with the character stereotype she was conceived from, I found the way she was utilized kind of funny in how it deliberately avoided some of that trope's typical trappings. Here, however, it is brought back in full force, and not only is it played completely straight, they had to add in the sibling relations angle for no other reason than cheap shock factor and for everyone else to stand around looking shocked for the gag of it all. I've talked time and again about how Danganronpa has a serious problem with bringing up this particular subject for the sake of ill-conceived and painfully unfunny humor, but they still haven't realized they should knock it off yet. And by this point, it's getting tiresome, to put it mildly. I can't even begin to express how frustrating this is, especially when you consider the fact that when you really think about it, from all the evidence shown, Shinguji is probably the one being victimized by his sister. Now, we don't know this for certain, and I'm not saying that he becomes an innocent character even if it's true. He's still a self-admitted serial killer, and that alone is enough to hate his guts. But I find it a little contemptible that the game is clearly treating this subject extremely flippantly when you consider that she seems older than him, his free time events suggest that she was extremely hands-on about directing his path in life, she made his own clothes for him, and all of the things his voice of her says to him are concerning to put it mildly. Taking all of this into account, it's not difficult to imagine that she was in a position of authority here, which means that, yeah, their horrible interactions probably were not his idea to initiate, and the person who should have taught him better than that took advantage of him. Like I said, I could be wrong about this. It just really gets under my skin considering what's in the text. Because it seems pretty obviously like Danganronpa is not only making light of extremely serious subject matter yet again, but is even going the extra mile to paint victims of acts like these as grisly little weirdos who would surprise no one by turning into serial killers over it. And I really resent that notion. 
And to anyone who would insist that I give them more benefit of the doubt, I would point you to the aforementioned slurs in the trial, a full seven years after they had time to learn from the Chihiro fiasco, and the fact that they still can't write a good double murder case after this long of trying, as adequate proof that I really have no obligation to believe that they're good at learning any kind of lesson. Again, I must reiterate my practical catchphrase by this point, but the writers could do whatever they wanted to explain Shinguji's motives. Hell, the fact that the writers could do whatever they want is probably as relevant as it ever has been in this game in particular, and yet that sure is what they chose. And even when you peel away the layers upon layers of uncomfortable bullshit, you still get what basically amounts to, eh, he did it because he was crazy, I guess, which as a motive is practically a complete non sequitur. It means basically nothing other than, well, uh, I, we sure needed a murder to happen, better make him insane. And speaking of non sequitur, we can finally start to wrap this chapter discussion up because we're getting to the last couple of things I want to talk about. First of all, the Necronomicon. Pray tell, why is it here? Functionally speaking, its only direct utility to the plot is that it gets Yonaga to go out looking for a candle at night, and it gives her a reason to have wax statues. Other than that, it uh, briefly creates some conflict in the group, but the student council was pretty much doing that already, so the ritual just adds another layer to it, and I can't really think of any other practical use for it. It doesn't even end up getting used at all, and even Monokuma is like, damn, well I guess nobody cares about this thing, and yeets it into narrative irrelevance at the end of the chapter when nobody bothered to use it for its intended purpose. So what was even the point of introducing it as a plot point at all? And that leads me to my final question. What is the deal with the rule about the two murders? Monokuma literally only mentions it after both murders have occurred, so it literally can't factor into the killings themselves or how they were carried out in any way. The only seeming use for this rule is so that there can be a surprising moment in the trial where Shinguji casually admits to Chibashira's murder, but points out that it doesn't matter because it was committed second and only the first murder counts. But when you think about it, this doesn't really make any sense. There's no reason for him to do this other than gloating. He seems to imply that because he admits to the second one that there's no way he could have done the first, but that doesn't even track for a second, and everyone basically sees straight through it the instant he even tries to claim it. In fact, having him confirm that he did Shibashira's murder and even admitting that all of Saihara's deductions about the process were correct makes it even easier to expose him for Yonaga's murder in the long run. If he was throwing it out there to try to save his skin, he literally did the opposite of what would help him. This rule has basically no purpose, it might as well not even be here. And not to get fanfiction-y, but you know what would have been way better? What if the rule was part of the motive? A sort of buy one, get one free offer by Monokuma. Instead of the second murder not mattering, have it be so that if one murder occurs, that person can get off scot-free, no strings attached, if a second murder is committed by a different person. I hate Shinguji's motive, but if the writers really wanted to stay married to it, have him kill Yonaga, perform the seance, and then trick Yumino into killing Chibashira. Can you imagine how gut-wrenching it would be to not only realize that you have this guy red-handed, but that you can't do a thing about it. And then, not only does someone far more likable pay the price for what he engineered, but then you have to spend another entire chapter knowing this dude who has verifiably killed one of your classmates is just hanging around. That would be absolutely horrifying. And not to get ahead of myself, but I think it would do a lot for the partnership between two certain characters in Chapter 4, and it could even serve as a good excuse for the introduction of a certain program, seeing as it's been used for rehabilitation purposes in the past, and Shinguji would seem like the perfect type of person to be put into something like that. I'm just thinking out loud here. I'm sure you could probably come up with other better ideas too, but this is just one of many examples I think you could envision, assuming this rule was given even a smidge of plot significance in a way that didn't make it seem utterly pointless to bring up. Oh god, how many words have I been going on for now? Probably plenty enough by this point. Chapter 3 is a mess, plain and simple. It is easily the worst in the game for me, and even its most interesting ideas cannot come close to saving it. It needed far more of what could have made it work, and far less of everything else. It is so petrified of breaking free of the typical Chapter 3 formula that it ironically fails to innovate in the ways that might have finally given us a good third chapter for one of these games. It fails spectacularly at being new and fresh, and simultaneously fails to even be as good as the cases it's trying to imitate the structure of. On every level, it is a train wreck, perhaps only topped in levels of awfulness by Chapter 3 of Ultra Despair Girls, and that is a frighteningly low bar that it somehow only barely clears. And Chapter 4 is lucky that it is so much better by comparison.
Our story begins with a strange message said to be from a few days prior. A video of one Rontaro Amami speaking directly into the camera, evidently to himself as he hints. Unfortunately, though he seems to be explaining some things, we only get glimpses at it, with the video skipping around at certain tantalizing points. What we do gather is that the killing game will continue until only two survivors remain, that this isn't his first something, that anyone who finds out who he is will come after him, and the most ominous statement of all, you wanted this killing game, so you have to win no matter what. But of course, no time to unpack all of that, we've got to get to the dining hall. It's not exactly a pleasant morning, considering all the remaining characters seem to hate Chapter 3 as much as I did, but Yumino at least seems to have taken her experiences to heart and is trying to become more energetic and hold her head high. She's going through an adjustment phase, so she's not perfect at it, but it seems like she was at least inspired enough to take some action. Meanwhile, Gokuhara comes in to warn everyone that the mysterious horse text has been added to yet again. Still can't read it though. Monokuma brings along some more items with the cubs, two for opening more locations and one card key they claim is a motive. Of course that means Oma has to be a brat and steal it and Momota chases after him. Monokuma just waves it off and clarifies that another flashback light is also hanging out somewhere to be found. Monotaro seemingly has amnesia and everyone gets to work looking around for what's new. That brings us to place the Levistone on a platform near Iruma's lab, which opens up what seems to be Kibo's right next to it. It's a high-tech sci-fi-ish place, but he evidently doesn't actually like it very much, saying he'd prefer something a lot more down-to-earth with the Japanese theme. Back on the Silent Hill floor, we can use the brush on the scroll to roll it up and reveal another staircase leading to floor 5. It seems to be chapel-like and has quite the colorful Monokuma statues. We see Shiragane's lab here, where she makes Saihara a stiff drink for his troubles and my screen glitches out. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I'm starting to see what people mean when they say the PC version of this game isn't very well optimized. Well, I've already been seeing that, considering the execution audio very often falls behind the actual video, but I guess you can really only get this game to run decently on a PS4, huh? Anyway, there's also Saihara's lab, too. It looks like your typical snooty Sherlock-esque office, with supplies, tons of case files, a fireplace, and a shelf full of dangerous chemicals. I half expect Saihara to enter his mind palace here and discover the truth of the boomerang, but thankfully that does not come to pass. Momota shows up, though, and even though he wasn't able to find and catch Oma, he did find the flashback light, which everyone gathers in the dining hall to see. Oma even comes back for it, but claims not to have found a place to use the card key, which... Sus. Momota flips the light on when his bravery is challenged, and everyone sees both the meteors and groups littering the streets who are basically doomers claiming that humanity brought it on themselves and just deserve to be permanently nuked from existence. Momota mentions a plan that evidently existed to save humanity from the meteorites thought up by all countries, which Shiragane calls the Gopher Project, but Oma says he seems to remember it failing and Harukawa concurs. Iruma starts to go stir-crazy, and in the end, everyone can't seem to connect all of the memories they've retrieved into one one coherent narrative, though Oma claims he thinks they only need a bit more to put the pieces together. With a bit of free time on our hands, I decided to finish off Irima's since I already started them, and she basically confesses her love to Saihara, claiming that she should only have the courage to return the statement. When he clarifies that he, uh, never said that, she immediately clams up and stumbles out of the room while screaming. Her last event involves her basically just giving Saihara her garments by using a device to instantly zap them into his hands and makes him promise to go on a date with her when they get out. This is the weirdest day of Saihara's life. Speaking of weird, the nighttime and morning announcements go through some strange soap opera drama when Monotaro and Monofani become involved. Okay, what did I just say about this kind of sh- Oh, and then he starts beating her, because that's also totally a funny thing to make jokes about. The absolute comedic gauntlet of Danganronpa, everybody. Jokes about sibling romance and domestic abuse. This is really the stuff they were proud enough to leave in the final draft, god help me. At least we have another nice nighttime training scene, though, although uh, this is just lending more credence to my observation about the CGs being more rushed here than previously. What exactly is up with Harukawa's arm here? I- I mean, I know it's like perspective, but there's not enough of a noticeable cutoff for her elbow here. It just kind of seems to blend into the rest of her shirt, which makes it look like she's got one regular sized arm and one extremely short arm. Well, anyway, speaking of Harukawa, she asks Saihara quite suddenly while Momota is going to the bathroom if he liked Akamatsu, as in the like-liked sort of way, and then wonders aloud if that would be too weird considering they've only been here for such a short amount of time and Akamatsu's time with Saihara was even shorter. She seems to be asking for her own reasons and ultimately decides it's not too important, but Saihara is under 
understandably a bit thrown off by this, thinking it's cruel to so casually bring something so personal like this up, and then decide she doesn't really care about the answer. Momota shows up right on time to interrupt the tension and get silly again though, so it works out. In the morning, Gokuhara is demanding they finally fight Monokuma, but everyone else has some obvious concerns. Well, except for Oma, he doesn't want to fight Monokuma either, but he seems determined to actually participate in the game and win, which earns him a punch in the face from Momota, who is getting increasingly fed up with him at this point. Iruma claims she has something in mind to save everyone, and as we wonder about what she means, we get a short cute scene where Yumino trains herself together with Saihara and Gokuhara in Jibashira's lab. When training rolls around in the evening, Momota decides to forego the exercise and just have everyone chat together. While they do so, Harukawa confides more about herself and her upbringing to the both of them, things we already discussed when talking about her free times, but which are laid out a bit more explicitly here in some respects. It definitely reiterates how closed off Harukawa has been made to be through her experiences, and why perhaps this unconventional trio dynamic which has forcibly dragged her out of her shell has meant a lot to her. Momota says that both she and Saihara are carrying too many burdens to handle alone, and should always be more willing to carry those burdens with the help of other people which inspires them both to continue doing their best. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Oma calls out Monokuma to talk in private. Monokuma asks if he's going to use that motive, and he says he's come up with an idea for how to make things more interesting while doing so. A certain someone is planning something interesting, he says, and proposes the motive to be used there. Monokuma says he really is an evil bastard, and seemingly agrees, to which Oma responds with an uncharacteristically ghoulish expression that he will drag the world into the pits of terror. This is definitely supposed to be a tone shift, but I uh, think this reveal sprite could have gone through a bit more work, perhaps. Uh, kind of didn't hit me like I think they wanted it to because the art was so distracting. Well, your mileage may vary. In the morning, Oma and Irima don't show up to the cafeteria, but at night we find out at least why the latter didn't. She says she's got something ready in the computer lab and everyone is heading over, and once we get there we learn exactly what she's been cooking up. Looks like Bonatora wasn't blowing smoke when he said this computer could make another world because that's exactly what Irima claims to have done, found a world within the computer where no killing game exists. Everyone is, of course, a bit reluctant to follow her lead, especially when Monokuma claims to be the one who made it in the first place, but she did beg and she claims to have scoured the program to delete everything dangerous from it that Monokuma initially planted. Monokuma does claim to have hidden a secret about the in- the inside world? Did I really script that? Monokuma does claim to have hidden a secret about the outside world inside the game world too though, which does mean that everyone is at least a little more invested in trying it out, if only to see if they can find that valuable information. With that in mind, everyone sits around, prepared to put on their brand new Oculus Quests 2, when Irima tells them to make sure to insert the colored cords in the proper two ports on the back, for consciousness and memory, respectively, to make sure everything goes right. She doesn't know exactly what will happen if you do it wrong, but she anticipates that it's nothing good. Yumino tries to remember which cord is which by talking about which hand she holds her chopsticks in, and everyone plugs themselves into the Killing Free Metaverse. When they do, a boot-up screen notifies them that they're being welcomed to, what a shocker, the Neo World Program. This program is not much like the one from SDR2 though, it's practically a name only, as the art style should clearly signify. Everyone is chibi, the perspective is top-down, and they're all pretty disenchanted about it. As everyone gets acclimated, Irima explains some of the rules, like the fact that objects cannot be broken here, that all avatars have equal strength, and that to log out you need only go to the phone in this starting room and say your own name into it. Outside the room, on the wall, is a map of the virtual world, which we can now see is a mansion in the middle of a snowy wilderness, and oh boy, I'm sure that doesn't call to mind any harrowing events. And outside that, apparently nothing exists, the world just stops. Oma goes off to search on his own, and Gokuhara offers to go along to keep an eye on him. Meanwhile, Irima gives a tour around the place, first at the mansion's roof, which has a pair of binoculars and a supply closet, which only holds a wooden lattice and a carpet. Down by the river, Irima shows us the bridge doesn't go far enough to cross, and tells Saihara to retrieve the broken signpost further downstream to make a makeshift bridge, since it can't be broken when walked on. It fits perfectly, so everyone can move to the chapel across the way, and Oma returns with Gokuhara claiming to have found nothing. When everyone passes the way, <laughs> they all temporarily black out, and Irima clarifies that this is the loading zone where the game has to load the other half of the map, meaning that for a brief moment, you won't be able to see or hear anything while crossing, and that sound from one side can't pass through to the other. That doesn't sound threatening at all. In the chapel, there's a lot of crap to sort through, so the team divides into groups to search around. Iruma and Oma whisper about something to each other, and then she decides how to split everyone up herself before Momota can get a word in edgewise. She sends him to the mansion roof, Oma to the salon, and just says three more people should search the mansion. Gokuhara and Shiragane volunteer, and Momota asks Saihara to be the third, to which he agrees. Everyone else is told to stick behind here at the chapel with Iruma, 
As the mansion group crosses the bridge, Irima runs out and knocks the signpost from the bridge into the river, claiming that her hand slipped but being the most obvious liar in existence. As the mansion team searches all around for the secret of the outside world, it seems nothing turns up, and eventually Shiragane comes to tell Saihara that while she didn't find anything, she thinks she saw Irima through the dining hall window about 10 minutes prior. Both are confused, since she should be on the chapel side, but just as they begin to discuss this, they hear a crash outside, and even more mysteriously, they hear Kibo's voice. Running outside to check on things, they spot Gokuhara, who claims not to have seen anything but heard the noise. They head to the chapel, and everyone on the other side suggests Saihara look for a replacement bridge. Oma shows up to point out that somehow the bridge has gotten stuck on a rock over by the mansion side, and they put it back in its rightful place. When everyone crosses, Harukawa says they all need to log out to check on Iruma, and Momota seems to be completely missing at this point. Everyone logs out one by one, leaving just Saihara and Oma behind. Before Saihara can log out, Oma stops him to say that he should be hanging out with Momota and be friends with him instead, to help save everyone. Saihara pauses in angry silence before logging out, not even dignifying the suggestion with the response. Oma by himself claims he won't give up so easily. As Saihara exits the Neo World program, he pulls off his helmet and sees something horrifying awaiting him, the suffocated corpse of Miyu Iruma. Between this and being given her underwear, I'd say this just isn't Saihara's best week. Ready for one of the shortest investigation segments in Danganronpa history? Well, it seems like Momota is, as he seemingly rushed in to see what the commotion was after taking a nap? He claims to have suddenly gotten logged out without realizing what was going on and just returned to his room afterward because it was late and he didn't know if he should log back in or not. After the body discovery announcement woke him, he came running. Obviously, this rouses some suspicion, mainly from Ulma, who uses this as an opportunity to attempt brushing shoulders with Saihara and intentionally tells Momota not to bother him despite Saihara's own protests. Well, we'll see how this pans out. Let's investigate. The time of death is 6.30 a.m. and no external wounds appear to be present. Kibo says he discovered her first after logging out first and seen her with her helmet still on, body contorted into an awful position. Harukawa helped take the helmet off, and in doing so, they could see that she seemed to be grasping at her throat. Near Oma's seat, a bottle of poison from Saihara's lab is found, but the label clarifies that someone it's used on will have bloodshot eyes due to a bursting blood vessel, clearly ruling out its use here. When gathering testimony, Yumino clarifies that Iruma herself volunteered to search outside the chapel. When everyone heard the crashing noise, they checked outside and found Iruma's avatar face down in the snow, unmoving, and knew something must be wrong. Gokuhara, meanwhile, claims not to know a thing, even seeming to think the virtual world in its entirety was some kind of dream, at least that's how it sounds. Maybe he just isn't able to wrap his head around fantasy sci-fi computers? Well, speaking of not being able to wrap your head around things, Momota gives his story that he was on the rooftop searching when a strange circle appeared below him out of nowhere, and he got logged out, which Saihara notes is what it looks like when you do so. Harukawa is trying to search the program's text file for information, finding that because this is in fact some facsimile of the Neo World program, damage inflicted to the Avatar's body will be transferred to the real world body, or at least the sensation will be. This means fatal damage will incur real death via shock, and not a coma slash brain death slash Evangelion Paradise Mind Palace episode. Yeah, sure, death by shock, let's just go with it. The consequences of death in this program have never been consistent. Hell, this program down to its aesthetic and rules have never been consistent, so I guess this is just another Tuesday as far as we're concerned. Ulma raises concern that info in the text could have potentially been changed or removed, and Monotara offers to analyze the data to help get to the bottom of that. He's motivated by a weird motherly attachment to Irima that he brought up before. Listen, it doesn't really matter. It's just a strange ongoing gag that I didn't really feel like mentioning before, and now I'm scared too. Anyway, he finds that the text file appears not to have been changed, but does find a record of when everyone logged in and out. Remember this for the test, it will be important later. He also comments that parts of the program itself were changed, but he can only figure out what they were via careful examination, which will take some time. Which means that we need to focus our investigation elsewhere while we wait on that. Where better to find more clues than this dinky little room where the actual crime took place though, right? Yep, we have to return to the virtual world to finish this investigation, or at the very least, everyone aside from Harukawa, Oma, and Gokuhara enter. Our first lovely discovery is a roll of toilet paper outside the mansion, off to the side, but we can only stall long enough. Where Irima's avatar lies is the wooden lattice, a hammer, and a cell phone, which already raises some red flags. First of all, Iruma claimed she deleted all dangerous objects and weapons from the game, so why is the hammer here? Second of all, in testing the cell phone, Saihara is able to log Momota out of the game, even though he's not in the salon, which Iruma said you could only log out from. 
Yumino follows up her testimony about the noise, saying she felt like something hit the chapel wall, which stuns Saihara, as he and Shiragane clearly heard the noise too, despite seemingly being on the other side of the loading zone. Kibo also recalls Iruma and Oma's whispering, and relays that they were actually talking about meeting on the rooftop alone at some point. Naturally, this means Saihara has to check the rooftop out for himself. Oh, hi, Momota. Predictably, the lattice is now missing from the closet it was once in, and Saihara begins to feel like something is off about the world's loading point. No other clues seem to be present, although he does notice there's a lock on the outside of the rooftop's door. Just then, Harukawa arrives to let them know that the analysis of the program that Monotaro was doing is done, but keeps Saihara behind for a second. I'm not trying to sound like Momota, but I don't think you should carry all the burden alone, she says. You're Shuichi Saihara before you're a detective. Don't ever forget that. And I really love this line. It's probably one of my favorites in the chapter, and it's not even a big important plot thing. It's just a moment of consideration and concern from a friend who's acclimating to the fact that she genuinely cares about someone she's recently decided to spend her time with. It's nice. Once we're out, we get a bit more testimony from Oma, claiming that he never met with Iruma on the rooftop because the door was locked. Monotaro claims that Iruma tampered with the program in some ways, which is no shocker, and she started with deleting many objects, like she said. She did, however, leave the hammer, and seemingly on purpose. The cell phone is also clarified to be an original feature of the game that she didn't add herself, which means she was hiding it intentionally for some reason. Monotaro says that all Iruma added were the maps and tampered with certain parameters. For example, each thing in the program is assigned the marker of human or a non-human object, with the former applying to avatar bodies and the latter to most everything else. For some reason, Iruma changed her avatar to have the latter classification, but since this is only for identification purposes, it didn't seem to change anything about her avatar itself. However, she did add a wall to the program which allows non-human objects through it. Oma specifically had his avatar changed as well, given a setting where if Iruma were to touch him, he would be paralyzed and unable to move. Lastly, some sort of avatar user error occurred after everyone first logged in, but Monotaro has no idea what it could have been caused by or what effect it actually had. At that exact moment, Monokuma, who is seemingly super down in the dumps and far from energized, calls the class trial into session, and we have no choice but to head down to the Shrine of Judgment just as we usually do. The trio do their best to connect with each other despite their difficulties before the trial starts, but as buff Monokuma once again crushes his infinitely responding goblet, we are ushered into the ever-shrinking crowd of the elevator. The truth we seek, however, is not going to be so easy to stomach. So we get to it right off the bat, with Oma accusing Momota of poisoning Iruma. But of course, we know the poison is irrelevant because of the bloodshot eyes thing, so if the poison wasn't used in the murder, what did kill Iruma? Obviously, she was killed in the virtual world, it pretty much goes without saying. Whatever killed her also seems to have involved some kind of asphyxiation, given the state of her body. But in that case, what could she have been killed with? Well, perhaps the toilet paper. It might seem a bit unconventional if you're thinking in terms of what's possible in the real world, sure, but we have to remember that no items in the virtual world can be broken, so even if the paper was stretched to its limits, it wouldn't tear like normal real-life toilet paper. With that in mind, it could just be used like a rope and used as a murder weapon just the same. I don't see why toilet paper would be present now that I think about it, considering they wouldn't need to use the bathroom in a virtual world, but whatever. It is Irima we're talking about here, we don't know what she wanted to include or for what reasons. Speaking of which, uh, why'd she leave that lone hammer in the program, by the way? Well, I think it should be pretty obvious by this point that she was planning to use it for something, or rather someone. She invited Oma to the roof alone, which made it pretty clear, along with the way she manipulated his avatar settings to be weak to her touch, that she was planning to kill him. Damn, alright girl, live your worst life and then die, I guess. This would also explain the poison on his seat in the real world, because Iruma, who logged in after everyone else, would have plenty of time to plant it near him for the express purpose of making it look as though it were related to a murder that took place on the outside, rather than one perpetuated by her on the inside. Granted, I'm not sure this would have done her much good, as I don't think Oma's potential virtual hammer death would have left his eyes bloodshot either, but despite being something of a genius, she's not exactly a genius, so this about track. Now we have enough pieces to speculate about why she would hide a cell phone in her possession to intentionally log out Momota. She would do this to intentionally frame him for the crime, which is also why she sent him to the roof in front of everyone, so when Oma's avatar was discovered there, it would only seem to make sense that the guy investigating there, who conveniently logged out before everyone else, is the one who killed him. It makes sense that she was so bold, though. She was literally controlling the parameters of the whole place. It's why she was so insistent about getting everyone inside of it. If, however, Oma couldn't get to the roof because it was locked and Momota was logged out, then this seems to imply she was there. But how'd she get from the chapel to the mansion's roof if the bridge was soaking up some waves in the river where she dropped it? Well, that's the real meat here, and it's going to answer a lot of questions for us. 
We know she went to the mansion. Shirogane's testimony confirms as much, but it's just a matter of figuring out how she did that. Well, how about the special wall she made that allowed objects to pass through it? Well, it seems like Momota has some issues with that statement, considering he's not privy to how she changed her avatar. This marks one of several occasions throughout this trial where, unfortunately, we have to explicitly tear down arguments offered by Momota, which we haven't really had to do before. This combined with how Oma is clearly steering the conversation and acting as though Momota is getting in the way, is going to slowly build a wedge between the two over the course of this trial. As Momota becomes both more insecure about Saihara growing out of his shadow, and incredulous about the idea that Oma could ever speak the truth about something. It's genuinely really tense and creates a feeling of discomfort through gameplay that I haven't really experienced much in this series before. Gameplay mechanics in Danganronpa rarely tangibly tie into character relationships in a way as direct feeling as this, and I kind of have to applaud that. Well, anyway, back on point, yeah, she classified herself as an object, so she could indeed pass through the wall. To figure this out, we first need to recall the inciting moment of panic in this incident, the slamming sound. Now, Saihara and Shiragane both heard this, but the others claimed this slam was on the outside of the chapel wall. Despite being evidently separated by a loading zone, Saihara and Shiragane both heard this, as well as Kibo's voice, even though he was on the whole other side of the map with everyone else at the chapel. So what does this mean? Well, maybe we can deduce that by thinking about something else strange, like the Mirai Hills sign that was used as a makeshift bridge. The sign was dropped in the river by Irima, but when it was found later, it was up against the rocks on the mansion side. The flow of the river should have swept it down by the chapel, so how did it end up there? Well, what if up and downstream connect? Like in an old Atari game, where if you exit the right side of the screen, you end up at the far left side and pop back out from it. The sign washed down into the right wall, then popped back out through the left one. The only way this would work, however, is if the walls by the chapel in the mansion are the same wall, and the only way that would be possible is if the map is actually entirely different than we first suspected. Though we initially thought of the loading point as the middle of the map, it was actually the edges. The map shown to us by Iruma was set up entirely for the purpose of tricking us as to what the true nature of the map actually was. Now that we seemingly know what it actually looks like, Oma says we're finally in the home stretch, having seemingly led us all along this whole time like he already knows the answers. Planning to say she was near the chapel the whole time and the bridge was down, Irima utilized her exploit to cross from the chapel side to the mansion side. Once there, she went to the roof to meet with Alma, having used the cell phone to log out Momota. Then, she apparently was killed on the roof by whoever the culprit was, who then moved her body afterward. How'd they do that, though? Well, the status of her avatar when it was found should tell us a bit about that. Oma even points out the handrails and slanted roof to prod us toward the answer, which makes it even more obvious. The culprit put her body on the wooden lattice, along with her hammer and cell phone, and used the friction of the roof slope to slide her off, where she then crashed into the chapel wall as she passed through the side of the map. Monokuma likens this to Sonic hitting an enemy and dropping all of his rings. Aw, look guys, we've come full circle on my YouTube career. Anyway, Saihara asks why Oma would lie about never going to the roof, even for the meeting, if he could describe how things on the roof looked. He tries to excuse this by saying that Yumino said something about it, but we've got to perjure our way back on track to get him to stop wrangling. Unluckily for Saihara, this involves lying to the biggest liar on the planet, which means he's obviously going to be figured out. Up until this point, Saihara's never had to lie about something involving Oma, and we'll talk about why this was a big mistake in a bit. Nevertheless, he says that despite Oma's claims of being in the salon, Saihara went to check on him and didn't see him there. This didn't happen, but he's hoping it will force Oma to squeal about what he's hiding. All this actually does is help Oma to realize that despite how everyone gets on his ass for lying all the time, the hero of this story is also lying at times, and everyone's eating it up purely because it's not Oma doing it. As you can tell, this pisses Oma right off, because he immediately goes from playfully leading everyone on a breadcrumb trail to pulling his most devilish antics yet. And what he says as he leads into them is something I think really needs special highlighting, because as I often say, it's going to become very important moving forward. Why do you guys hate lies that much? There's only one truth, but endless possibilities for lies, you know? And some of them are only white lies, or lies to be kind to people. If you deny all of that just because it's a lie, then that means you guys are just terrible at being lied to! Seriously, the worst! Now, he does slightly undercut himself with that last second jokey joke tone, but I think it's worth paying attention to the substance of his words here, especially as it pertains to the rest of this trial. It's at this point that he fully gives up on leading everyone along, saying he's just gonna throw the truth out despite Saihara for lying. Though he initially seems to be confessing to the murder himself, and even admits to working with Monokuma to plant the secret of the outside world in the simulator, he unceremoniously drops on our laps that the culprit is Gokuhara. 
This is a heart-sinking moment if I've ever seen one. It's so left field given the information we have at present, and it's so not something you want to believe. Even Gokuhara himself seems incredibly confused, but Oma swears his statement's legitimacy, saying that he and Gokuhara formed a coalition, the Killing Game Busters, to end this game for good. Momota tries to rev up the good old shonen protagonist speech machine to advocate for Gokuhara's innocence, but we can already see the writing on the wall. Oma is not going to let us believe in a convenient lie just because we want to avoid a harsh truth when we've spent this whole game beating his ass in the quote retweets for not telling the truth. Oma couldn't kill Irima, she would have paralyzed him at the slightest touch, so to defend himself, since he had already deduced she would be trying to kill him, he would need someone to do his dirty work, and because of this, Saihara isn't content just to blindly believe in Gokuhara like he's done for others in the past. This sours Momota, especially because it seems like he's believing Oma over everyone else. Gokuhara, meanwhile, is completely visibly distraught at the idea that he could ever have committed a murder, and that makes things all the more difficult. As Oma badgers and berates Gokuhara into defending himself, Yumino tells him to stop bullying him, and Oma simply responds that that's what everyone does in this game. Gangs up on each other, distrusts each other, and Momota, through clenched teeth, declares he'd rather die getting a wrong answer than being correct and stooping to the same level as Oma. It's here where his most admirable traits become more clearly flaws. His sentiments are truly sweet, it's clear he cares about the people in his life more than anything. But it's also true, like any other class trial, that if they get the wrong answers, they will all die. And Saihara can't just stop now. He can't give up on the promise he made or the people he wants to protect, even if in the end they end up hating him for it. Momota is well within his right to be pissed off at Oma, but the outcome of this trial is bigger than that. As Gokuhara continues to claim he knows nothing, Saihara puts the pieces together. The avatar user error Monotara mentioned, what was it? It's that Gokuhara plugged the helmet's cords in wrong. When he heard Yumino talk about what hand she holds her chopsticks in, he incorrectly inserted them because he holds his chopsticks with his left hand. This means he could have absolutely killed Irima in the virtual world and had no memory of it afterward. Oma runs down the list and rules out everyone from being able to do it, with evidence, aside from Gokuhara himself, just to drill it in that much harder for those who don't want to believe. This is the truth you've all been searching for, he says. This is the truth you wanted so badly. Momota tries one last time to save the day, saying that Gokuhara was seen by Saihara and Shiragane as they ran out, and he wouldn't have had time to descend if that's right after they heard the crash. But while that would be wonderful if it were true, we can't turn away from the truth just because we don't like it. Why was the toilet paper used for the murder casually found by the side of the mansion? Well, the culprit hung it around the binoculars, descended, but then, before it could be properly disposed of, ran into those two and could only quickly toss it aside. Oma tries to slam Gokuhara again, but Saihara stops him. As Gokuhara weeps bitterly, wondering how he could ever do something like this, wondering why this is happening, scared and frail, Saihara speaks peacefully, affectionately, and soothingly. Gonta-kun, I'm going to look back at this whole case one more time, okay? When you're convinced, you just let me know, alright? Let's end this together. <laughs> Okay. And God, this moment just destroys me. This right here, while it isn't the only reason, this is why I actually really, really like Saihara as a protagonist. Every Danganronpa protagonist has been nice, has been considerate, but Saihara is just uniquely emotionally vulnerable in a way I find extremely refreshing for the type of role he's in. You don't often see lead detective main characters, especially boys, who are allowed to wear their emotions so outwardly on their sleeves, who are allowed to prioritize gentle kindness over appearing as ultra-badass cool guys. There's nothing inherently wrong with the latter, of course. It more or less just depends on the quality of the writing itself. But in a sea of his contemporaries, I think Saihara stands out for this reason, and in a way that really makes me appreciate him. He doesn't want any of this. He takes no pleasure in exposing a truth that will inevitably hurt people. But he'll do whatever he can to make that process more bearable, whether through the catharsis of truth or the saving grace of a little white lie. Laying out the case one more time, this long and winding road finally comes to an end. Gokuhara still doesn't understand, but he concedes that he trusts everyone's judgment. He just wonders why in the world he would do it. And god, his voice actor really breaks my heart here. The vote is tallied, and the trial is over. Now all that's left is to extract that information in the only way we possibly have left. What is that, anyway? Well, Monokuma notes that Gokuhara's virtual memories are still in the computer, so he makes an alter-ego version of him within the computer to clarify things for us, as if the one virtual callback wasn't enough for one chapter. 
The truth turns out to be even more horrifying than we could have possibly imagined, that while he was searching around with Oma, Oma showed him the secret of the outside world. Turns out, Oma actually did find what the keycard was for, and it was seeing the outside world, the state of it, and its true nature. It was around this time that Irima was starting to get the program ready, so he decided that to save everyone, as he puts it, he worked with Monokuma to combine the two. This allowed the motive to be reused, and for Gokuhara to be shown a flashback light hidden in the virtual world, which contained the same sight that Oma saw, which he also says are part of their missing memories. When Gokuhara saw that flashback light, he remembered the secret of the outside world, and it was so hellish that he came to the conclusion that everyone would be better off dead. He saw that the academy was hell, but thought the outside world was even worse, and that everyone would be better off being put into a trial, misled, and killed at once so that they'd never have to find out the truth. Even to the end, Gokuhara refuses to tell them what it is that he saw. In a flashback, we see Irima isn't even surprised that Oma knows she's going to kill him, and she even seems apologetic about it before she's snuck up on and killed by Gokuhara, who only apologizes profusely as he does so. Oma even seems to become emotional, claiming he would have done everything himself if he could, and even begging Monokuma to be a part of the execution. Of course, Gokuhara tells him this isn't necessary, and just pleads that everyone get along after his death. He apologizes one last time for being stupid before he's strapped to a pole and... Okay, listen, this execution really sucks. Like, the chapter's been pretty okay, but this is just... Okay, so Gokuhara is strapped up with Alter Ego Gokuhara, Monokuma shoots robot bees at him, Monofani has her weird expansion pregnancy deliver into a giant horrific wasp monster that kills both her and Monotaro, then stabs Gokuhara and the laptop through before Monokuma flamethrowers them both to death. Yeah, uh, the less I say about this one, the better, frankly. Anyway, with Gokuhara and all of the cubs gone, Monokuma disappears, and everyone begins to mourn their losses. Harukawa demands Oma at least tell them the outside world's secret, and though he briefly appears emotional, uttering that he doesn't want to, softly, he immediately turns on a dime with a crazed expression and calls them all idiots fully embracing his role as the villain. He says all of his crying was fake, insults Gokuhara, and says he did all of this to liven up the game. He says he loves and wants to enjoy the game. And boy, that CG is really not doing this moment any favors. He even whips out the claim that nothing pleases him more than inflicting pain on others, which this line will become interesting in the future. Momota tries to lay another smackdown, but Oma effortlessly dodges, knocking him to the floor and claiming that he seems out of sorts. Harukawa panics, rushing to his aid, more livid than she's ever looked, and Saihara tells Oma that this is why no one wants to be around him. Claiming that he will be the winner of the game, he leaves, but the moment hasn't quite calmed yet. Momota finally cracks, coughing up a sizable amount of blood in front of everyone, and his excuses as to why are flimsy at best. Saihara tries to volunteer to help him, but he's too bitter, too hurt, and too betrayed feeling to go with him. Saihara laments that he fought so damn hard for the truth, but this is all he gets for it. As Oma walks into the dark, smirking, he says that it's finally about time for him to put an end to the killing game. The horse text evolves into its final form, revealing it to have been written by Oma all along into the phrase, The world is mine, Kokichi Oma. Our number of survivors drops to a measly seven, and chapter four ends. Boy oh boy oh boy, do we have a lot to talk about here. First of all, let me say that this chapter is a huge improvement over chapter 3. I know the bar was kind of on the floor, so it goes without saying, and it obviously has several problems of its own, which we'll get to. But this is already such a visible and marked improvement that I will honestly take whatever I can get. I think what helps is that this chapter also has quite a bit of thematic focus and is genuinely pretty emotionally grueling, not just because you feel sorry for the culprit, like in many other Danganronpa cases, but because the very structure of the case itself toys around with you and makes you uncomfortable purely to emphasize the emotional state of the characters themselves. But okay, let's not get ahead of myself here. Let me get my bitching out of the way first so that we can have all the negatives set aside when I go to talk about what I really like about this chapter. First of all, I think more emphasis should have been placed on the program itself. It's the main fixture of the chapter, but it shows up very late. The area is quite small, and you're only in it for what feels like a blink before the murder occurs. After that, you get to investigate it for like 15 minutes before you leave it again, and that's it. I realize that this probably was a bit much to develop, but it seems underwhelming as both a reference to the Neo World program from SDR2, and also just as a setting for the murder of this chapter. We spend like 80% of the daily life just doing stuff in the school before we even get to see this place. Could we not get a little more time to at least let it sink in? Speaking of the program, I realize this is more of a mileage may vary issue than anything, but I just 
think it's really ugly. The weird chibi art style and sterile, low-budget 3D environments just do not do it for me. It looks like the shitty App Store remaster of an SNES game that we never got to see the original version of. I feel like this was for convenience, to distinguish the events in and out of the game so it would be easier to follow narratively, but I just wish they had chosen a different look. Whew, yeah, okay, there's also that. Okay, I've waited long enough to talk about the issues with Gokuhara's specific localization problems, but now that he's, uh, dead and this chapter revolved pretty centrally around him, his actions, and his mindset, I think it's about time we really peel that back, because this is genuinely one of the biggest problems in the translation for me. So, for those of you who have only played these games with the official localization and dubs, let's get one thing clear right out of the gate that might kind of startle you. Gokuhara does not do his caveman speak in the original Japanese script. The only thing he struggles with are computers or other technology because he was raised in the wilderness. He does refer to himself in the third person still, but what's important to note is that this is a really common occurrence in Japanese speech. Both Chibashira and Yonaga did this in the Japanese script as well, yet in the localization, they mostly use first person pronouns while Gokuhara does not. I wonder why that is. He's pretty damn knowledgeable, actually. He's one of the first people to understand Tojo's trick in Chapter 2, and while I don't think this particular change would be the worst thing in the world had it just been left at that, I think it has led to some problems in terms of wider fan perception of the character and his arc. You see, what's so absolutely cruel about Chapter 4 of V3 isn't that Gokuhara doesn't know what he's doing, or has been completely misled into doing what he did solely because of Oma's instructions. Because, tragically, even though he was definitely manipulated into picking up the flashback light, he made this decision for himself. He's a lot smarter of a guy than a lot of people, including himself, really gives him credit for, and it's this lack of confidence in himself and insistence on constantly downplaying his own abilities, that's why he genuinely can't fathom having killed Irima once he forgets about it. Beyond just thinking this is horrible, he doesn't even conceive of the notion that he's capable. The idea that he isn't is the comforting lie that everyone leans on when the truth becomes too much to bear. But as Oma painstakingly went to the trouble of making clear to us, the truth is much more harsh. Gokuhara was smart enough to do this, and not only that, he chose to try to get everyone killed. He saw the outside world and he really did think that maybe it was worth letting everyone die if it meant they'd never find out about it. He may be naive, but he's not an idiot. And I think this one specific decision of the localization has led so many more English-speaking fans into thinking he didn't know what he was doing, which I think consequently totally undermines his arc and what it means both for his character and the story at large. And to be clear, this is not a dunk on these fans. It's not me saying I know better or that they just didn't see what was obvious or whatever. I'm just complaining that the localization did not make this clear enough and that I can't blame anyone for missing this because of it. It just shouldn't have happened, is my point. The localization issues made clearer in this chapter don't stop there. We can't fully cover the scope of the issues with Oma quite yet because we need to reach further developments in the plot to do so, but his big villain heel turn here I think is severely undercut when the original script, which has him cackle and call everyone idiots, is localized as him calling everyone stupid heads. This is kind of a constant issue with him throughout the localization, actually. There are a lot of lines in the English version of the game which have him screaming, acting silly, and with tons of exclamation points tacked on that originally had much more subdued vocal delivery and ended with question marks or ellipses. It seems like there's a concentrated effort to just make him an overall sillier character. There are so many lines which just outright swerve from their original meanings to make him seem goofier, and I just don't agree with these changes at all. It ends up making him feel like a completely different character between both versions sometimes, at least in terms of tone. And this especially holds true for this scene, which should have been the one moment above all moments that Oma drops all theatrics and becomes deathly serious. The moment is supposed to be intense, it's supposed to be a whiplash, when you realize that this cackling little brat you've been annoyed at for hours is actually way more seemingly wicked than you ever thought possible. Throwing the silly speak into it is just the definition of, dude, this is really not the time for that. Oh, and uh, just reiterating that the entire Monocub's soap opera plot was terrible and I cringed back into myself every time it was brought up. Stop that. Okay, now let's talk about the good, shall we? While I definitely think the murder could have been a bit more intricate or interesting, I do think this is a step in the right direction. It was certainly possible to figure out, but the swerves, while inventive, seemed a bit less left field to me than those in Chapter 2. In the logic, while you could certainly point out the goofiness of it in places, was much more understandably malleable due to the virtual world setting and its established rules. 
and those established rules are followed very well, so there was no point at which I was left scratching my head having to wonder how the canon solution could even be the case. The evidence itself is pretty well telegraphed, there are a couple of decent red herrings, even if I think Momota is pretty obviously not the culprit from the get-go, and while I do think that a lot of time is spent outside the game where more focus should have been put on it, the character interactions we get during this time, and the few we get in the investigation, are for the most part really nice. Oma, I think, really comes into his own as a character in this trial. I still don't think in terms of the wildcard character slot that I like him as much as Komaida, but he certainly begins to show depths here that I can at least appreciate when it is made clear how those things relate to the game's overall thematic aims. I genuinely find him a lot more compelling here when he becomes actively angry and begins to press everyone's buttons over whether the truth they seek is really so inherently good, when they immediately deny it when it turns out to be anything other than what they wanted. He takes it so obviously personally that they could criticize him for lying, when they are both leaning on lies for comfort and their main guy is doing a spicy little lie in every trial. That moment where he looks at Saihara with recognition in his eyes and says something about him using underhanded tricks too? That bit freezes my blood. It's really good. And now let's talk a bit about Gokuhara himself. I basically already said what I liked about his arc and what made it so effective when I was complaining about how the localization did him dirty, but I do want to reiterate just how legitimately heartbreaking it is to watch him sob on the stand like this. You know he's not like other culprits in the past who have put on a show to deflect blame. You know he legitimately means it, and it makes it all the more hurtful when you realize that he's just as capable of going down that path as anyone else. We're put in a unique position because of his memory loss, seeing him able to interrogate the side of himself that already fell prey to his worst impulses, from the viewpoint of someone who, at least to his own knowledge, hasn't done so, or at least can't comprehend why he would. It underlines a duality in people that I think is so universally terrifying to all of us, that in the right set of circumstances, we too could do terrible things we wouldn't normally ever imagine ourselves doing. It's an emotional gut punch that between Oma's harsh words and the growing wedge between Saihara and Momota becomes a cornerstone of pain in this chapter which does not let up. It's brutal in all the ways that make narratives like these powerful, and I can't applaud that enough. This is what I'm looking for in a compelling Danganronpa motive. We didn't even need to know what he saw, but because we could still understand the character's feelings and struggles that went along with it, we could become invested in the explanation, and that explanation felt far more personable and human to me than Tojo's did. And of course, it was an actual motive that wasn't just, uh, go crazy, go stupid, so it's better than Shinguji's by default. This chapter is certainly closest to being as good as the first in my eyes, and in some respects, even if definitely not all, I think it surpasses it. This is definitely an upward ascent for the game after it hits rock bottom, with many of the gears finally beginning to turn in a way that makes things feel more and more appropriately climactic. I'm actually pretty excited to head into chapter 5, and if I know anything about the chapter 5s of this series, it's that good or bad, shit's about to get crazy. Beginning with Monokuma grieving for his now wiped out cubs, he quickly comes to the conclusion that he's not really sure what purpose they serve to him to begin with. Seeing as the cubs were last minute additions to this story just as much as Monokuma himself was, that's probably a decent question to ask. In the cafeteria, Momota continues to claim he's fine, but the awkward tension between himself and Saihara still remains. Everyone is still talking about not having any leads on how to escape, and Oma is of course nowhere to be seen. Still doesn't mean we have no troublemakers around though, because obviously Monokuma has to show up to give us our prizes. The last real key and the real last key, respectively. The last real key goes to the mysterious checkerboarded door near the gym, which we've been passing a lot but never been able to access until now. It leads up to a huge spiral staircase to Momota's lab, where we we find some pretty interesting stuff, namely a document about the Gopher Project, which mentions boys and girls of exceptional talent being the seeds of hope for the future of humanity. The rest of the data is thoroughly redacted, but Harukawa speculates that this was a Noah's Ark type situation, which would make sense because the Ark was built with gopher wood. Deciding to search around for the flashback light to see if they can get more information, everyone departs, which brings us to the fifth floor to use the real last key. After using the key, the doorway explodes, revealing a hidden lab that can't be accessed. Monokuma's quick to show his face to explain that it was actually Amami's lab, but it will never be opened because he died before it could be properly revealed. Upon exiting the courtyard, which is more cleaned up than ever, Shirogane speculates whether following Monokuma's pattern is actually leading to worse outcomes for everyone, and Kibo ushers us toward a strange cybernetic door near Iruma's lab, which was previously inaccessible. Using the real last key again, those doors open, giving us access to the cyber courtyard, a strange maze-like place which ends at a huge shutter guarded by an electronic barrier. 
While trying to get in, Kibo trips an alarm, which Monokuma explains is attached to a motion sensor. The keypad has an incredibly long code to turn it all off, but he doesn't really mind mentioning it because, as he puts it, this place used to be important to guard, but is now useless. That's because inside is the Exosol hangar, but it's pointless now that the monocubs are gone. There's also a washing machine for the Exosols, a bathroom, which seems out of place if only robots came in here, hmm, and a hydraulic press, which can be operated with a control panel, though apparently a security sensor will stop the press if a person is detected on it. Kibo wants to try it on himself just to see if it will think of him as a person, and though he's reluctant to try it, Saihara agrees, if only to sate his curiosity, since he promises to move if there's danger. The press comes almost all the way down on him before he rolls out, prompting him to become depressed. You sure you're all right there, buddy? At that time, Yumino shows up to tell us that Shiragane has suddenly found the flashback light, and everyone gathers in the cafeteria to see it. Well, turns out Yumino was wrong, because what Shiragane tells us about is actually the world is mine message left by Ulma. Though they briefly speculate about what it could mean, they come to no definitive answer, which leaves us with a bit of free time afterward. Seeing as this chapter is probably going to be important, I think we should spend some time actually doing Momenta's free times now, which, oh, he doesn't want to talk to me. Well, I guess people would be mad if I didn't do Oma's either, so I should... Where the hell is he? Okay, you know what? Fine. I'll look them up on YouTube, I guess. Thanks, Just One Gamer. You were a lifesaver. So, Mamatas are about what you'd expect, honestly. They entail him talking about his astronaut training and crazy adventures where he conquered the sea and land during his summer vacation, which Saihara finds somewhat suspect. At the end of it all, Saihara finally confides in him about the case that started his anxiety about revealing the truth, which he's predictably a bit flippant about. He says that if the guy hadn't been foiled, he'd have eventually carried the guilt of his actions around with him, which Saihara prevented by catching him in the act, and that if he holds a grudge, he'll just have to get over it, because Momota will always believe in Saihara no matter what. Well, that hurts a little bit right now, but I'm sure things will turn out okay eventually, right? Oma's, on the other hand, are a little bit complicated. He basically spends the entire time screwing with Saihara, telling him things about his organization, which you can never be sure of the validity of, and then repeatedly demanding he partake in strange games, which will determine, with a limited number of meetings, whether he'll kill Saihara or not. In their final meeting, he challenges Saihara to the knife game, where you stab between your splayed fingers on a table. Oma goes first and manages to nick himself, at which point Saihara performs first aid and ties up the wound. Oma says he was lying from the beginning about wanting to kill Saihara, and instead wanted this, to occupy his mind the whole time. Since he suspected that Saihara was worried about what he would do, and even came to his aid when he was hurt, this means he concludes that Saihara will never forget about him for the rest of his life, so either way, he's had his heart stolen. Saihara concludes that in the end, he could never really understand Oma, because no matter how many times he tried to genuinely communicate with him or reach out his hand, and Oma would never actually come down to his level and take it, upkeeping his theatricisms and never taking his mask down the entire time. I wonder how that's gonna pan out. Seeing as neither of these two would actually hang out with me, I instead decided to spend my free time with Chirigane because she's pretty much one of the only people left I can hang out with. Most of her events pretty much just revolve around her complex of being plain and unnoticeable, and how she really only finds passion in her cosplay work, which she thinks should be more about embodying a character you're passionate about rather than seeking clout or popularity from your peers. It eventually concludes with her asking if Saihara will go to a con with her when they escape, during which Saihara promises to try crossplay, which, uh, I promise I will not make an egg joke. And that's pretty much it for that. I'm definitely sure no aspects of this will become relevant in the future, don't be silly. Anyway, at night, Harukawa comes to invite Saihara to her lab, since she says Momota had asked to see it, obviously trying to covertly create an opportunity for the two to talk and resolve the tension between them. This doesn't entirely work out. While Momota is able to casually ask her about some weapons, even learning how to assemble a crossbow from her, he still doesn't really communicate with Saihara, and in fact actively avoids doing so. Eventually, he excuses himself by saying he doesn't feel good, and Harukawa calls Saihara out for not trying harder. Saihara thanks her for looking out for the both of them anyway, though, which she seems to appreciate, even if she doesn't say as much. Can't end on too happy of a note, though. Obviously, we have to show Momota crying about his illness getting even worse and how he doesn't want to die here. Yay, fun chapter! The next morning, Momota finally discloses what he was looking for weapons for, namely that he wants to fight Monokuma now that the cubs are inactive, the exosols aren't usable, and it's their best opportunity to do so. Though there is a tiny bit of reluctance, everyone agrees that it's their best shot at doing so, but that they'll need a little bit of time to prepare, though it can't be too much because they can't give him too much time to respond to their provocations. It might be a bit too late for that, though, because when nighttime comes, Monokuma is nowhere to be seen on the announcement. Still, everyone gathers in the gym anyway, but before they can completely forget him, who else but Oma finally shows up? 
With him, he has some strange hammers and a bomb, though he doesn't drop said bomb. He's more than willing to give us a few tidbits of info that sure feel like some. Apparently, these things were invented by Irima, who had been secretly working with him for a while up until this point. He'd gotten her help to make plenty of inventions for the sole purpose of hijacking and stopping the game, but she eventually became too paranoid to continue working with him, once the flashback light pushed her far enough to want to kill. This casts a lot more of a nuanced light on everything that happened last time, considering Oma showed an awareness of Irima's intent to kill him, and she herself seemed reluctant to do so, and not at all surprised when he asked if that's what she was planning. The dissolution of their partnership was largely out of Oma's hands, and though he knew what she was planning to do, she had every bit of control in the virtual world, and there's no chance the rest of the group would have believed him if he went to them about it. If he had stayed out of the virtual world entirely, she might have used her plan on someone else, which would be against his interests if he truly wanted to stop the game itself. And this would even explain why he did what he did with Gokuhara if so, because if he truly believed only he could stop the game, he would need somehow to stop Irima without dirtying his own hands. Well, it's at least food for thought to chew on for now. Anyway, Oma suggests that using the hammers and the one bomb, both of which can knock out electronic signals, with the latter being able to do so within a 50-foot radius, that they should tackle the death road of despair once again, but actually get out this time. They will need to be careful though, since the hammers need to be charged for 24 hours once they run out of juice. He also denies knowing anything about the message outside, which prompts Harukawa to go chokehold mode again. When Momota gets her to drop him, he leaves, but everyone doesn't really have any better ideas, and Momota says this might be the only chance they have to try it anyway, so they reluctantly heed Oma's advice and head to the manhole. Ready to fulfill his promise to Akamatsu, Saihara leads the charge into the tunnel. And with our spam hammers in tow, we can finally make it through the tunnel while avoiding all of the traps. At the end is an electronic barrier covering a large hatch-like door, which resembles the one from the first Danganronpa, of course. Using the electro hammer on the security pad, the barrier drops and the door begins to open. However, this can't go like it did last time, of course. When the door opens, what the gang sees outside is a hellish scorched earth, billowing with crimson smog that is so intoxicatingly awful that it not only makes them dead silent, but it even prevents them from being able to breathe. As they all pass out, they awaken with the door closing back and Oma arriving to congratulate them, as well as to tell them what they've just seen. This is apparently the truth of the outside world, a crumbling, desolate world that was destroyed by meteors. Initially, the Gopher Project was formed to usher talented students into space, to escape it and prevent the complete extinction of mankind by salvaging a chosen few and letting them expand elsewhere. Initially discontent with this, though, they fled from the project and were sought by the super high school level hunt, a contingent of doomers who were convinced the world had it coming. The organization behind the project spread misinformation of the students' deaths to cover for them, and eventually convince them to rejoin and leave Earth in a space station, which is itself the academy we have been inside this whole time. After a period of stasis, the students were awoken, but hiding in their ranks was the controller of Monokuma, someone who was part of an evil organization who steered the craft back to the ruined Earth and began this killing game on board the ship among the last vestiges of humanity that were supposed to work together and rebuild. And who is that cult's leader? Well, Oma claims it to be himself. He takes full credit for masterminding the killing game, and even though everyone is skeptical, he takes out a remote which seemingly lets him control the Exosols, which seems to seal the deal. With the Electro Hammers thoroughly drained of energy, Oma uses the Exosols to beat down and kidnap the resistant Momota, and though an infuriated Harukawa tries to confront him, Saihara holds her back to prevent her from getting killed. Oma claims that this is the end, that he's gotten bored of the game he created, and that everything will now come to a delightfully despairing standstill, where they live out the rest of their days in the school's barrier and wait to die. Everyone breaks down. They can't take it anymore. They don't have the strength to take one more step. Saihara concludes that they all should have died a long time ago, and hazily returns to his room. For days, he languishes, doing absolutely nothing as he once again begins to contemplate giving up his life. A Monokuma theater segment discusses the many trivial things that people find themselves living for, saying, If you say Danganronpa is your reason to live, I couldn't be happier. Oop, oop, oop. It's been a real pleasure doing business with you. Gee, I'm sure that's not going to become relevant in the future. Before Saihara can completely destroy himself, though, he's visited by Harukawa, who tells him to go shower and meet with her and everyone else in the dining hall. Apparently, when she came here earlier, she found a flashback light just sitting out on the table, and she convinces everyone to at least try to look at it. When they do, they're reminded of the events of every past Danganronpa game, 
of Hope's Peak Academy, the biggest, most tragic event in human history, the killing game of Class 78, Junko Enoshima, the remnants of despair, the Future Foundation, everything that led up to the meteorites. The Gopher Project was then started by Hope's Peak Academy itself, by Makoto Naegi, who entrusted the future of the world to these students who were attending the Academy. Apparently, they were the very few who had somehow managed to be immune to a terrible virus spreading from the meteorites, which was killing off humanity, and that's why they were selected. This seemingly motivates everyone as they come to the conclusion that Ulma must have been a remnant of despair carrying on the will of Junko Enoshima, and that he must be stopped in the name of hope. Now, you may remember me saying before that Kodaka said V3 was its own self-contained thing and that the story of Hope's Peak Academy had concluded. Given that, you might imagine that anyone playing this game for the first time with that information in mind would be very suspicious of this development, and you absolutely should be. More on that later, however, because now that everyone is inspired to live on and create hope like any good Danganronpa protagonists are, Harukawa points out that she saw Oma in the hangar, and everyone resolves to somehow form a plan to rescue Momota from there tomorrow morning with the electro hammers and an unused bomb. At night, Saihara goes to scout the area and sees the four exosouls patrolling around Monokuma. While they're distracted, he runs to the hangar and is able to communicate with Momota through the window of the bathroom. Saihara tells him about the plan to rescue him and tries to finally speak up to resolve the conflict between them both. Before he can apologize, though, Momota interrupts him, entrusting everything to him, and though he doesn't say so outright, basically tells him not to worry about it anymore in his own way. He says that Saihara is incredible and will surely be able to take care of everyone, concluding with, You might not only reach the truth, but something even beyond it. And don't forget, you're not alone. Don't try to do everything yourself. It's only going to wear you out. When times are hard, you've got to rely on your friends. Grateful for his words and glad to have finally resolved their conflict, Saihara returns to his room for the night. When morning finally arrives, he grabs his electro hammer and goes to the dining hall. Everyone is seemingly prepared, though Harukawa has resolved to bring a knife for herself instead. Kibo also claims to have witnessed a few things on his own, including the green exosol entering the hangar alone, which didn't prompt a reaction from the alarm. Going there, Saihara sees three inactive exosols and no Monokuma in sight, and when they arrive, they use the electro bomb to turn off the alarm. Saihara goes to the pad, noticing that it's all scratched up, but uses the hammer anyway, allowing them all to enter. However, when they do, they are met with a grisly sight of blood seeping from underneath the hydraulic press, with Momota's sleeve sticking out. The body discovery announcement rings out, with Monokuma finally returning to his seat, and the investigation is now afoot. Before we catastrophize, I suppose it's part of our due diligence at this point to investigate, right? And you may be thinking, well, Oma said he was the mastermind, so why should there be a class trial? Well, there are six chapters in this game, and it's called Danganronpa, so you know that there's plenty of crap to be pulled before we can be certain of just about anything. Clues and time are of the essence here, even if everyone is doing poorly, to say the least. The Monokuma file won't even identify the body, and there's pretty much no details beyond what we can see with our own eyes. Harukawa responds that you can't simply fight despair with belief and outright refuses to investigate with Saihara or anyone else, which as cynical as it may be to say, is probably just as well. Now that there's so few people left, solo investigations are probably a safer bet and a better way to cover ground. Although perhaps that itself isn't quite necessary either, as this investigation is even shorter than Chapter 4's. Hell, it's barely even that much longer than the investigation for Chapter 1 of the first game, and I really don't know if that's worth making a judgement call about right this second, seeing as it doesn't determine anything about the case's quality on a surface level, but it's still certainly very surprising for the semi-final chapter of this game. Looking around, one of the first things to notice is an exosol with its hatch open, which can only be disabled by the monocubs unless it could be electronically bypassed, says Monokuma. Certainly worth keeping in mind. Determined to see whose body they're dealing with, Saihara tries to use the control panel to lift the press, but no luck, the panel isn't working, and that's because the power cord is cut. Whoever used this thing made sure the press wouldn't be lifted again once whoever was underneath was smashed flat into a pink paste. And despite the fact that the sensor should reasonably have prevented it from doing so, that's clearly not the case for some reason. Well, we should probably also look into the long, smearing blood stain that was dragged from the bathroom, huh? It leads where you'd expect, but it also gives us a look at some interesting evidence. Namely, three discarded crossbow arrows with blood on them, a bottle of poison, a crossbow, and one of the large black bags that the crossbows from Harukawa's lab were stored in. 
in. There's also the matter of the sleeve sticking out from the press. It sure looks like Momota's, but it has a tiny hole in it, which may be worth keeping in mind. At this point, we need to step out to look elsewhere for clues, which leads us to get Kibo's testimony about what he mentioned seeing earlier, namely that he saw Yumino headed towards the hangar last night with a large black bag, which does seem awfully suspicious. There's also the matter of the strange scratches on the shutter control panel. Down by the inactive exosols, Saihara finds a discarded electro hammer, which seems to be all out of juice, and recalls their strange formation from before, where they were seemingly protecting Monokuma. The bear himself then appears to say he was totally aware of Saihara's surveillance, but claims the exosols wouldn't have attacked him regardless because they were set on a sort of limited autopilot to survey him specifically at the time. He says the person who shared this info with him didn't seem interested in sharing with everyone else, but he has to make things fair by disclosing the necessary details for the trial, then he disappears. In Harukawa's lab, Saihara confirms the weapons Momota took for the other day are all gone, and one of the black crossbow bags is missing as well. In his own lab, he notices less liquid in the bottle of Strike 9 poison, and also several antidotes on the table, but no antidote for Strike 9 itself. Returning to the crime scene, he's roped back to the bathroom by a frantic Kibo who claims to have discovered something. That something is Oma's clothes, which seem to have been flushed down the toilet. Kibo only noticed this because it was clogged in there and didn't appear to be able to flush properly. There's a small hole in the back and on the sleeve similar to the one in the sleeve of Momota's coat, and of course there's blood on it too. Despite all of this investigating, there's still no sign of Oma, and it seems Monokuma doesn't even care because he calls for the trial to begin while disclaiming that everyone needs to be there. Despite being sure that they'll have to see the victim once they arrive, everyone heads to the Shrine of Judgment and is met with no more of an answer than they started with. Descending the elevator, hoping that their worst fears may be proven wrong, they pile into the trial room, which looks extremely similar to the aesthetic of the first trial from the very first game. A pretty sweet visual callback, if we're being honest. Monokuma swears to reveal the survivor once the trial begins, and with that, I think it's about time we finally do just that. As we do, Monokuma ushers us ahead, saying that due to special circumstances, the survivor can't be revealed at this time, so the status of both Oma and Momota will be treated as unknown. Harukawa is pretty insistent that Momota must be the victim, but Saihara, again, wants to be 150% sure before he dooms them all to making that consensus. Oma's clothes in the toilet certainly gives reason to be suspicious about this, of course, and the fact that only Momota's sleeve was sticking out from the press is cause for suspicion as well. While they're arguing over this, Monokuma declares the survivor will now emerge. But that leads to an exosol coming out. At first, Momota's voice is coming from it, which shocks Harukawa, but moments later it begins speaking with Oma's voice instead, and he's got something shocking to put forth for the record, a video camera containing alleged footage of the victim's last moments. The footage seems pretty clear-cut, showing Momota on the press, the press slamming down, and a splash of blood washing over the scene. At that point, it would seem pretty cut and dry, especially because the Exosol claims the footage hasn't been doctored in any way. Monokuma even corroborates this, saying the footage can't be found on any computers here. Saihara isn't totally convinced, though, wondering what Oma would have to gain by killing Momota, since he already revealed himself as the mastermind. To add to the confusion, when Harukawa mentions how Oma won't be able to replicate the game his beloved Junko and Oshima loves so much, he seems not to know who she's even talking about. Giving it some second thought, though, it shouldn't take much to suspect something's wrong with the video. The press had a safety function, which would have stopped if a human was lying down on it, after all. And the evidence from the bathroom points to the possibility that the victim was killed before even being put on the press to begin with. When you take this into account, the similar holes in Momota's sleeve and Oma's sleeve are also very suspect. This seems to agitate Yumino, and the reason should be obvious. The hole was probably made with the crossbow, which was in one of the bags that Kibo saw her carrying to the hangar. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean she was the culprit, though, of course. The crossbow could only fit into the bag if it were disassembled, and Yumino was never taught how to put it together. This means she was probably only bringing it to someone, and indeed she confirms she was asked by Momota to do so, presumably to use it to fight Oma. Once he got his hands on it, it's easy to suspect that he shot Oma, but Harukawa argues it doesn't matter because they already know the final result. Monokuma begs to differ, though, and the person in the Exosol once again speaks like Momota, confirming that the mech has a voice synthesizer, making it truly impossible to tell who's writing inside. What we have here, essentially, is Schrodinger's culprit. The Exosol contains either a living Momota or Oma, but until you open it up, you can't truly be sure one way or the other of who it is, and that makes it impossible to deny the life or death status of either. God, V3 really does feel like it's trying to do its best Umineko impression sometimes. Needless to say, this leads to a pretty healthy split of opinions, especially when Saihara becomes just as convinced as Harukawa that Momota is in truth already dead. 
Then again, there's still a problem here. Yumino claims she only brought a single arrow to be used, but there were three on the ground at the scene. There's no reason for Oma to keep crossbow arrows on hand if he didn't even have one with him, so where did the extra two come from? They would have to come from a third party, right? That begs the question of how they got inside, though, and given the evidence we have, it seems like only one thing could be possible. They could steal one of the patrolling exosols by using an electro hammer on it, and the only person who was unable to use their electro hammer in the morning was Harukawa. Despite admitting to sneaking in, she still fiercely argues against being labeled as the culprit, saying the wounds made by the crossbow would be in no way fatal. That's where the poison comes in, though. If you had soaked the tips of the arrows in it, you could definitely kill someone with them. She's talked about making sacrifices to take down the remnants of despair lately, and if the sacrifice is everyone's lives, that would work out quite well for her. Saihara wants to reach beyond even this truth, however. He thinks there's something more to it, and he even relays Momota's words of encouragement to Harukawa herself. She seems glad that they were actually able to reconcile with each other and softens, deciding to testify as to what happened from her perspective. Everything was as expected, but when she broke into the hangar, Momota and Oma were fighting. When they froze in shock, she shot Oma with an arrow in the back that was coated with poison. She tried to make him confess to everything, but as she was about to shoot him with a second poison arrow, something unexpected happened. Not wanting Harukawa to become a killer again, to return to her life of hardship and endure the pressure of the killing game in return, Momota jumped in the way, getting poisoned himself. She panicked, running from the hangar to grab the appropriate antidote, but when she returned, the hangar was closed. She went to the bathroom window to hand it over instead, but witnessed Oma steal the antidote and seemingly drink it. She tried to break back in, badgering her knife against a security pad, but nothing worked. Having been convinced that Momota's death was her fault, she decided to mislead everyone so they could exchange their lives to take down Oma for good. Saihara, once again, isn't fully convinced, though. Too many details have slipped through the cracks this way. After all, the alarm should have gone off when Harukawa got near the shutter, and if it didn't, there must be a reason for that. So what if Oma used the electrobomb in his possession? But why would he do that? Well, perhaps to disable the safety sensor on the hydraulic press, since it doesn't quite seem possible to tell who got smushed. And Monokuma seems suspiciously nervous about this fact. That's when it becomes clear. Even Monokuma doesn't know who the culprit is, and that's the point. Oma wanted to craft a murder that Monokuma couldn't figure out, and though Saihara still doesn't know what specifically is being used to do so, he suspects that with all Monokuma seems to know about the murders regularly, that he must have some sort of method of surveillance in place. The electrobomb would scramble said surveillance, and the exosols circling Monokuma were not aiding him, they were watching him to ensure that he couldn't interfere or find out what was going on. But why would this be necessary? Well, put simply, Oma lied yet again about being the mastermind, and this whole thing has been a setup to prevent Monokuma from being able to run a fair trial, to undermine the killing game itself. Monokuma himself even confirms flat out that Oma is not the one in control of him, and that though his story about the outside world was very close, he was only speculating, and the remote he used to control the exosols was actually created by Iruma for the purpose of hijacking them. This allowed Oma to slide into the mastermind seed and derail the proceedings, and Monokuma seems to be getting a bit squirmy about this now. As the person in the exosol declares that Monokuma will now be forced to participate himself, he also declares that this is a challenge to deceive Monokuma to the end, and defeat defeat the game. Trying to appeal to the kids' search for the truth, Monokuma talks them up and starts leading the conversation for a bit. This leads to some questioning about the motive behind filming the crime video to begin with, and this could only have been done for the sake of convincing everyone to think the wrong victim was killed. How could this be done, though, if the video wasn't doctored? Well, it's much simpler than a fancy editing trick. It's literally just a pause button. The hydraulic press has a force stop button, and if someone were to let the press lower, press that, and the camera's pause button at the same time, then swap out the victim, you could rather seamlessly make this look like it was the case. This also explains why there was a strange pause in the video before the press fully went down, as this is where the pause in the footage occurred. The strange camera angle is covered by this too, since it would have to be within reach of the control panel. The idea that a previously killed body could be used again, gee, I wonder where that comes from, is briefly entertained, but Monokuma confirms that this would never have been done, and even if it were, it's likely he would have noticed much sooner. More crucially, it's important to realize all of this coordination would mean the killer and the victim were in cahoots to make this happen. The victim had to have been willing, especially if the goal was ultimately to confuse Monokuma. This would leave only Momota as the true culprit, but even so, Harukawa isn't convinced that this is the case, because she saw Oma drink the antidote, or at the very least, she's trying to protect Momota. But when you really think about it, how could Harukawa confirm this from the narrow window view, that that's what actually happened? 
No, Oma didn't drink the antidote, he only pretended to. It was all part of the trick and Harukawa made a good witness for it. Pretending to drink it and then giving it to Momota afterward was the perfect leverage Oma would need to get Momota to cooperate with his plan, since it's difficult to imagine he would willingly do so otherwise, and not complying would end with his death and Harukawa's conviction. This is where it all starts to come together. With support coerced from Momota, Oma set his plan into motion, swapped out with Momota when the press was lowered, and then finished his master plan to bamboozle Monokuma by letting Momota squash him like a bug under the press. Afterward, Momota pulled the power plug, flushed Oma's clothes, and climbed inside of the depowered Exosol to hide, successfully putting a lid on this crime's cat box. But trusting in Momota's judgment, Saihara throws one last curveball by lying to Monokuma. He claims that he saw Oma during the investigation and was threatened to be silent or else everyone would be killed, and he urges everyone to vote for Oma. Monokuma calls his bluff, saying that everyone will still be killed if they get the answer wrong, but Momota won't let them throw it for his sake. He finally emerges from the Exosol, content to let the trial end. As the votes reluctantly roll in for Momota, he begins to tell all. Just as suspected, Oma gave Momota the antidote, and while still poisoned himself, used the situation as leverage to get him to go along with the plan. He even tells Momota that the garden message and the way he screwed over Gokuhara were all ways he had prepped them to accept his claim that he was the mastermind, but as much as he would have liked that to be the ultimate derailment of the game, it didn't turn out that way. When Momota asks Oma why he did all of this, he confesses, with an uncharacteristically grim and serious expression, that he wanted to end this game all along, and that the reason it started back up, he's certain, is because the mastermind instigated it, did something to influence Harukawa's actions. She claims she did so because she remembered Hope's Peak Academy and the remnants of despair, which she thought Oma was a part of, and Saihara claims that perhaps that's precisely what the mastermind wanted from her. Though Momota didn't totally understand the plan, he saw Oma's determination and uncharacteristic honesty in him that had never compelled Momota to believe him before. And so he decided to go along, but he had to ask, why would Monokuma care if he messed up the ruling? By Oma's estimation, it's because he's such a stickler for the rules, but more importantly, it's that this adherence to the rules, even to his own disadvantage, implies something about the killing game itself, which is that someone has to be watching it. Without an audience, Monokuma wouldn't care about playing by the rules, which also implies something must be wrong about the story they've been fed, about the apocalypse and being all that's left of humanity. A death game is made to be watched, so who's the audience? The other reason Momota agreed to this is because if it actually ruined the game, it would be his only option left. By his own admission, he's out of time, as he finally fesses up to the illness that's been plaguing him, which he sure is just a short bit shy of killing him. Seeing as even talking like this is pushing him to the brink of his energy. He says that in his memories, he was fine during the medical exam for his training, so this doesn't add up. And though Monokuma tries to briefly spin something about how the meteorite virus may have been dormant during his induction into the Gopher Project, something about that seems awfully convenient. Not that it matters right now, he's still going to die either way. Saying he knew Saihara would figure out the plan regardless, he praises him for his skills and says that even if this didn't end up working out as planned, it still must have revealed some hidden truth that will become important, so it can't have gone to waste. And speaking of hidden truths, he offers up one last explanation for Oma's actions, that being that at the very end, he claimed that he never enjoyed this game. He lied about that too. He lied to himself to survive and keep himself upright and make it to this moment, where he could ruin it for the person in charge and for the people taking pleasure in it. Momota wonders too if this was a lie, but Kibo responds that he isn't sure. Would Oma have a reason to lie right at the end of his life? Even though, at the very end, I don't really understand Oma-kun, says Saihara. But maybe that's what lying is all about. The truth is in the eye of the beholder, huh? Oma-kun was the very embodiment of a lie. In the spirit of such honesty, Momota finally apologizes outright to Saihara as well. To be honest, I was jealous of you. Jealous? Because you were always saving us, you know? Your detective skills kept us alive. You were just way too cool, and I got frustrated. So that's why I was so harsh on you. My bad. Hey, no, Momotakun, that's not true. I was only so confident because you were there for me, Momotakun. When you made me your sidekick, you said that you'd take the responsibility. And that... that's why I can do all this. 
Before their heartfelt conversation can continue, though, death is catching up to Momota in two ways. As his disease tears at him, his execution also looms large. And as Monokuma opines about how everyone would be filled with hope if life could be recycled, he brings back all of the Monocubs. Or, well, at least replaced Monocubs who have no continuity of memory from earlier in the game. This also means the Exosouls are back in play, and the students can't oppose the execution. Harukawa still tries, though, beginning to cry as she seethes with anger admitting that she's never been given a nickname before. She's never met someone so stubborn before. She's never fallen in love before, and she's not ready to go back to living without that. But Momota won't let her throw her life away, too. Hey, Makiro, I asked you before, what's your enemy? Before, you hated yourself so much you didn't even like yourself a little. And wasn't that the reason you tried to distance yourself from others? You decided that you didn't deserve to have any friends, didn't you? That was your enemy. Not anymore, huh? You're all right now. You fell for a guy like me. Now you can learn to like yourself. As Harukawa weeps bitterly, Momota asks everyone to send him off with a smile and promises himself to go out with a bang. Don't forget, he says, the impossible is possible. All you gotta do is make it so. The punishment begins, and it's a huge visual callback to the very first one of the series, that of Jin Kirigiri from the intro of Danganronpa 1. It's a brilliant replication which sends the rocket drilling below ground just to pop back out on the other side of the earth, flying back through the sky, then falling back down through the hole. As fanciful as Monokuma would like his execution to be though, Momota gains one last victory. His illness kills him first. As the execution fails, the rocket plummets back through, knocking off Kibo's cowlick as he jumps to everyone's defense, and as the rocket falls to its side and exposes the body, Monokuma seethes with anger as Kaito Momota, though dead, managed to get away. God, this is honestly a really awesome moment. As Kibo stays strangely silent, his eyes static, Saihara vows to end the killing game once and for all, but Monokuma claims that a mere participant is never going to be capable, flashing a surprise flashback light in everyone's eyes, which seems to briefly throw them off balance. It doesn't seem to bring anything back to them immediately, but Monokuma simply says they'll remember soon, that despair is the only choice they have. Claiming that the killing game will never end, he flees, and as everyone trods back to their room, we are left with one final visual, a mysterious mother brain like Monokuma in a glass glass dome hooked to many wires. A mysterious voice claims that the killing game will continue forever, and a familiarly fashionable silhouette stands in the dark to concur. As long as it's fun, we have to keep doing it. That's just simple supply and demand. Such despair. Outside, Saihara tries to apologize to Harukawa, but she doesn't admonish him. She just asks if he feels lonely, and when he admits that he feels lonely and lost, she says she feels the same, but that she's also grateful to Momota, and would prefer to move forward with that feeling instead, to show her gratitude. And Saihara can agree. Yumino and Shiragane exit, asking if they can join training with the two as well, and they all group together, Saihara thanking Momota as he remembers their brief time together, and vows to live alongside his friends, for the memory of the dead as well. Seeing Kibo somewhere alone, he talks to himself about how he can no longer hear his inner voice that guides his decisions. Promising to end everything, he augments himself with upgrades from his lab, flies into the air, and begins to destroy the academy. Down to five survivors, chapter five ends. So, chapter five, huh? This is a pretty big one, and it's a big highlight of the game for most people. I can certainly see why, and I appreciate a lot of what it has going for it. That said, I don't think it's entirely without its flaws, and we should probably go ahead and talk about some of those to get them out of the way. This is also very much going to contain some localization discussion, so let's get my complaints that are focused on the actual game out of the way first before touching on things that are only faults in an adaptational sense. So to start us off, I honestly am a little underwhelmed with most of the trial itself here. And don't get me wrong, the actual setup itself, the character drama weaved throughout it, and especially Especially a lot of the Momota and Oma content here, chef's kiss, great stuff. But the actual mystery itself felt a little bit lacking to me. I think this is sort of a double-edged sword in a way, because it's not entirely fair to expect them to do something way more complicated, given that both of them were on a poisonous time limit and had to be able to carry this out in a way that would definitely trip up Monokuma. But that said, purely from a fun-to-play standpoint, I feel like this case could have stood to be a bit less straightforward. The trial itself certainly goes through many swerves, but the content feels stretched just a bit too thin, if that makes sense. I'm also not really certain that I'm happy with the attempt to reach around and tie all of this back to the previous game's storyline here. I know I previously established that V3 is its own thing, and that this reveal should be sending some red flags our way about the true nature of this plot, so I can't give it too much flack, but it does seem a little 
fanservice-y, I guess, in a way that makes me roll my eyes just a tad. Like, yes, I like Danganronpa. You are now showing me images of characters and moments that I liked from those previous games. But it all just feels a little left field. At no point before this was I ever led to suspect that this plot had pretty much anything to do with Hope's Peak Academy, and I didn't really think it needed to. I was perfectly content with this just existing totally outside that context and doing something new while just so happening to have Monokuma there. And I guess this will be different for everyone, but for me, I just don't think it worked quite as well as intended. It feels like it was supposed to be kind of a hype moment, but to me it was just kind of like, oh, okay, uh, yeah, sure, I guess we can do that. It's kind of like seeing all that cool new art direction in Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach, and then Springtrap is there at the end, and it's like, why? As for actual complaints though, that's pretty much all I've got. I don't think they're totally insubstantial complaints to have, but I also don't think they're really all that deal-breaking, and that's a pretty good sign. However, we do need to talk about some elephants who've been patiently waiting in the room for a while now. So first, let's start with something that's a bit more chapter-specific that NISA botched. In this chapter, they introduced several fixes to CGs present in the original version of the game in an attempt to make certain things about the case clearer. In most cases, this is done fairly well. This was done to telegraph Oma's bleeding from his crossbow injuries, which, yeah, would be pretty important. This, however, was also fixed in the CG of the Moment of Death video, and something else was changed in the process of this fix, namely the position of Momota's arm. Here is the original CG, and here's the NISA one. Now, props to give, NISA did add the blood and hole in the sleeve, good fixes. The position of the arm, though, that shouldn't have been done. The whole point of the plan is that when the press lowered enough, it would completely cover his body, so he shouldn't be sticking it out like that. This begs the question of how the two could have even switched if Momota Oma's arm was visible the whole time before the video was paused, because uh, did Oma line his arm up perfectly for the shot? Did his arm suddenly grow to be as long as Momota's was for that purpose? That just isn't possible, chief. Also, Oma's clothes were flushed, so he wasn't wearing a shirt anyway. If his arm were visible under the press, you'd just see a naked arm, not a clothed one. Again, it was a nice gesture, they wanted to fix a continuity issue to make the case more easy to follow for players, but this actually makes things way worse and way harder to figure out, and this is present in all English versions of the game, so it's not even like it's an optional thing that you can change out somehow. But now we gotta pull out the big guns, the localization demons that have really been looming in the background. Let's talk about Momota for a second. Now, let me go ahead and get my basic opinion of the guy out of the way first. I think Kaito Momota is a pretty good character. He's stubborn and hot-headed, often to a fault, but he's got a kind-hearted attitude and unwavering belief, sometimes to his own detriment, true, but admirably firm nonetheless, and he genuinely does care a lot about the people he so chooses. He's surprisingly straightforward in a refreshingly honest way, and while he can sometimes put his foot in his mouth because of this, he often uses it to get to the root of what troubles people and inspires them to become better. His romance plot with Harukawa like I said, is a bit milk toast for me, but he still genuinely is lovely to her, and I can honestly see why she would care for him so much. The fact that they successfully convinced me of that in such a short time that they had together is proof enough that there is something to his character that I'm not just imagining, at least to my own sentiments. Barring his haircut, though, there are a couple of problems here that have gone unaddressed, and that is because the game's localization largely chooses to ignore it. So, I'm gonna come out and say it. Momota is, like, really homophobic in the game's original script. He reacts with abject terror and disgust to the mere idea of guys liking guys. In one of the extra mode scenes, he becomes terrified of Saihara for even the momentary suspicion that he could swing that way, quote-unquote. And as I previously established, he uses a specific slur in Chapter 3, which is consistently used in Japan to demean both gay men and trans women. This is not great, but while that would be plenty enough to complain about on its own, there's also the complicated factor of how NISA handles this, which is to say they mostly don't. A lot of Momota's more sharp dialogue of this variety, including other instances of him being pretty damn misogynistic, are softened up for the localization and made more palatable. His line about swinging that way in the extra mode is kept largely the same, but many other examples of this kind of thing are all but erased by way of making them sound far less incendiary. And I know what you may be thinking right now, isn't that a good thing? Like, you wouldn't want him to be homophobic or saying slurs, right? And no. 
I would not. I am perfectly fine with not hearing slurs from characters that I'm supposed to like, but I do think that softening those edges without looking for any way to replace them with something at least similarly obnoxious is going to inevitably create a different impression of the character. When you have people in your English-speaking audience actively confused as to why anyone would think Momota has flaws beyond just being stubborn, this to me creates a bit of a rose-tinted look at the character. He comes off way more idealized in one version of the game than another, and while obviously individual people will have differences of opinion, I think if these changes result in the character giving off a way different impression to one specific audience at large, that something has been missed along the way. It's for this reason that I'm honestly really mixed on Momota, and I hate that. Localization Momota is a way nicer guy, but I'm here to evaluate these games on the merits of their original intents and scripts, and so to me, Momota is a guy who has a lot of very likable qualities and several that make him someone I'd never want to hang out with. And there's something a little sad about that, but I'll let you parse those feelings as you wish. Now, as for Oma, I'd really like to unpack him a little bit more here too, but there's one important piece of context we're still missing right now, which will be addressed pretty shortly into Chapter 6. This also happens to coincide with another localization error, so fun stuff, but let's save that for when it comes up. I know I've been teasing you all a lot when it comes to my full opinions on Oma, but I promise we are very nearly there and I won't make you wait until the end of Chapter 6 to go on that ramble. It will happen when our evidence comes together, just as the final clue is all it takes to get Monokuma off that damn phone and convene a class trial. Now, let's talk about the good here. Oh my goodness, this chapter's atmosphere is great. It starts a little slow, admittedly, but once it gets going, it really does not let up. The formulation of the plan, Oma reappearing in the gym, the siege on the death road of despair, those are all great. The latter, in particular, feels like a really smart and cathartic reincorporation of previous game mechanics, as we can feel the growth of our characters and the weight of their efforts when we're able to take this platforming nightmare to task. I want to be the guy? No, I have surpassed the guy. And that just makes it all the more of a total gut punch when you reach that hatch, realize you're here too soon for this to make sense, and then get blasted by the reveal of it being an airlock. The outside world, presumably, is hellish, and everyone's reactions to it are damn near bone-chilling. I still think some of the more dramatic sprite work in V3 can be a little messy at the best of times, but these downright horrified expressions really sell the absolute emotional devastation that the cast is being put through, to the point that I was actually surprised when they were able to pick themselves back up. I don't think I was ever truly as convinced by Oma's mastermind act as the rest of the cast was, because it would have been way too obvious and too early for that to be the case, but nevertheless, he makes a pretty damn good final performance here. He's still enough of a total slimeball that at his worst, he's affably evil and fun to hate, but then he has to go and make things complicated by having some nuance toward the end. Again, we'll get more into this later, but I think choosing to make Oma's final moments just slightly less ambiguous than most of his previous actions was the right call. It adds depth to its character, to imagine that in reality he really was trying as best as he could to stop the killing in any way possible. His methods are disagreeable, to put it very lightly. But Danganronpa has always and eternally sought to find the light in the dark with these types of things, and if we can understand the motives of so many others, maybe we can understand Oma's too, even if we may not necessarily like him for it. At this point of the narrative, Oma is his own cat box of sorts, a liar to the end whose honest feelings are difficult to parse from his tricks, and that is partly the entire point that I think he embodies. When Oma asked earlier whether lies were a completely good or bad thing, I think that's a question really worth considering the answer to seriously. After all, telling a child that Santa Claus is real is a lie, but what does that lie service? If it was meant to cruelly sweep the rug out from under them and ridicule them, then I suppose that lie would be tasteless. But if it were meant to add magic to their life and make it better, even if for a short while, would that be wrong? We all lie sometimes. What are your lies in service of? Do they hurt people or do they help them? Well, I guess it's something worth thinking about anyway. And, of course, as much flack as I just had to give him, Momota pulls out a pretty excellent show at the end here. His early death as a final middle finger to Monokuma is easily one of my favorite moments in this entire game, and that will always bear repeating. The culmination of both the conflict and genuine love between Saihara, Momota, and Harukawa is as heartwarming as it is devastating, and it reminds me of how much I genuinely care about this trio. Their relationships are sort of the emotional core of the game to me, and while I know that this isn't the send-off they'd probably prefer, were it up to them, I think it is a fitting one. What is a star if not something that shines overhead and provides light to those who previously wandered in complete darkness? They'll find their way. Momota already knew that. He ensured it. 
And of course, let's comment on Junko Enoshima. Oh my god, Junko freaking Enoshima yet again. I honestly rolled my eyes pretty hard at this. Obviously, there's more going on here than meets the eye at first glance, but seriously, I love Junko Enoshima as a character in Danganronpa 1 and SDR 2, but by that point, she had already been done to death. She was wholly unnecessary in Danganronpa 3, and her presence in Ultra Despair Girls was made better for the fact that she was only a looming element of backstory, rather than having any actual involvement in the plot we were seeing on screen beyond her lingering influence. She does not need to be trotted back out. She is officially worn out. I am sick of her. We need to see other people. This relationship is a sham. As for Kibo's big explodey event horizon, well, no need to speculate about it when we're already so close to talking about it anyway, right? Chapter 5 is not actually the strongest in the game in my opinion, but what is strong about it is incredibly so. I think it kind of overstays its welcome in the end, and the actual mystery aspect of the chapter is far and away its weakest aspect for me. In terms of what it brings to the table with emotional weight, catharsis, and character drama though, it is pretty damn top notch. The idea of a catbox murder to bamboozle Monokuma is incredibly inventive, and even if the plan itself wasn't the most interesting to me, I find the concept to be at least worth commending. The characters were pushed to some extreme places here which I found deeply compelling, and the surrounding context of what they were up against more than sold it, even if it could have been rounded out a bit more. It is certainly not the perfect chapter, and I do generally prefer the chapter 5s of the previous games over this one, but that does not make it a bad chapter by any means, and its highlights really shine. This is a pretty decent note to lead us into the final stretch of the game, and who buddy, if you're looking for the breaks, you're not gonna find them. Kodaka is going full throttle and we're in the backseat, and whether we gloriously past the finish line or slam into a wall and explode, we're just gonna have to buckle up and find out. We begin the end with a boy named Makoto. No, not that one. Who's a painfully average kid who probably wishes he shared more than a haircut with Mob. His life kinda sucks, but there's something on his damn phone that apparently gives him strength, inspiration, and something to obsess over. Before we can figure out what that is though, we have to get back to everyone screaming in terror while Kibo blows everything to smithereens. They run out to the middle of the courtyard to try to flag him down, and fortunately this works, but he's still pretty straight-faced. This is apparently his way of ending the killing game, but considering the danger, Saihara pleads that there should be a way for them to figure out the secrets of the academy and end the game a different way, while not blowing themselves up. Kibo is skeptical of that possibility, given everything that they've learned, but he decides to give everyone until dawn to find the proof that they need. Why dawn, though? Well, because Monokuma isn't exactly happy about this blowing up the school business, and has called in the Exocils to fight the newly improved Kibo themselves. The robot can stave them off for a while without nuking everything, but he can only do so for so long. So we're on a timer, and when I say a timer, I do mean that quite literally. There is an actual timer counting down on top of the screen during the investigation, and while while this does seem to pause during dialogue, you really can't afford to waste time looking at crap that isn't important. You need to get a move on, so... Yeah, I got you, I'll be there in just a second. Considering a giant hole has been made in the floor of the main room, this is probably as good an opportunity to get started as any, right? Running into the tunnel, we also see debris with numbers on it. You can use the smack function to move it away so long as you have enough bonding points with your friends, which you'll acquire over the course of helping each other during the investigation, which helps you figure out what areas you should tackle in which order. Inside the tunnel is Ulma's unopened lab, which has a crack in the door from all the damage. Inside, we find a lot of silly prank items, childish set pieces which might resemble what a kid would think an evil leader should have, and even a complete history of Hope's Peak Academy. While looking at it though, Saihara feels like something is wrong, and when Harukawa enters the room, he asks her to walk and talk with him about everything she remembers concerning Hope's Peak. Doing so, she pretty much briefly recaps what we all know, attributing the entire tragedy to Junko Enoshima and describing the first killing game and her subsequent defeat. She also mentions the following war between the Remnants and the Future Foundation, the rebuilt school, their scouting of students, and other such things. Saihara is perplexed, noting that something about the book he read is inconsistent with his and Harukawa's own memory. At that moment, they are both hit with the late lingering effects of the last flashback light they were shown, and in Saihara's, he sees a boy approaching him as he sits alone on a bench. The boy asks if he's one of the members of the Gopher Project, and he denies it all, talking about how the members died and how the Earth can't be saved. The child says that they're all heroes who will save the world, and though Saihara seems to want to tell him the true nature of the project, he can't bring himself to explain. 
Harukawa says she remembered something very similar, and both of them had to find more clues in Oma's dorm room. There, there's tons of files, blueprints for inventions for Iruma to make, a conspiracy board, and pieces of evidence from past trials that he's stolen. Most importantly, though, is his motive video, and that is exactly the last puzzle piece I was waiting to collect before I could fully talk about him, because it is pretty crucial in understanding Oma's whole deal. In it, we learn that the organization he was a part of was not in fact the Remnants of Despair, but DICE, an organization that he ran. The organization itself was only guilty of petty, nonviolent crimes and harmless pranks, and their ranks were also very thin. And here we go again. This is kind of a huge localization issue, which not only really harms this reveal, but also makes a bit of the trial later much more difficult. In the original script of the game, they specify here that the act of murder specifically was a taboo act for DICE, something that they never allowed and hated more than anything, and Oma made those rules himself. This is not explicitly mentioned at all in the English script for whatever reason, and I feel like this is a pretty crucial distinction to bring up, because it finally allows us to start unpacking a lot of what his deal has been. If Oma remained a mystery in Chapter 5, he has been cracked wide open here. It's still difficult to tell which of his individual statements were truthful or not a lot of the time, but his core and driving motivations are now crystal clear. He really did want to end the killing game. His claim of loving people's suffering in the game itself back in Chapter 4, it was all a huge bluff. And honestly, that really does make me question whether or not he really didn't truly care about Gokuhara's death for that matter. It was better for his plan at that point to pretend he didn't either way, to sell his image as the mastermind, and again, while his actions during the chapter itself are far from good or excusable, it's easy to see the circumstances he created for himself creeping up around him and forcing him to do what he did to avoid getting his own hands dirty directly, so that he could survive and continue trying to stop the mastermind. In this respect, the finale of his free time events becomes a lot more poignant in retrospect. Saihara says Oma would never allow himself to be reached, would never hold out his hand. This was his biggest downfall, I'd say. There's no doubt that if he had communicated sooner, he probably would have lost a lot of tactical edge against the Mastermind. Hell, even if Iruma had stayed totally calm and made all the inventions he could want, they'd still inevitably run into the snag of the Mastermind's sabotage when trying to pitch it all to the group. But as much as Iruma's own paranoia backfired on her and caused a rift in her working relationship with Oma, Oma's own paranoia and lack of trust in the others is what necessitated his roundabout methods which so many came to despise him for. To the end, he was a liar who made enemies, but though he posed himself as their greatest foe, he was trying to be their greatest asset. And I do find that a bit complicated. I don't know that I'm his biggest fan or anything, I do honestly find him more interesting on paper than I do when he's actually around because he gets on my nerves way more when he's actually on screen, but he's entertaining, motivated, and not necessarily easy to sort into one camp or the other in terms of good or bad. He persistently avoids categorization by making himself as inscrutable to the notion as possible, and I think in that respect I can see why people take such a strong interest in him. He really was never what he appeared to be at almost any given time, for better or worse. Before we can leave his room though, we also find an envelope labeled This Isn't a Will, which when opened reads the second message is on the wall next to the boiler in the rear garden. Seems we know exactly where to head next then, huh? There, just where Oma's note specified, is something written where some grass used to be, and it says Twins B, which should look somewhat familiar if we consider some other writing Oma has admitted to making. Before we can ponder that too much though, we get another flashback blink, showing us Saihara agreeing to re-enter the Gopher Project to Headmaster Naegi. He asks what the point of surviving to preserve humanity is, and Naegi says that finding that point, that hope, is what they'll do. Just then, Kibo crashes in through the ceiling, still mid-fight with the Exosols, having seen a blink of a similar sort himself. Saihara says he still needs to enter some blocked-off areas like Amami's lab, and Kibo tells him to meet with him on the respective floor to open it up. It's at this point we get the Kibo gauge mechanic, where we can spam the A button when we are caught by an Exosol to fill it up and have Kibo come to our rescue to clear the way. Getting his help as promised to finally access Amami's lab, we enter and find quite a few strange things with Yumino in tow. There's two giant vault doors with astrological signs on the dials, whose combinations should be obvious by now. Horse A, Twins B. Opening it gives us access to a thumb drive, which when inserted into the empty laptop on the table, gives us the mysterious video of Amami we saw earlier in the game. Though this time, it's not cut up. 
From the full video, we learned that Amami was in fact the super high school level survivor, someone who apparently participated in another killing game and made it to the end, that had his memory of this erased. Gaining access to this video was one of the perks he would have gotten for this, while the other is something he supposedly received at the start. You go in, they wipe your memories, and you start killing, he says. That's the way it is. Unable to relay what's significant about the fact that only two survivors can remain, interrupted by a buzzer, Amami ends his message by saying to himself that he wanted this killing game, so he has to win it. Hit with another blink, Saihara sees his old classmates encouraging him before the Gopher Project start, talking about how they look up to him and are proud of him. Exiting the room, Shiragane appears to ask Saihara to come with her to Momoto's lab, where apparently the destruction has caused a strange room to be revealed, and uh, indeed it has. This weird sterile room with pods is proven, by another blink, to be the chamber they were all put into their sleep from, and where they would eventually wake from later. On the desk in the center of the room is a participant list for the project, which Shiragane notes houses a strange secret. On it, it says that Akamatsu had a twin, and Shiragane wonders if this may be foreboding of something bad, considering Junko Enoshima herself had a twin that helped her pull a mastermind reveal. Color me skeptical about that little note, though, and allow me to head back out from here to the basement. In the library, we meet up once again with Harukawa, and she notes something that's been bothering her. An extremely detailed blueprint among the pile Oma had, which seems to be for sucking up bugs, which she seems worried about considering Gokuhara once noted possibly seeing bugs. Having headed to Irima's lab afterwards, she actually found a functional prototype of this machine, which she turns on to try to see if it does anything. It doesn't seem to suck anything up, of course, but it might be worth keeping in mind if Oma found it so apparently important. Deciding to ask for Kibo's help in opening the Mastermind's door, everyone is confronted by an Exosol, which is promptly stopped by Kibo. With the door destroyed, everyone is finally able to enter the hidden door behind the bookshelf, and finds a strangely decorated space with a strange curtain laid over a domed surface. When they remove it, they find the jar-brain Monokuma, which reveals its name to be Mother Kuma. The Mother Kuma's consciousness is connected to all spares of Monokuma and provides its overall AI and personality. Only the Mastermind can get it to make spares, however, and though everyone tells it to give birth, save for Shiragane, who phrases it a bit more delicately, it won't budge. Deciding to ignore it and its insistence that the killing game will never end, they look around for other clues. One of them is a monopad, which claims to be the Survivor's Perk, a complete map of the school which reveals the presence of the hidden door. It also has a hint to end the killing game, left from Amami to himself. It predicts that he'll remember the super high school level hunt, and also says that the mastermind is hiding within the academy. Your best chance of exposing them is when Monokuma needs a spare, it says. At that time, the mastermind will go to the library's hidden room. Seems someone was becoming a bit more inconvenient to the proceedings than he might have initially let on, huh? The pad is covered in a strangely shaped bloodstain, and even more curious than this, there's a shot put ball in the trash can. It has no blood on it, but it does have several pink fibers. Saihara pauses, clutches his chest. He knows how to end this killing game now. Before they leave, Mother Kuma says that the Mastermind won't be found hiding no matter how much they search, but that that person does come to this room quite often. As a last defining statement, it says, It doesn't matter what you do, the killing game will absolutely positively never end. The killing game is a symbol of despair. How can something so fun just end? Another blink arrives just in time to show a Saihara's POV as Monokuma appeared to him after waking from his stasis. Horrified, he tries to ask what's happening, but Monokuma tells him exactly what's about to go down and refuses to elaborate because his memory's about to be wiped anyway. Saying that he plans to shove them all into lockers once they're unconscious, he beams a blackout light into Saihara's eyes, and that's his final missing memory. Dawn inches ever closer, and Yumino promises to stay behind and look here a bit more. On the way out, though, the fight's destruction traps her in the room with rubble, and the gang has no choice but to continue searching given their time limit. Back in the classroom where this all began, Saihara finds a strange stack of desks that Kibo claimed to have seen something strange near when flying by it earlier. By digging underneath all of the desks, Saihara finds what that is, a weird terminal that seems to be for the sake of setting up flashback lights. Something is strange about it, though, as it gives multiple prompts relating to bits of backstory which seem to contradict each other. When all of the memories are chosen, it seems to automatically write something up based on the prompt and spits a flashback light out into the nearby locker. When Yumino enters the room, the classroom automatically reverts to normal, seemingly to obscure its true purpose. Wait, how did she get here exactly? She was just trapped? Well, she clarifies that she found something strange that helped her escape, which is related to the first floor girl's bathroom. They head there and- oh, damn it! And though reluctantly, Saihara enters along with her. 
turns out the mastermind just can't help their Danganronpa 1 references, because in the supply closet of the bathroom, there's a false wall leading to a secret passageway, which isn't even on the Survivor's Perk map. Following it down leads all the way from the bathroom to the hidden bookshelf room, and the damage in the school causes the Mother Kuma to topple and break, giving one last hint that it will only make spares when the designated person says the word birth to it. Outside the bathroom, Harukawa gives us the evil eye for even being in there, but delivers the old pictures of Amami for Saihara to look at, and what it reveals should be pretty obvious by now. Satisfied that he has everything he needs, Saihara exits into the courtyard to call off the fighting between Kibo and the Exosols. Saihara demands that Monokuma give them one last trial, which is not being called by him, but by the class. Promising that the class trial will end the killing game, Saihara stares Monokuma down, vowing to reveal the whole truth. Monokuma, seemingly bored of fighting, concedes, finding the idea very interesting, but he does clarify that if the trial doesn't go Saihara's way, everyone will be executed in retaliation. Though they're nervous, everyone solidifies their resolve, Harukawa smiling and saying she'll just kill Saihara before Monokuma can if everything goes wrong. Kibo takes off his armaments at Monokuma's request, trusting Saihara's resolve, although he is kept back for a moment for that purpose while everyone else goes on ahead. As they arrive at the Shrine of Judgment, they are soon followed by Kibo, who mysteriously has his cowlick back. He seems more level-headed, and seems to feel like his inner voice is back, too. Asking what the device Harukawa has is, he gets the scoop and decides he'll use his magnified vision to see if there are truly no bugs in the device, which gives us our last clue. There actually are tiny nanoscopic monokumas with wings that are holding cameras. Asking what they are at the threat of squishing them, Kibo hears that they are called nanokumas, a hive mind who serve as monokuma's academy-wide surveillance by transmitting footage to him, and therefore assisting the mastermind. This explains why the Electrobomb in Chapter 5 would have prevented Monokuma from seeing who the true culprit of that case was. As the damaged buff Monokuma sinks sadly into the ground with no more water, everyone boards the elevator. Deciding that he too will participate in the end, Monokuma cackles with all of the revived Monokubs by his side, who he also forces to participate in what he calls a pivotal role. He claims that they have to remain interesting and help out, or he'll use the Death Controller to blow them all up one by one, which is actually pretty funny. And the final class trial to expose the truth of everything begins. Oh boy, do we have one doozy of a time ahead of us. So the first question that's on everyone's mind, first and foremost, is probably what the purpose of this trial is going to be. How is Saihara going to get this show on the road? Well, this might be a bit of a surprise since we've never done something like this before, but this is a matter of relitigating a previous case. That case being the very first of this game, wherein Rantaro Amami was killed. The Cubs and Monokuma are both pretty adamant that there's no point to this, as the decision was already made, but Saihara has a counter-argument. There is new evidence to present which wasn't available at the time, which may point to a different conclusion and also screw you. Which would mean that if Monokuma had accepted a false premise before, the entire validity of the killing game itself would be thrown into question. Such a bold declaration has the bear certain that regardless of the result, this line of inquiry will prove interesting, so he gives it a shot. With the new knowledge of Amami's talent, as well as his survivor's perk, Saira is able to deduce several things about his actions, as well as the condition that several things were left in. Having used his perk to head to the library at the time the mastermind would likely be going to the hidden room, everything tracks so far, but whereas we were previously convinced that he was alone there, his survivor perk monopad proves differently. The bloodstain on it is shaped very much like a hand, and the photos taken of him clearly prove why this is. He had it on his person, obviously, and was holding it in a similar way. However, when his body was later searched, the pad was not on his person, meaning the mastermind had to have, oh, Monokid's gone, meaning the mastermind had to have taken it, right into the hidden room which was closing as everyone arrived to the library. Monodom argues that the cameras would have prevented this from working, but Kibo is quick to offer the camera's intervals as a possible exploit for this purpose, and Saihara backs this up, saying that the nanokumas would have been able to provide a constant feed of the library to the mastermind, which would have given them the information they needed to time their plan and carry it out without being caught in the picture. Monokuma finally concedes to having taken the monopad, but not the murder, claiming that since the perk was for Amami's eyes only, it was necessary for him to take it so that it couldn't just be exploited by anyone afterward. But Saihara fires back. The pad also specified that a mastermind was somewhere in the academy, and that, in particular, was info he couldn't let leak out, because it would have encouraged everyone to cooperate, and now, whether he likes it or not, we know that his controller took it. This leads to the big accusation, that Akamatsu was never guilty in the first place, and that the mastermind killed Amami themselves. 
This can be proven through the shot put ball at the scene of the crime, as Sahara found another one in the hidden room's trash can. The reason it had pink fiber on it is because it was the one Akamatsu was planning to use, the one she had stored in her bag, wrapped up in her spare vest. If the ball she had prepared really had killed Amami, it shouldn't have been there, and it should have been covered in blood. This means that it missed its target and that the ball was used for the murder by someone else. Extrapolating from here, it's obvious that the spare ball was taken into the hidden room precisely because the mastermind was behind everything. They had to take Akamatsu's ball to swap in their own and make it look as though Akamatsu herself was guilty. Oh, there goes Monodam. So then, why did this happen? Well, recall that the time limit, which dictated that if no one was killed, everyone forced to participate would be annihilated, was fast approaching. If the ball missed, this would mean that nobody was killed and everyone would be wiped out. The mastermind wanting to ensure that a killing game would happen no matter what, would have wanted a contingency waiting in the wings in case of an emergency like this. And what better way to frame someone, save their own skin, and in the process guarantee the game would continue? That's right, their own self-imposed time limit made the mastermind desperate not to bore whoever it is they're intent on showing this game to, and they fudged the rules for that sole purpose. Given that Akamatsu was then executed for the crime she didn't commit, and Monokuma allowed it with no intervention, Saihara argues that the game is patently unfair and has no legs of legitimacy left to stand on. So who is the mastermind? Well, Shirogane once again brings up the Akamatsu's twin theory, but like I said before, there's something pretty fishy about this. An additional person in the academy would face a lot of risks when going to and from places, yet the Mother Kuma claimed that the mastermind, quote, comes to this room very often, meaning they'd be out of it just as much. If they really were hiding, and yeah, if they were a twin of Akamatsu's, they'd really have to be hiding, she died in the first chapter after all, then this would be an unnecessary amount of risk. The mastermind is much more likely someone who is already a part of the group, who would have very little trouble blending in. This is also supported by the flashback light room being set up in a totally normal classroom and set up automatically to camouflage itself if someone walks into it. Yumino is hesitant to believe that one of their precious friends could really be the mastermind, and Kibo offers that maybe one of the dead students could have had their death faked, again calling echoes of Mukuro Ikusaba to mind. Saihara has a much better method of narrowing things down though, going back through everyone's alibis for Amami's murder. At the time of the first trial, many of these things would have seemed fairly solid or otherwise mundane, but with the extended knowledge we have now, would something else jump out at us? Well, Yumino was in the game room, as was Harukawa, and multiple others were there as well. Kibo reiterates that his alibi is weak since he was alone in his dorm room, but claims he's not responsible regardless. That leads us back to Shirogane, who was in the dining hall with Shinguji and Iruma, but briefly stepped away to go to the girl's bathroom. Wait. Wait a second. Wait a damn second. Oh my god. Yeah, what exactly is in that bathroom, huh? What did we find in there? What would make it awfully convenient for you to be able to travel to the library through it and perhaps return completely without incident? Yes, it would be entirely possible for Shirogane to be the one who utilized the hidden passage, which wouldn't just make her the culprit behind Amami's murder, but the mastermind of the entire game. While she tries briefly to throw either Kibo or Hoshi under the bus as well, Saihara coldly responds that she never mentioned seeing them near or in the bathroom before and she can't just change her story now when it suits her. The tension becomes palpable, Yumino falling silent, Harukawa demanding that Shirogane speak to properly defend herself. The cubs, desperate not to be blown to smithereens, throw their full weight behind the argument while begging Saihara to back down. But how many pleas have they ignored until now? Though they try to argue that there's no proof, we are once again brought back to Mother Kuma, who told us that a spare could only be created when the mastermind tells it to give birth. Everyone present in the room told it to give birth in those exact words before, but Shirogane specifically avoided using those words when urging the same thing. She knew that if she said the same words, it would have followed her orders. Even Saihara is now pleading with Shirogane to prove herself innocent if she really can. Oh, bye, Monosuke. Anyway, with one last review of the facts, it seems ever more certain that she's constructed her own coffin around her, like the bars of a birdcage chipped away and exposing the hellish vacuum of reality beyond its perimeter. All she even has to say for herself is that it's always Junko Enoshima who turned out to be the mastermind, so even if she's dead, why shouldn't it be again? Why shouldn't it be again? With the remaining cubs exploding, with the fog rolling in, she arrives. Junko Enoshima, the 53rd, arrives. And this is where everything goes completely off the rails. Sumugi Shirigane was nothing more than a construct, a cover for the mastermind, or at least that's what she claims. The 53rd definitely implies something strange, and seeing as she calls herself a perfect reproduction of Junko, it's easy to see that all is not right here. 
What exactly does this reveal imply? What uncomfortable truths are we now poised to stop overlooking? Well, certainly this ridiculous narrative about apocalypse, meteors, and especially being the last human beings alive. This is no retread for the sake of reproduction, like Shiragane seems to want to claim, because we already have pretty reliable proof that things haven't been as they seemed for a while now. First of all, there's the history of Hope's Peak that Saihara found, which is incongruent with how everyone remembers the past. Everyone seems to agree on the idea that Jinko Enoshima was single-handedly responsible for the tragedy and only recall her followers coming into the picture later, when their war with the Future Foundation began. But recall, we already know that this isn't the case. We know a very influential set of characters who were involved in helping Junko bring the world to its knees, so calling her the sole culprit of the tragedy would be seriously exaggerating, wouldn't it? This is the truth that the book presents, which was enough to get Saihara to challenge what he remembered. Furthermore, though everyone remembers Junko trapping Class 78 for the first killing game, the book recalls what Shiragane neglected to scrounge the wiki for, that the class locked themselves in but just had their memories of doing so erased. And of course, everyone remembers applying to Hope's Peak, but Hope's Peak only ever scouted their students. This is where things get really weird. Why would Amami call himself a participant of a previous killing game if he wasn't in the previous ones that we know of? Why would Shiragane insist that Oma is a remnant of despair when we know for a fact that he was a member of DICE, a group that was adamantly against committing murder? You can see why leaving that detail out in the English script makes it a little weird when Saihara claims this later. Why would all of these mixed memories surface only after seeing the flashback lights? Well, what if the flashback lights were wrong? They were alleged to recover people's memories, but the classroom for constructing them makes it pretty clear with a little consideration what they were actually being used for. The lights implant false memories, create them for the sake of creating a narrative. Remember how Oma said before that somehow the mastermind was able to nudge Harukawa in the direction of killing him? Remember why she did that? Because she remembered he was a remnant of despair, even if it wasn't true. And who was able to coincidentally find things during the investigation? Who would have been able to coincidentally leave a new flashback light on the dining room table that morning before the incident? Shiragane could. It would have been far too easy. So this is the final domino tip. Everything everyone was made to remember was false. They were lies. None of them were even Hope's Peak students to begin with. Motivation drives a story, says Shiragane. That's the only reason any of these things existed in the first place. These memories set the structure for how those characters would act, would think, would behave. So then, who is Shiragane really? If this really has nothing to do with Hope's Peak, with Junko's will, with the Future Foundation, or Remnants of Despair, then who is she? And why is she doing all of this? She then begins to outline what might be the biggest twist in any of these games to date, and she does so by cosplaying as pretty much every character across the casts of both Danganronpa 1 and 2. It certainly comes as a shock. I mean, every few sentences she changes her voice and appearance. I can imagine to some that this might seem a bit disorienting. And maybe the cameos might seem a little cheap. But it is pretty fun when you consider all the build-up that brought us here. Still, dealing with this shtick for another hour seems like it would be a bit tiring. It's a good thing we don't have to do something like that in this video, right? What? It should become pretty obvious what this flurry of cosplay implies, though. And no, it's not just that Shiragane doesn't care about Ultra Despair Girls or DR3. Seriously, not a single cosplay of one of those characters transparent much? No, it's that superbly convenient specification we received about her cosplay all those chapters ago. She only has the ability to cosplay fictional characters. You remember how I've kept stressing over and over again that V3 is in a separate continuity than those prior games? Well, this is why. Because in the world of V3, the entire Danganronpa series prior to this was a fictional story, presented to the masses in the exact same way it was presented to people in our, the audience's, reality. And boy oh boy was this twist divisive. I'll get more into my thoughts and feelings about it individually in the post-trial of course, but I do think right off the bat that this twist was bound to upset a lot more of the English audience, simply because of NISA's failure to convey this delineation between this game and the main series, particularly with how the title was changed. This is why I think the new was really important to maintain, because it makes it clear, even without Kodaka here to make clarifying statements, that this game was something different. Could it have stood to be a bit more transparent? Sure, but I feel like a lot of people react very strongly to this, in that they assume it's invalidating the entire story of the franchise as a whole in one fell swoop. That's not the case, though. Within the stories of Danganronpa 1, 2, 0, Ultra Despair Girls, and even the DR3 anime, 
the Hope's Peak saga, as it were, were all contained in one narrative that existed in the same continuity. And in that continuity, those events were true. In the continuity V3 takes place in, a completely alternate world, Danganronpa is a series that people enjoy, and some people were made to believe for a time that it was real, when in reality it was not. Therefore, it was a lie. These two things can, however, coexist, because they don't cross over with each other. They don't exist in the same continuity. So while the events are made up in one instance, this doesn't hold true for the other. I hope this can uh, clear up some confusion and get some people to stop panicking. Still, that doesn't mean everything here is all sunshine and rainbows, far from it. There are still a lot of implications to tackle here, namely that everyone here has been forced to inhabit this fiction, for the sake of entertainment. It's true that there are people watching, and where there is audience, there needs to be story. The killing game itself, the players involved, their personalities, their histories, the backstory, everything was a construct. Nothing was real. Not even the ruined world, revealed to be an elaborate set. Not even down to the talents that have defined our colorful cast of characters and carried them this far. Not even the homes, histories, and friends that they remember. When they entered the Academy, New Danganronpa V3 became their reality even if none of it was ever real in the first place. And now we know who the true mastermind is. Sumigi Shirigane is but one small piece of the puzzle. She's just the messenger. She represents the will of the outside world, of the audience who craves more Danganronpa to watch. According to her, the outside world is actually so peaceful and boring that they've become addicted to watching this never-ending killing game, to experiencing the highs and lows of love and betrayal, of hope and despair. And through the mouth of the series' most beloved girl, Shirigane spells the original title flat out. This killing game is for everyone. Everyone's new semester of killing. This even explains the title. That's why it's V3 and not just 3. Why do you think it's Junko Enoshima the 53rd? It's a Roman numeral. It's the 53rd season of Danganronpa. I uh, just want to interject here for a second, by the way, and say this is like why it's a huge pet peeve of mine when I see people call the first two games Danganronpa V1 or Danganronpa V2 or whatever. Like, sure, it's harmless, do whatever you want, but come on, the V in V3 is a 5. Those games aren't Danganronpa 51 or 52. You know this, don't call them that, stop it. The series continued in this world all the way down the line, and with each successive title, the immersion just wasn't strong enough. It went from a series of games started on the PSP, to anime, to becoming a reality show with live participants. It has a whole team backing it, Team Danganronpa, whose logo appears every time you boot up the game, whose building of operations can always be seen eerily looming on the title screen. Saihara tries to argue that he and his classmates aren't fictional, even if everything else is, and Shiragane cuts him off. They're just normal people, that not only had all of their histories and personalities manufactured for the sake of being characters in the killing game via use of the flashback lights, but they were also completely willing participants. They, like everyone watching, were rabidly devoted Danganronpa fans, who auditioned for the opportunity to be in the show, who were then chosen to join. We even see Saihara's audition tape, and it's not flattering. Saihara himself talks about wanting to be a detective in a Danganronpa story, who would be an extremely effective murderer who would surprise people because it had never been done before. Shirigane even claims that during the first run of the prologue, that everyone realized they were selected and were happy about it. So of course, this naturally means the beats of the plot were led and planned by Shirigane too. After all, she helped to create these characters and their inclinations, right? So it's only natural she had some degree of knowledge as to where these things might head. She knew Chibashira would feel a kinship with Yumino. She knew Saihara would be inspired by Akamatsu's personality, a fact which is made all the more tragic by the real Akamatsu, whose audition tape has her uttering the words, I'm perfect for a killing game, I don't have any faith in humanity. She even knew Harukawa had the disposition necessary to be attracted to and fall in love with Momota. And yet again, this is made all the worse by his audition tape, where he claims he'll kill everybody, win, and then lays around with his fame and fortune. Why am I here? Why did I even survive this long? This is fiction. There is no greater meaning. No greater meaning to death. No greater meaning to life. It's all fiction. There's no meaning to be found in any of it. Bleh, it's so gross I could just barf. Well, I guess it makes sense you wouldn't believe all this stuff. How about that? You in despair yet? And she hopes they are, considering that's what the audience always keeps coming back for. Everyone sinks. They break. How can they stop the killing game when it's what the whole world wants? How could they ever pull the plug on something so impossibly popular that it eternally drives its own demand? How can Saihara fight for a lie, after all? As we reach the bad end, we hear a voice. Is this the end? 
Please, tell me. I'm asking you. Whenever I was in trouble, my inner voice would always guide me. That guidance is what brought me here. I don't believe that's a mistake. So, I will trust it. Please, tell me. Tell me what I should do. Please tell me your decision. A safe prompt appears, asking if we want to save this situation. No. It changes. Do we want to remedy this situation? Yes. We temporarily come into control of Kibo, whose cowlick stands tall enough to offer him protagonist privileges for a second, I guess. It sure seems like it, since he's suddenly talking about overcoming despair with hope. The outside world wants hope too, he says, but here comes Shiragane to clarify, yes, what he's hearing is the voices of the outside world itself. He's got an antenna. He's the audience survey. He's been acting upon their whims for a while now, with audience participation being a current season gimmick. Not only that, but his eyes are the audience's camera, too, broadcasting everything to them from his perspective. Shiragane tries to make this seem like her bid to make the audience and the world at large fall into despair, just like Junko and Oshima would. And this pretty conveniently sets up a typical Danganronpa finale, complete with the main theme beginning to play, while Kibo talks about broadcasting hope and everything. They even call him the super high school level hope robot and add hope to his truth bullets for crying out loud. But even though Shiragane seems determined to end this with a final vote between herself and Kibo, between hope and despair, can we really let it end like this? Just like the first game? Can we really, after all this, bring things right back around to the beginning? According to Shiragane, we'd better, because if Kibo is punished, the killing game will continue until only two survivors are left, as per the rules. Though it's likely nothing would happen since the whole curtain's been discarded and everyone sees the tricks for what they are. However, if they vote for her and escape, everything's fake, so they have nowhere to return, and the world is populated by people who wanted this for them all in the first place. They can't even regain their original personalities or memories, and the rules pretty much guarantee that only two of them will be able to survive in this event anyway, which is a choice they'll be forced to make if they want to go there. Even though Kibo volunteers to be one of those sacrifices, that leaves another left, and of course Harukawa is quick to offer to throw away her own life yet again, if it means she gets a single chance to strike back at Shiragane in the process. But for Saihara, that's enough. As the ever-familiar Claire de Lune begins to play in the background, he raises his objection. It's because of hope that this is even happening, he says. The audience of Danganronpa doesn't just want despair, they want despair to be defeated by hope, like it always is. They want to be inspired, they want to be told that everything will be okay, and they always want another killing game to do that with. That's what fiction can do. But for Saihara, there's no excuse for that fiction to continue once it has started to harm real people. Is any story really worth ending so many lives? Furthermore, he's pieced it together. This is why there's a vote. This explains Amami's role. The punishment is continuing on and playing another killing game, meaning that he was probably standing in this exact same position in the previous season. He sacrificed himself and was made to play again. And this means that if hope is chosen here, Shiragane will be the mastermind, Kibo will play audience surrogate, and Harukawa will be the super high school level survivor. The killing game persists when hope wins. When the story reaches its natural conclusion, so must another sequel come along to capitalize on the audience's never-ending investment. The only winning move here is simply not to play, and Saihara is tired of playing when it means that so many real people get hurt in the process. And that's what it's all about, huh? Even if everything is fake, even if their backgrounds, their talents, and the basis of their relationships are all fake, it still felt real. It still meant something to them. This is the true culmination of Saihara's arc, his ability to search for the truth and the truth inside kind lies. Because the friends he cares about, the pain in his heart that he feels when losing them, those aren't fake, and to simply deny them as yet another lie would be absurd. Even if they're not based in truth, they are still true, aren't they? And they're worth caring about. They're worth fighting for the sake of. And that's why he refuses to vote. He won't give them what they want. Shooting hope right from the mouth of Makoto Naegi himself with a lie bullet that represents despair, Kibo stops listening to his inner voice. Yumino and Harukawa both have come to their own decisions, with even the UI switching to allow us to peer into their thoughts, to watch as they themselves become the heroes of their own stories, and make the decision to stand with Saihara against the will of the outside world. Shiragane argues that they can never change the audience's mind, that fiction cannot affect reality, but she could never understand. She doesn't understand how everyone's feelings are real, how a lie could become the truth. And she doesn't understand the power that fiction wields to communicate a real message and a real wish. If Danganronpa itself has always told us to hold on to hope, to cherish our bonds, and to hold our heads high, then if we carry that advice with us, 
aren't we living proof that it does? And honestly, this next bit is really cool. You literally have to refrain from participating. A non-stop debate begins, you let the timer run out. Shiragane becomes desperate to get you to play. A hangman's gambit begins, you let the timer run out. Psyche Taxi begins, you let the timer run out. A multiple choice question begs you to choose hope, you let the timer run out. Saihara refuses to entertain people while he is fighting for his life, tells them to go ahead and stop watching if they like, and the audience starts to get bored. But there's one last swerve. Kibo's will is stripped away, his personality erased as the audience takes control to literally have a say in the discussion and ensure it goes one way or the other. In the last words he can manage before he's completely taken over, he apologizes for not being able to stick it out with everyone, and tells them that their choice isn't wrong, begging them to use him and help change the world that would demand this from them in the first place. Our friends who died gave us their love, Sayara says, and we changed because of that. If we can inspire change in others, then that love will live on. That love will tear down the wall between fiction and reality, and it will live on forever. That's why I'm going to change the world. As long as I have their love, I will change it. Even if this whole story is a lie, I will use that lie to change the world! As the final argument armament starts, we face down with Kibo in what I can only describe as him being used as a conduit for Saihara and the others to defeat Twitter. As he swears that they will end Danganronpa by their own hands, Kibo acquiesces. Even though Shiragane is so confident that the series will continue, she herself didn't vote. If you needed any further proof that she wanted Hope to win, since that would have left only Kibo's vote. She doesn't get what she wants, though. Nobody voted. Not even the audience. She was totally off mark when she said that there was no point to fiction that it couldn't affect reality, because it successfully changed their minds. Saihara's plan worked. His pleas were heard, and the world was changed. The audience has had enough of Danganronpa, and they all start tuning out to signal that decision. Your words can't reach them anymore. With that, Shiragane finally concedes to the end. Convinced that to end this without any punishment at all would be half-assed, she leaves Kibo to wrap the proceedings, to destroy this fictional world and the killing game along with it. I worked hard to keep this going for 53 seasons, and now it's all over, she says. Well, that's fine. If this is a world without killing games now, I don't want to be a part of it. I have no interest in a world without Danganronpa. As she laments that her plan was such a perfect copy that it failed at the end, Kibo raises into the sky. He begins to fire indiscriminately, raining hellfire on the school below. As Shiragane waves from the courtyard with Monokuma, crushed by the falling rubble. As the academy falls, Kibo flies into the top of the birdcage of fiction surrounding them, blowing himself to smithereens as the veil shatters and the credits roll. All the while, a new banging song from Megumi Ogata called Dan Kusari Break plays, but only in the Japanese version of the game. Apparently there were some licensing issues or something? The series medley remix we get in the American version is pretty good, but if you've never heard the original song, I encourage you to look it up, because it's probably my favorite credit song in the series. Anyway, this still isn't the end of V3, no, we've got a whole epilogue scene left, but this is the end of Chapter 6, and since I tend to reserve my final thoughts on the game itself for the very end, and Chapter 6 has so much worth talking about on its own, I feel like we need to stop and hold back for a moment here, and discuss it before we can really start wrapping things up. There are a lot of elephants in the room right now, but first, let's start small and let's take things in order. The investigation section is certainly one of the most unique final investigations of the series. It's the only one that doesn't take place in Hope's Peak Academy, facsimile or otherwise, and it has a startling amount of last minute mechanics tossed in too. I honestly think the timer is pretty weird. If you run it out, it just shows the school blowing up and then gives you more time anyway, so it seems a little pointless. The Kibo gauge is fine though. It it seems a little incidental, but I guess it makes the whole thing a bit more tense, since you can actually be expected to run into the exosols during the proceedings because of it. It does raise a couple of practical questions, though. I do like the reframing of Oma's character here, like I said before, but the fact that he was able to give hints about the password to Amami's hidden room is more than a little odd. I know that Oma has like mad lockpicking skills, and he probably did know more than he tended to let on, but you saw how some of those lab paths were opened. It has always bugged me how he even got in there in the first place, or how he at least knew about the vault if he didn't. I'm sure it could be explained away somehow, so it's not the biggest plot disturbance in the world to me, but I feel like it goes pretty largely unaddressed for something that could so easily be construed as a gap in the story's logic, and that does bother me. I guess if Shiragane really wanted everyone to discover the truth and despair, she could have made sure he had a memory of it, but that would probably raise a lot of questions of convenience for Oma anyway, and she was already having problems with how nosy he was. Seems like that'd be way too risky. Speaking of Shiragane, oh 
boy, do we want to talk about her for a second? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that the start of the trial is actually really cool to me. The idea of doing a retrial and catching the mastermind in a lie is very interesting, and it comes as a huge shock to tie everything back around like that, even if it ends in yet another Junko reveal. Shiragane herself, though, I'm a little mixed. I've had people accuse me of praising Junko's character too much, or pretending she's deeper than she actually is, which... I mean, these videos are about me explaining my personal takes, so that is a little confusing to me. But like I said before, I'm honestly glad she wasn't the true villain again. She had long since worn out her welcome, and a new original mastermind was the way to go in my opinion. However, that being said, I still think Shiragane at her best isn't as good as Junko at her best. This is of course just my opinion though, and that isn't to say that I think Shiragane is a bad mastermind at all either. Far from it, in fact. I think she can be rather brilliant at times, though underwhelming in others. Allow me to explain. So Shiragane has what I'd call the double-edged sword of intrigue, where she is conceptually quite awesome, and part of that depth comes from the fact that she is so shallow, but that also leads to her being quite boring sometimes. I mean, it's all a lie, it's all fiction, certainly hasn't become as ubiquitously beat into the ground as hope or despair have by this point, so they're not quite so mimetically annoying, but at a certain point it does also become about all she can really say for herself, because Shiragane, like I said, is more of the harbinger than she is the true central villain, and for that reason she's more of an interesting concept than she's allowed to be an individually interesting character. By her own admission, she's rather plain, and her most defining trait before this point is her constant need to make reference humor about things she's a fan of. I think this is kind of the entire point, though. She's the orchestrator for her audience's sake, and though she's puppeteering the current installment to her whim, she's also just as much of a Danganronpa superfan as the audience. She cosplays all the characters, she remembers their catchphrases and famous lines, she can even perfectly replicate their voices. Shout out to the original cast cameos, by the way, that was sweet. And this, too, is why I think it's so revealing that she has the line toward the end about not wanting to live in a world without Danganronpa. It echoes the Monokuma Theater segment in Chapter 5 about Danganronpa being someone's reason to live, to which Monokuma responds that it was pleasure doing business with them. Her entire identity is wrapped up in the media she consumes, and all that is to the people in charge is an eternal transaction. I'd argue this is the reason she is otherwise so plain, because she cannot conceive of an identity beyond her status as a fan of something. She is her fandom, she embodies it, and she is not content in any other moment to simply be herself. When she reveals her grandeur and her plans, she can't even hardly stand to do so while looking like herself. While denying the power and impact of fiction on people's lives, she ironically becomes so embroiled within it that she can't even imagine living outside of it. What use is a world to her where she can't watch her favorite Blorbos kill each other? The culmination of her arc is quite literally everyone telling her to go touch grass and her saying no. And I think this largely ties into the point V3 is really driving at, but more on that in a bit. Before we confront the point about the audience in the story, I want to talk about the fiction angle, because it's a word that gets thrown around a lot in this trial, and it's something a lot of people have some complicated feelings about. I already talked a bit about how this doesn't, by my estimation, invalidate anything about the prior installments insofar as their canonicity to themselves, and all that in-universe stuff, but I want to talk a bit about how it does pertain to this story, and why that still may disappoint a lot of people. The events of the game's plot are undeniably fictional. This is thrown at us pretty clearly as a central part of the twist, and though there are some open, ambiguous questions tossed in our faces toward the very end of the game, the characters being willful participants with rewritten personalities and fake backstories is made almost undeniably apparent. To many, this would then crumble the foundation of the story itself and what it even existed for. These games are long and heavy on emotional investment after all. Doesn't it feel a bit cheap to have played something for a week, weeks, or maybe even months depending on your free time, to get attached to the characters to want to solve the mystery, only to be told that there was never any point, that none of it was even real in the first place, all for the sake of a big shocking twist? I can admit, yeah, it does feel a bit rash. It feels a bit uncouth, even. It almost feels like the writers are laughing at you for even caring at all. And while I may have initially felt that way when playing the game, like so many others, I did want to take a step back and evaluate that carefully. Is that what the writers were doing? I've come across many examples of media I love that have received similar accusations, and never once have I felt that that was the case in those instances. In fact, in many of those instances, I felt like the mere suggestion was one that failed to recognize the actual intent of the story, whether or not it was executed upon perfectly. And so this forced me to analyze things here a bit more closely. What was V3 trying to do with this, if not to cause some simple shock? Well, I think it plays its hand pretty heavily, in fact. It's talking about the power fiction holds. 
What do I mean by this, though? Well, consider for a moment the term suspension of disbelief. It's one we all know, but what does it mean? Well, it's when we, the audience, come into a story we know to be fantastical or otherwise unreal and allow ourselves to engage with it on its own terms. After all, stories like this are fictional, but while we know that, we also let the part of our brain that is constantly scrutinizing its fictional status fall silent for a time while we slip into it. We become a part of that world in order to feel something about it. Remember what I said before about the theme of lies in this game? About whether lies were always a bad thing or could be used to kind ends? Remember the whole thing Oma's arc revolves around? Fiction is itself a lie, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad, right? Because we know it isn't true. We literally knew that from the very beginning. Before you even played Danganronpa for the first time, you knew that it was just some video game, just some story that never happened. I think this twist is less about forcing us into shock about some cheap revelation, and more intended to ask a question. Why now, after all this time, would being told that this is a lie hurt you? Why now, when you've always known? And just because it is a lie, does that mean that it means nothing? I'd say that, judging by Saihara's words, that no it does mean something. I mean, clearly, if you've gotten invested in the story at all, then it means something to you. And those feelings, whether influenced by something real or something artificial, are in and of themselves true. That's the value they hold, and the value of the lie that influenced them to begin with. And of course, I'd never accuse anyone of missing the point, quote unquote, for solely disliking how this twist was presented or handled. I think you can very well understand this and still not be a fan. And even to me, I still have some annoyances with it. For example, I feel like this in retrospect does make sense of some other things, like the Monocubs are corporate colorful mascots to spruce up the tired old reboot, for example. A Tojo's ridiculous backstory that I said I thought was a bit much was itself probably exaggerated specifically to emphasize how they're running out of ideas. And while this now makes a lot more sense, I do still think that this only goes so far when retroactively managing to patch over things that I found initially dissatisfying. Like, yes, I guess it does make more sense now as to why that backstory was so absurd, but that still doesn't change the fact that that's how I felt about it in Chapter 2 when I played it, and dragged down the case itself a bit for me, you know? All this to say, it's not perfect. I can say as many flowery words as I want to, and trust me, I will never stop, you can't make me, but that doesn't mean everyone's gonna like it, even for the reasons it's going for. Still, I just wanted to give credit to what the gesture was attempting to accomplish, in my opinion, and say that the sentiment does ring very true to me. This is also the reason why I don't really worry about things like Harukawa's crush on Momota being made up, or other such beats being invalidated. There's no real effective way Shiragane could have controlled everyone's moment-to-moment -moment actions for the entire game, and if she could, that would both make her really stupid considering she screws herself over, and also it would just render the entire plot utterly meaningless because it would then be over a dozen Shiraganes effectively talking to herself. I think she gave them the potential for these things. I think she gave Harukawa the type of feelings that under the circumstances would blossom into an attraction toward Momota, but that in and of itself cannot make their plot play out the exact way that it did. It can only steer her in a general direction while she carries the rest out, like the opening line of a writing prompt. The feelings she continued to have and things she did as a result were all still her choices, and so they held just as much meaning as anything else in my opinion. Shiragane is more of a dungeon master with a group that has been gaslighted into thinking that they're real wizards than she is God writing their actions onto a page, if you catch my meaning. But that still leaves a final behemoth to face up against in terms of piping hot takes, and that is the matter of the audience in the world of Danganronpa V3. Now, I think it's probably best to lead with the fact that Kodaka has said in interviews that he was actually surprised that some people felt a bit told off by the game here, because yes, that is a predominant negative stigma towards this aspect of the story, that a lot of people feel as though the game is scolding them for enjoying Danganronpa, and uh, well, it's not exactly difficult to see why. Saihara's phrasing is super accusatory, and given the role of the audience in V3, it's also very easy to see them as a parallel for the real-life audience buying and playing the games. Their chat messages are superbly reminiscent of things actual fans would say, and I've seen many more claim that those chat messages made them feel uncomfortable precisely because they rang so true when compared to their own comments. Kodaka, however, spins a different story, saying that he felt previous finales aired too close to having the audience be essentially cheerleaders for the protagonists, who could only encourage them from the sidelines as opposed to feeling like they were with them at ground zero. This finale, he says, was his attempt to get the audience to feel like they, 
and the characters were firmly at the same level and would feel just as much despair as them when confronted with what they were up against, and for that reason would feel as though they were fighting together with them, and was hoping that Saihara's words would be encouraging ones that they could get behind. Furthermore, he says that the idea that the audience is reflective of the real one comes across weirdly to him because in V3, Danganronpa is the most popular thing on Earth that everyone is addicted to, and in real life, it's fairly niche, and even the mere suggestion that it could come back gets them ratioed on Twitter. I don't know how much I want to believe this, though. I don't want to call Kodaka a liar, obviously. I'm sure there is a lot of truth to this, but I also think he's maybe trying to save face just a little bit, since he said this when he had already gotten a lot of flack. I mean, sure, I absolutely see where people are coming from when they say that this bugs the piss out of them, and I myself think that Kodaka is maybe not looking hard enough if he says that he really can't see why people would feel a bit attacked by some of this dialogue. But at the same time, I almost feel like if this isn't meant to be a critique of some sort, it becomes really boring. Like, what then is the message exactly? Well, death of the author and all that. Allow me to try, keyword being try, to explain the more interesting angle of the story here, which I think is emphasized by the audience and their role in it, and that's one of franchise stagnation and the death of creativity. We've already pointed out that this is installment number 53, that there are try-hard baby mascots that put Poof from the Fairly Odd Parents to shame, and an increasing ramp-up of ridiculous audience hooks that exist solely to milk the series dry from an in-universe perspective. Hell, it's even got the lazy reboot thing going on because it's billed as a direct sequel to the story of Danganronpa 3. Keep in mind that the Hope's Peak saga still ended there in V3's world, but then they went on and kept soft rebooting for dozens of more sequels. This, then, is a return to form for Team Danganronpa. Shiragane calls it the long-awaited sequel. This is the first time that the Hope's Peak storyline has been brought to their real fiction reality show setup, and they intend to squeeze it for all it's worth, repeating tired tropes, walking the same lines they have over and over again, having endless references to previously famous cases, and even bringing back characters from those previous games. How many beloved film, television, or even video game franchises have you seen do this? How much more rarely do you see companies actually put money and time into original properties that don't have a convenient branding name to give it a boost? How often have you seen things that barely seem like they even need to be attached to the name of the series they're supposedly rebooting, only to learn that the team behind them was basically just told to slap the name on what they were already making precisely because it would make more money that way? And how often do you see people eat that up? I don't think V3 is necessarily criticizing its audience for enjoying violence or anything. I think this is as much of a misunderstanding as it is when people accuse Undertale of being solely about that too. And more than that, I think Kodaka would have very little reason to preach that message if so, given that he made the other Danganronpa games. Now, I think this has more to do with creative death, and what I mean by that is the endless grind that demands art to become a commodity for nothing but routine, eternal consumption. It's Shiragane in her Junko costume that says at the end of Chapter 5 that if it's fun, we have to keep doing it. It's her that says the fans would never accept Danganronpa suddenly ending because they feel owed more for supporting it. And it's she who is defined solely by the fandom that she likes, who refuses to even continue living if the series is over. Something Kodaka also said in interviews around this time is that even back with DR1, he was never sure if it would get a sequel, and he didn't write it with a continuation in mind. That with SDR2 being finished, he wasn't even sure where to take the series. That with DR3, the storyline was over, and that with V3, he wondered at a certain point whether it even should be Danganronpa with his team. He later reiterated that with V3, he said all he needed to say, and that he had very little interest in ever returning to the series, and that if Spike Chunsoft continued it, it would be without him, though he has since walked this back slightly, saying he might would return if asked. And it was his decision to have V3's epilogue, more on that in a bit, end with a title card that declared the end of Danganronpa itself. And yeah, I mean, beyond spin-off material, it hasn't. V3 really did cement itself, for now at least, as the final entry, and I think that's incredibly purposeful, at least from Kodaka's own perspective at the time, because this is what I think it's all about. We're not actually causing real deaths by being fans of Danganronpa. I don't think we can reliably be held to account for that, and I don't think it would be super interesting if that's all the game had to say or imply for itself. What I do think that the game is asking us to think about, however, is whether we really need more Danganronpa. The deaths are just a weighty way of getting us to recognize this. They're personal stakes to the characters within the fiction, who are attempting to create real feelings within us, the audience, but the crux of this plea is a simple one. 
Danganronpa has been exhausted to its limit. In V3's world, there's practically no more stories to even tell. Stories inspire feelings in us, but when those feelings are repeated wholesale for their own sake, they become a formula. And unless that formula has anything unique left to say, they become set dressing, just an excuse to have more bloody murder mysteries. And by a certain point, especially if they're getting so bored of the regular format that they have to start killing real people for it, then yeah, that's all it is anymore. If you think hope and despair were tired phrases by five installments in, can you imagine listening to them for 53? No, neither can I really. All stories have an ending. Some of the best art in the world is the kind that gets to leave us on its own terms without being forced by a production committee to drag itself out and become a carcass of what it once was. Gravity Falls ended after two seasons. It was short, it was sweet, it was perfect that way. And that's exactly how the creator said he wanted it. We never got exposed to it for long enough that it became just another soulless product being sold for money. Danganronpa V3 asks us the question of why we love what we love, and if at a certain point, for the sake of its integrity and the lasting memories it gives us, if it would be better to set those things free. V3's world is the way it is precisely because, even if in a cartoonishly exaggerated way, its populace could not let go of Danganronpa. They, like Shiragane, defined themselves by it, crowded around it, and became so obsessed with it that it devoured every aspect of their lives. Fiction should be able to make you feel things, but, you know, all things in moderation and whatnot. This was a world ruined by its attachment, able to excuse atrocities for another dopamine hit, another product to buy and sell, while grinding its integrity just a bit more under heel. And please don't misconstrue me, I don't think the deliverance of this point is nearly perfect, and I again don't want to make it seem like I'm accusing anyone of either not understanding it, or being rightfully scolded and needing to take the message to heart. I do not reckon myself so presumptuous to know the internal lives of all Danganronpa fans, nor would I want to. If you think this message is a bit arrogant or misguided, I wouldn't blame you, and I can't force you to see it any other way, nor would I try. Believe it or not, I think the discussion surrounding this game is way more interesting because of how split it is, and I'm not even necessarily saying what I think about whether this narrative is good or not by trying to outline what I think it's even about. And even then, I could still be wrong. Kodaka could post Nezumi VA is full of sh** on Twitter tomorrow, and I'd have to be like, yeah, okay, fair enough, but I don't know, that's what I got out of it. And that's why, even if I think it's far from perfect, it is still conceptually quite engaging. And if there's one thing I do think Kodaka succeeded at with this decision, it's that he made me feel like I was right there with them. Me and the characters were on the same level, seeing eye to eye. I think there's something commendable about that. That all said, Chapter 6 is one of the most compelling mixed bags I've ever come across. The investigation is cool, but weird. The trial is long and often feels like it's putting its foot in its mouth, but it also has some decently interesting concepts to explore that I would rather it try than back away sheepishly from. I think in all ways that make art beautiful and messy, it is both. And like the truth and a kind lie, perhaps those things should be able to coexist for the betterment of the whole. I think it could certainly be improved in many ways. Part of me thinks it would be far more interesting if, instead of allowing Shiragane to get her Junko send-off, they forced her to live in the real world, for example. That might would have been pretty biting and sold her character arc even better. I also think Kibo's role would have hit a bit harder if I was more attached to Kibo. Sorry, Kibo fans, I just found him a little average for most of this game. I wasn't super into him. Yumino's here too, I guess. But overall, I think that for as many problems as it has, Chapter 6 certainly has a lot of strengths. And if it were between something like this and playing things safe and formulaic for its own sake, I think I'd have preferred this approach. If you really want your own series to end when you set out to conclude it, the least you can do is make it so chaotic that half your audience would prefer it stay over, right? Now then, how'd they stick the landing? After what appears to be a fake out back to the title screen, we cut to a reveal. Though Shiragane and Kibo have gone with the smoke, Saihara, Harukawa, and Yumino have survived to see the light. The three stare wordlessly at the real world beyond the birdcage they suffered within, and try to decide what to do next. At any rate, they can't stay, and Saihara speculates that maybe things will be okay, because if Kibo ensured their survival, he might have done so because that's what the outside world itself wished for. They wanted this lie to become the truth. Speaking of lies, Shiragane's last words about her plan being a flawless copy have them speculating on whether or not she was even telling the truth about the world being fiction, or the way they embraced their roles upon arriving. 
He can't believe that they would seemingly willingly participate in this game, even if they were fans of the series, but he has no basis for his speculation. It's just a hunch. This world is yet another cat box, and once the characters leave it to see how it really is, it will be beyond our grasp. We won't be able to tell one way or the other. And so those truths and lies can also coexist, depending on what we want to believe. Saihara wraps it with basically the thesis statement of the game. Yeah, but I feel like there's not too much meaning in truth and lies. Yeah, what do you mean? I mean that even if something is a lie, even if it's fiction, if it has the power to change the world, then it must contain some kind of truth. Aren't we proof of that? In this fictional world, we overcame all these fictional struggles, but those things changed us, and we were able to change the world. So it doesn't really matter where the truth ends and where the lies begin. If lies can change the world just as well as the truth can, then lies are just another way of telling the truth. Some lies can lead the world to hope. Some truths can lead the world to despair. So I don't think anyone can really say which is more right in the end. I guess it's not important whether it's a truth or a lie, just what it leads to. Yeah, that's what I believe. Vowing to see how the outside world may or may not have changed, they all leave the fiction behind, promising to take their experiences from it with them. The story lives on, Saihara says. I'm sure, even now, even on the other side, it lives on there as well. And thus the story lives on. Was this lie able to change something? Was this lie able to change someone? Was this lie able to change the world? If it was able to change even the smallest thing, then the story isn't over. And with that, New Danganronpa V3, and thus Danganronpa itself, ends. And I've got some mixed feelings about this. I think the ambiguity is purposeful and fair enough to emphasize, but I think they probably shouldn't have leaned so hard on the maybe Hope's Peak was real after all implications, because I just think the game's far less interesting that way. But that's just my personal view. My speculation leads me to believe a certain way, and I suppose that's probably what Kodaka intended. The game in general, when looking back on it all, is such a mixed experience for me. There are some parts I absolutely love, some parts I think were full of potential but didn't live fully up to that, and some I just downright abhor. At its best, it reaches some of the series' heights. At its worst, I struggle to see it any more highly than the lows of Ultra Despair Girls. It's a game which, even more than any other, I feel like I feel totally different about depending on the day and what chunks of it I'm even evaluating. Like an evasive statement, like a lie that masquerades as truth, it is very difficult to pin Danganronpa V3 down. It's hard to get it to dedicate to being one way or the other, and I think that is sort of part and parcel of its identity. When you take this many risks, it's difficult to imagine that you'll come out the other end executing all your ideas perfectly, and it's impossible to please everyone that way. There are just as many people who adore this game as there are those who hate it, and I don't really know that I think I belong to either camp. I think I stand firmly in the middle, with one foot on either side, of appreciation, of annoyance, shades of grey and all that. V3's issues are egregious, and that's because they show off what Danganronpa is like at its absolute worst. But at the same time, it also contains some of what I think to be the best the series has ever been. It may not be contained in every character, or every narrative, or even in its art, but at the end of the day, V3 both revels in and reviles being Danganronpa. It is a series-wide simulacrum. And so, in that respect, while I may not have needed Danganronpa V3, I think it deserves to exist. Could it have stood to have a few less of its glaring issues? Well, sure. I think it has its place here nonetheless, though. And I wouldn't take that away from it. I'm glad I got the chance to play it again, and I'm glad I got the chance to share it with all of you. Well, I guess I should just be saying all of that in general, huh? This journey has been long. Talking about this entire series all over again, revisiting memories long forgotten, and things I've held close to my chest for years now. It feels good to finally get it all out there, because as much flack as I've given this series over time, I hope that the amount of work I've put into this retrospective makes one thing clearer than all else. I really do like Danganronpa. It is flawed as hell, dear god believe me when I say I know that. But it's given me a lot of memories, a lot of inspiration, and it's the reason I've met several people I care about. I think it's collectively done more good than harm, even if that does not negate the understandable criticisms people have of it, or the fundamental flaws in some of its characters and concepts. Even just 
talking about it is the reason why so many of you are here, and I just cannot say enough how grateful I am for that. When I set out to make this retrospective, I didn't just want to shout my opinions into a void and leave it at that, though. I wanted to be able to say goodbye to something. That doesn't mean I'm leaving Danganronpa behind or anything. I'll probably still run my mouth about it again at some point, and it will always be on my radar. But for the story that meant so much to me in high school, that kickstarted something creative in me that hasn't died since, I felt it was owed my final correspondences, to have its last rites read out before I finally let it rest in my heart and moved on to better things. This past year of my life has been dedicated to an autopsy, and now I think I'm finally done. Regardless of what the future has in store for this series, for now, I can let go. Besides, I've talked plenty today and for a while, and this isn't even my favorite visual novel series. That honor belongs to Umineko, which I have mentioned a lot and used a lot of music from in this retrospective. In fact, uh, if some of V3's concepts appeal to you, but you too think that they could have been done better, uh, maybe watch my recommendation video about it and see if it'd be up your alley. I highly recommend it. Just, you know, make sure the laundry list of triggers in it won't screw you up. Anyway, as for wrapping our thoughts on Danganronpa, well, maybe you guys should take over for a bit. What do you think? I found out about Danganronpa back during 2013-2014 Tumblr, and at first I loved it because, you know, I was a teenager at the time, and of course, as a teenager typically does, I liked how dark and eccentric the premise and visuals are, you know, it's very eye-catching. It was cool, and most importantly, back then, it was it was niche, because a lot of people didn't really know about Danganronpa at the time, because it, was, it wasn't localized, of course. Nowadays, as an adult, edgy humor isn't really my thing, <laughs> but I stuck around for the characters and relationships. Like, I care about them a lot, and how, even though they seem impossibly talented, unique, and out of this world, they were still, at the end of the day, people with their own struggles outside of the killing games, like with identity, contributing to society, and uncertainty for the future to give a gist of it. It's... I think it's something that a lot of teenagers can really relate to, even nowadays, and I think that's why a lot of people really adore this series, both back then and now. I initially discovered Danganronpa through a voice actor let's play of the series, and from then I decided to buy and play the game as myself. I think what's kept me interested all this time is the characters. Ever since I've experienced these games, the characters have always stuck with me despite some grievances I have with the stories overall. Characters like Kyoko, Fuyuhiko, and Shuichi, who have these long form arcs in particular are ones that I really admire. Seeing them go from closed off people to caring about others means a lot to me personally, and I look up to them for that. I remember being introduced to the series by my best friend a few years back, who took me through one of her favorite Let's Plays of the original Trigger Happy Havoc, followed shortly thereafter by Goodbye Despair. Now, I'm really not all that big a fan of visual novels, and at first glance, that's all it looked like to me, albeit one with an interesting gimmick. Before too terribly long, though, I started seeing actual game mechanics at work, cool ones, and that helped me get progressively more and more invested. There were definitely a handful of story elements and details of characterization that rubbed me the wrong way between the first two games, but push come to shove, I love a good mystery. I love seeing characters pushed to their developmental limits by forces beyond their control. I love puzzles and interactive storytelling, and despite hating most killing game scenarios like Battle Royale or Hunger Games or Squid Game, I love the potential of Danganronpa. So what's funny is that initially, I had no real interest in ever checking Danganronpa out. Uh, it was my brother who had picked up Trigger Happy Havoc, and with one look at the box art, I had assumed that it was just the type of anime game that I just wouldn't be into. What I didn't know was just how much I would come to care for the series, and how it would really influence a ton of the relationships I would form over the course of the next few years. To the point where I probably wouldn't have gotten to know my partner if it wasn't for the discussions we had on the first first game. But beyond the sentimental value it holds for me, what keeps me coming back to Danganronpa even now 
after it's concluded, is the love I have for these characters. I relate and empathize way too much with the struggles of characters like Chihiro, Hina, Hajime. I could go on for hours and hours about just how much the series means to me, and any series that can elicit that kind of emotion and manage that is one that I will forever cherish, even in spite of the faults. I first discovered Danganronpa in, I believe, 2014 through my school's anime club. They only showed the first three episodes, so I ended up watching the rest at home. Then I found it was based off a game and that there's two of them, at the time at least. I think what kept me intrigued with Danganronpa was both my love for the mystery genre, as well as there being some actually really cool and interestingly written characters. Also, Ryoma's best V3 character, fight me! You don't have to include that last part. I actually only got into Danganronpa recently, during the pandemic. I was on a murder mystery kick after playing Phoenix Wright, so I watched a playthrough of I the Somnium Files, and after that, I was still hungry for more, so I thought, well, I the Somnium Files is made by Spike Chunsoft. Maybe I should finally give Danganronpa a chance! And boy, am I glad that I did. This series really helped me through the pandemic. I think overall, the message that I got from it that helped me the most was, no matter how bad things seem, instead of giving into despair, you might as well try to keep moving forward anyway. That really resonated with me during such a stressful time. And now that I've finished playing all the games, I get to see all of the amazing art that the fans make. I can tell that Danganronpa means a lot to its fans. It's very obvious to see. And that too adds to my own enjoyment. Danganronpa is a series that I was kind of skeptical about at first, mainly due to knowing nothing about it. But enough of my friends suggested I try it, and I'm glad that I have. What really got me invested in the series was partially the non-stop debate gameplay, but also surprisingly the dub voice acting, sometimes because of recognizing the voices, such as Asahino or Hinata, and others from how enjoyable they were to listen to, the likes of Miyoda, Nida, and Momoto and Sho being particular highlights. From there, I've seen so much of what this series has to offer. The games, if, the anime adaptations, even the demos that I didn't know existed until about three months ago. The talent within this fandom is immense, and I'd love to see more of it. This series will always hold a place in my heart, and all I hope for is that the despair doesn't end anytime soon. I found out about Danganronpa when Nezumi herself told me it existed. We got really into it. We even wrote an overly ambitious abridged series of the first game's anime adaptation with a giant plot reveal at the end that the entire thing was just a show and everyone's personalities were overwritten to be more entertaining. We ultimately scrapped it because the workload was gigantic and the twist felt like it wouldn't make sense and would betray fans. A few years later, I played Danganronpa V3 and there was a giant plot reveal at the end that the entire thing was just a show and everyone's personalities were overwritten to be more entertaining. Turns out I could have gotten that job. I found Danganronpa in a very roundabout way. I came across a video on YouTube of Leon's execution, not knowing what I was in for, with no context for what was going on, and curious based on what I saw in the thumbnail, I gave it a watch. The brutality of the execution, followed by the hollow, horrified atmosphere befitting such a cruel death, hooked me immediately. No, not because I'm into violence, but because I'm a fan of horror that feeling of your heart sinking into your gut. That clip gave me that feeling, and I needed to know the context. From there, I found the Something Awful text-based Let's Play, like most people did back in the day, and got pulled deep into the rabbit hole. As corny as the games get, as much as it can hit you over the head with its messaging, there's a core of heart that speaks to me. The world can be brutal and empty, but there is always hope to find even in the darkest of times. There is great evil, but it can bring out the greater good. The fact that it chose children to bear the sins of mankind is even more poignant. And I'll never forget that first time my heart plunged into my gut, when that ball rolled towards the camera, revealing a bloodstain. As a relatively new fan of the Danganronpa series, first discovering the games through Game Grumps' playthroughs of the first and second game, I never could have discovered it at a better time than now, as a college student trudging through mountains of schoolwork to start my career. Goodbye Despair will always hold a special place in my heart as my personal favorite game in the main trilogy. I absolutely love and cherish the sequel's character roster, except for Terror Teru, but that's just common knowledge at this point. The charm of this series has enraptured me in a welcoming chokehold, full of brutality and heart. I spend what sliver of free time I have making content for the Rampa community, because it brings me great enjoyment in times of stress. 
I hope that other newer fans like me find joy in these games as well, as despite its faults, it deserves all the love it receives, and for the years to come. Also, Gundam Tanaka is best boy. My experience with Danganronpa starts with middle school, I think? Uh, some friends were into it, and I tried to get into it by watching the animation, but it didn't really click with me at the time. Uh, and then flash forward to late 2020, I was stuck in my house, as were so many other people, and I decided, hey, wouldn't it be funny if I played the game with the funny guy Nagito Kamida from the Fingers in His Ass meme? And so I installed Danganronpa 2 on my computer and started streaming it with some friends. And... From then, I just fell in love with the characters, really. I saw the problems and I struggled with it. Uh, I struggled a lot with it. God, those mini games suck. <laughs> but I really loved the characters, uh, especially uh, Sumiki. Sumiki's my favorite character. Uh, I see a lot of myself in her, badly reflected via, via poor writing, but like I see some of my own struggles within her. I keep interacting with this franchise because of the characters. A few months before the beginning of the pandemic, one of my friends uh, recommended the second game to me. Yes, the second game. After I finished like playing the series on my own, I started playing uh, from the beginning with uh, some other friends of mine, uh, and through which I became closer to uh, two people who are now my best friends, like some of my best friends. Um, also, my favorite character is unfortunately Nagito. So like a lot of people, I discovered Danganronpa through the Something Awful Let's Play and the Tumblr fandom that sprung up from it, but didn't give it much thought after until 2014 when my friend actually got me a Vita with the first two games for my birthday. Very generous gift that I hold dear to this day and really kick-started my love for the series. What I really love about it is the dichotomy between hope and despair. It's almost an ideological battle at times. A childish naivete going up against cynical practicalism. And the naivete winning out every time. It's something that I love in a lot of media, uh, like magical girl shows or tentpole sci-fi, things like that. I got into Danganronpa when I was 14 back in 2012, when it was at its humble beginnings in the Something Awful forums. And having been with this game series for that long, and seeing how the Western fandom went from what felt like a handful of people to booming at the scale that it's at now, it still baffles me. I remember when I first got into the series, Super Danganronpa 2 had only been released in Japan for maybe a couple of months, and hadn't been translated by anyone outside of a few snippets of prologue by some passionate fans. So my first run through of the game was actually a friend of mine streaming it as she translated for myself and a couple of other people, and it had me hooked instantly. There aren't many fandoms that I can call myself an early bird or a boomer for, but I'm really grateful that Danganronpa is one of them. It's what inspired me to take interest in other media like it going forward that now have become even more important to me, like Umi Neko and Zero Escape, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. It's come a long way since it fell into my lap, and I'm really happy that it's over the top story and its goofy characters are more accessible than ever and I hope that it can move people in the same way that it moved me back then. I first found Danganronpa through the Let's Play thread where the English fandom began and tuned out around Ultra Despair Girls, but then in 2019 I remembered, oh yeah, there's a third game I hadn't played yet or really heard anything about. So I went into V3 cut off from the fandom and without any preconceived expectations, and I was absolutely blown away. Not only is V3 the best game in the series, something I have complete confidence this video will agree with me on, it somehow reignited my passion for Danganronpa to the point where it still consumes me, just like Samugi. I tried I tried to make a short video ranking the characters and collating all my feelings on them, but that just made the problem worse, so I guess now this is just a part of my brain set aside for thinking about these fictional teenage dipshits. Like Umineko, another game that scratches a similar itch, V3's ending provoked a lot of backlash from people on the internet who are wrong, but I think therein actually lies one of its biggest appeals, because Danganronpa is a series about conflicting perspectives, and everything about these games, good or bad, is written ambitiously in a way that provokes discussion. I start out by saying, Oi, numpty, the monocubs are f***ing sick, eh? which I do sincerely believe, we both deploy our mutually disingenuous arguments like truth bullets and have a great time going at it. 
In doing so, we find ever more new perspectives to analyse, learn from, and love both these games and each other, forming connections in an endless non-stop debate. And what better way to put it? The story is never over. The debate never dies. So long as we got something from the series, it will always live on in us. It will always carry some significance that we transfer into our real lives and our experiences. And that's not even to mention the wealth of fan content that exists out there. It may be fiction. It may be a lie. But it's one that we all agreed to care about when we sat down to play it. I think there's something pretty special about that. So, thank you, Danganronpa, and... Well, no. I won't say goodbye. I'll say... <laughs> See you later. Hi, this is Editing Marcy. So, originally a song cover slash credit sequence for the entire retrospective was supposed to go here, with a chorus of viewers like you being included. It was super cool, but YouTube copyright claimed the melody, and would have disabled my monetization over it. I think it was really special though, so I don't want it to go to waste. I'll be linking it in the description, so please give it a watch after this. It's just a couple more minutes. Alright, now for the stinger stuff. Um, hi. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's all over now. That's surreal. Obviously, I mean the retrospective, though. I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna be making plenty of other stuff in the future, so, you know, look out for that. But if you survived all the way to the end of this triathlon, then I just really want to thank you sincerely for sticking around. It's been a crazy ride making all of these videos, and I sincerely appreciate all of the love and support that has been thrown my way. Now, as for what I'm planning next, obviously I'm going to keep some of that a secret. I want to get one more video done by the end of this year, but we'll see how it goes. I'd like to be able to put out a late Halloween special because, uh, well, first of all, October was taken up by this, and second of all, you know how much I love late Halloween videos, Nesmi trademark, uh, but also my plans are probably to do a stream sometime in November on this channel, um, probably on the 12th, but we'll see how it goes. Basically, it's going to be sort of a Q&A wrap-up stream for the Danganronpa retrospective, so you can come on by, and if you've got any other questions about, like, Danganronpa stuff that I haven't expressed my opinions about that you'd be curious about, like, what do you think of Ibuki Miyota? Or do you think Monokuma and Eggman should kiss? Then, you know, show up and maybe I'll answer those questions. While I'm doing it, I'm going to be playing Danganronpa S for the very first time because I've never played it before, mostly because it came out while I was doing this retrospective, and since I was doing so much Danganronpa related work for the retrospective, my idea of relaxing fun time was not exactly doing more Danganronpa stuff. I've only really seen out of context screenshots from Danganronpa S, so I don't really know that much about it. So, you know, hopefully that'll be a fun time if you're interested in that. Obviously, I should thank my patrons as usual for uh, helping me make my content. It if it weren't for them, I probably wouldn't be able to keep this going. In particular, I want to thank Serena Midori, Shogun DX, Friend of Dracula, Ali Oliver, and Claire Meeboon. Also, uh, you might notice channel members listed on the Patreon list now. That's because YouTube lets me have those. If you pay a dollar, you can get access to any exclusive community posts that I make, and also you get cool little emojis to use in the chats. That's neat. One-time support can go to Kofi down below as well, if that's something you're more comfortable with. And I also have like other links and stuff down there that you can check out. Obviously, I have uh, social media you can catch up with me on if you go to twitter.com forward slash nesmeba or nesmeba.tumblr.com. It'd be a huge favor to me if you could comment on this video, like it, subscribe to the video, and perhaps ring the video's bell. You know, gotta get all that feel out, but it genuinely really does help. So, you know, if you feel the temptation, I would appreciate it greatly. And, um, if you excuse Excuse me, I uh, am tired, so I have to go now. <laughs> but one way or the other, you'll be seeing me again before the year's out. And uh, hopefully you'll be seeing me in 2023 too. I got a lot of cool stuff planned and I hope you'll enjoy it. So until we next meet, bye Anara. Peace. <laughs>